top every year, nor do we want to be at the bottom. And if you look at the red category, the red box here, which represents the University of Houston, you can see by and large we're staying in the middle, which is where we want to be. Again, targeting that smooth return profile. Um, you know, it's worth noting that frequently the best returner in any given year is the worst retur returner in the following year, and that's not the position we want to be in because in order to maximize sustainable spending, we can compound at a higher rate um, if we smooth returns over time. Just quickly pausing on page 10, we've hit on some of this, but this is um, data provided by the university and then again just looks at, um, again, beginning market value, um, net withdrawals, you'll notice here that it's actually the positive 17 million, aggregate earnings both from um, earned income and unrealized gains, and we do um, account for the management fees to give you the ending market value. Um, I know this is something Regent McAlevey had asked for um, a while ago, and I think it's a good just reminder of kind of how we're getting to where we're getting in any given year. Page 11, again, just gives you a snapshot allocation, a snapshot of asset allocation at the end of uh, December. I think we've hit on this, but you can see that at the end of the year, we were underweight hedge funds based on the current target and overweight bonds and cash. And again, that was largely driven by the decision to hold off on reallocating uh, to hedge funds and instead um, discuss asset allocation, which we will at this, uh, later on in the meeting. And then I'll let Phil pick up with non-endowed. Uh, sorry, I should ask, are there any questions about performance or thoughts, comments? I think it's good to line up with more cash. <laughs> yeah. By chance. <laughs> Great. Well, I'll turn to page 12. And just to briefly discuss the non-endowed assets, as a reminder, the non-endowed assets are broken into three parts. The first is cash, which as of December represented about 37%, and then liquidity, which represents 43%, and then part of the endowed assets are invested in the endowment, and at, as of December that represented 20%. So turning to page 13, when we think about the non-endowed portfolio or the non-endowed pool, we're actually just talking about that cash and liquidity portion there. So that represents in the upper left about 518 million as of the end of the year. And then as a reminder, about a year ago at this time, we approved uh, a change in the liquidity pool structure. We went from just one manager to four managers. And with that, that was implemented in about May of 2019. And so when we look at performance out of se in a second, I just wanna set the stage that you know, for about almost half the year, it was just one manager, and for the, the second half, we had our new structure in place. So turning to the upper right of this, just on the calendar year today, or calendar year, uh, the total endowed pool, so cash and liquidity, returned 3.6% compared to a benchmark return of 3.5%. Going down to the blue line here, you'll see the liquidity portion, which returned 4.9% compared to these other two benchmarks. And I think the important thing to note here is that, yes, there were some tailwinds to performance given the fallen rates, but also this new manager structure so far um, has added value on top of that. And then the last thing I just want to point out is on the bottom right, um, even with the change of structure, we wanted to maintain our high quality, diversified across sector, and then our duration. So I'll pause there if there's any questions on that. If there are none, uh, this completes the first agenda item, Major Chatham. Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. This item was presented for information only and requires no action by the committee. The next item listed on your agenda is item D. Approval is requested to delegate authority to the Chancellor to negotiate and execute contracts for the hiring of private investment managers, the University of Houston System Endowment, UH System. Mr. Bartlett, will you please introduce this item? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Fisk to talk about uh, three specific recommendations today, uh, but prior to that, he'll give a brief update on the uh, state of uh, the private uh, investment market. So, Mr. Fisk? Thank you. Um, so uh, portfolio has continued to do well uh, since inception. Uh, the net 
return has been 14.4% annually. Uh, for the 12 months ended September 30, so that's the last marks that we have. Um, you were in 12.4% in the uh, private investment program. That 12.4% uh, in the context of outperforming public markets um, is pretty significant. So over the same time period, the S&P 500 was up 4%. Uh, the Russell 3000 was up 3%. Acqui was up 1%. So you're outperforming uh, the S&P by 800 basis points and other indices by more than that. Uh, the program is getting a little bit more mature, so we would expect from a cash flow perspective, the cash flow is negative today, meaning you're investing more than you're getting back. We would expect that to, over the next year or two, to basically neutralize itself, so you'd be a, a self-funding program. Um, so that, just so I understand, so, you know, we're, we're continuing to build the percentage up. You're building the percentage. Percentage, percentage up, and, and so the money is being, more money is being put in more to, build, to build the percentage, and at some point we'll get to the target. You'll get to the target. And, and the money coming back will we'll fund whatever whatever we need to do to keep the percentage. Is that, is that correct? Is that a, and, and that you expect that. Uh, okay. No, um, I, I think you've not, you've not violated the principle of selling, telling what or when, but never both. Yeah, it's hard. Um, we have three recommendations today, um, and Kelly will take us through the first two of them. Great. Hi, everyone. So our first recommendation, which is outlined on page 16 of the materials, is for a $5 million commitment to Toma Bravo Fund 14, which would represent the university's second commitment to this investment strategy. At a high level, Toma Bravo is widely known to be one of the most established and successful software investors in the United States, and the firm has really distinguished itself over time through this deep sector ex extra expertise in technology and through their, their solid and consistent performance, which has been top quartile for every single mature fund that, that, the, uh, that the firm has raised since, since inception. Um, I think that track record really speaks for itself, but to, to give you sort of a, a sense of the team's experience, um, since 2003, the firm has invested in 71 software platform companies and 169 add-ons, and of that 71 company cohort, about half have been realized for a, a gross multiple of money um, of 3.9 times, so quite strong performance. On top of that, the manager has been distributing capital at a, at a quite strong rate in recent years with almost $9 billion of liquidity generated between the 2017 and 2009, sorry, 2019 period. Um, with respect to strategy, the manager is really continuing, continuing the approach that it's been employing for, for several years. That is focusing narrowly on software in the upper middle market and large cap um, space. Um, the, the manager focuses on both application and infrastructure software companies, um, the latter infrastructure being somewhat of a differentiator versus peers who tend to focus more so on the application side of the software space. Um, one of the things that really stands out um, about Toma Bravo is the crisp structure that they've developed around their playbook and their processes over time. They've consistently been targeting companies with similar characteristics of recurring revenue, mission critical products or services, high switching costs, and solid management teams, but that are underperforming in terms of operating margins. Once the team identifies these type of deals, um, they really seek to implement um, quite immediate operational improvements and cost reductions, either pre-close or at the time of acquisition. This is pretty differentiated, and it's allowed them to really realize significant margin expansion early on in their investment holds. Uh, Post-investment, they'll take a very hands-on approach, and, and they'll do that by um, leveraging their integrated group of operating partners, um, which the firm has um, kind of been, it's been a focus for the firm, and it's actually doubled in size since 2016, around the time that they raised their last fund. So really bringing significant resources to bear on the operational front. The team is highly impressive. It consists of, of six managing partners today who have worked together for 14 years and, and are led by Orlando Bravo, who's a very strong and well-respected leader, both within the firm and within the software investing uh, space more generally. 
Um, below them is a strong core of, of five partners that um, for the most part has been promoted from within and has experienced uh, pretty limited turnover in recent years. So two things that we, we certainly like to see. Um, key considerations with, with Fund 14 here are sort of the move up market as, as the firm has raised larger funds over time. Um, with Fund 14, they're really entering a space um, where they've done fewer deals um, and where their track record is lighter, um, albeit they, they do have some realizations and they, they've shown an ability to make acquisitions in, at this larger end of the, of the market. Um, the second consideration here would just be the, the valuation environment in software investing generally. Um, Toma Bravo's entry multiples have trended upward over time with the market, um, but overall we, we do view them as quite disciplined buyers. So I'll stop there and, and see if there are any questions. So this is a, a, what you were saying at the end, and so they're scaling up the size of their investments and, and, you, and you still think they'll keep the same discipline that they had before because basically this is a fixer upper software buyer rather than, you know, mm -hmm. new. And so if you, if, if you don't keep your discipline, uh, the, the investors will be the ones that get fixed up. So. <laughs> Yeah, so that so the, the, tr the reason why we're not recommending more money than this, more than the five million, would be that we, we, as they go into a larger fund, you're concerned about the possibility that, that they're going to pay up. Is that right? I, I think they will. <clears throat> they will pay higher prices. I think Orlando Bravo would um, tell me that he thinks a lot of the larger opportunities that he sees are if anything, less well-run than some of the smaller companies, just because they, they build up fat over the years and they're not as lean as they could what be. What was the prior fund? How big was the prior fund initially, round figures? It was a uh, little under 13. So it's not much bigger. It's not, yeah. Okay. Is, he gonna, is he gonna take more than 14 if he can raise it? Uh, you know, he might take 15. I, he's not gonna be 20, I don't okay. think. All right, thank you. Great, so our second recommendation today, which is outlined on page 17, is for a $5 million commitment to Francisco Partner Sticks. This is another well-established sector specialist in the technology space, though with some notable and important differences versus Toma Bravo, which we just talked about, which make the two complementary exposures for the portfolio. Um, in terms of size, at, at a target of 5.5 billion, Francisco's raising about a third of the amount of capital as Toma Bravo. So really playing more so in the middle market, um, lower down in the market segment than Toma Bravo and targeting smaller equity checks in smaller companies. Um, additionally, unlike Toma Bravo, who's focusing exclusively on software, Francisco's employing a much broader and opportunistic mandate across the technology spectrum. So yes, they've done quite a bit in software, but they also have um, meaningful exposure to digital and internet, to hardware, to security, um, financial technology, and healthcare IT, the latter which has been actually a, an emerging area of strength for the firm. Um, one of the things that really differ differentiates Francisco is that they're employing a um, what they call a barbell approach to investing in each of these sectors, meaning that on one end they'll pursue sort of value-oriented opportunities um, that, are, that are complex and undermanaged, and on the other hand, more growth-oriented opportunities, typically companies that are growing in excess of 15% on a revenue basis. Um, this barbell approach has served the manager quite well historically, and we continue to think that it will do so, um, particularly, particularly as we're thinking about resilience in this late cycle market environment. Uh, fund six will really continue the approach that the firm has been employing o over its, its recent funds. Like its predecessors, the, the strategy is global, so, so the manager will invest in the U.S., Europe, and Israel, though with a bias towards the U.S., where about 80% of capital has been deployed to date. Um, the fund will generally take control positions, though they do have the flexibility to do minority in cases where they can incorporate attractive structuring for downside protection. Um, and on that point, with respect to uh, transaction type, you will see them do these traditional buyout and minority deals, but they also have the, the experience and the capabilities to take on you know, carve outs and take privates, for example, that are a little bit of, of a heavier lift and, and require a more hands-on approach. 
Um, we like the opportunistic nature of the strategy. We think it's differentiated versus many of their peers who are, who are narrower in their focus within technology. And I would say that it's benefited Francisco Partners to date in, in two major ways. Um, one, it's protected the portfolio on the downside by virtue of the diversification across the funds. And then two, it's really allowed them to pivot as the market changes. So, uh, you know, an ability to access the best opportunities at, at any given time. And I think, you know, not everyone can do this well, but they've demonstrated a clear ability to, um, you know, mine a wide, wide range of investment opportunities and transaction types. Uh, briefly on the merits of the organization, this is a very long-standing firm that was founded in 1999 and, and has had the current CEO at the helm since 2005. He is joined by a strong senior team of, of 13 investment partners, and importantly, um, while we've seen some of the early senior professionals and founding partners move on or scale back over time, um, this current go-forward team for Fund 6 is really the ones that has generated the strong performance that we've seen um, in, in Francisco's recent funds. Uh, like Toma Bravo, um, we flag a couple considerations here, one being sort of the fast-paced growth of the organization as they've raised more and larger funds, and then, um, of course, the, the overall valuation environment within te the technology sector broadly. Um, and with that, I'll open up for any questions. Our third recommendation today is <clears throat> for a $5 million commitment to Penzance DC Real Estate Fund 2. Uh, previously, the university committed $7.5 million to uh, Fund 1. This is targeted to be a $350 million fund going after value add and development projects in the multifamily and office sectors uh, within the DC metropolitan area. The firm was founded in 1996 by a husband and wife team, a uh, team still together today. Uh, very deep knowledge of the DC metro market. And what we've seen, not only with Penzance, but also with some other firms that are focused on specific markets, is this deep knowledge gives them a competitive advantage in terms of not only sourcing deals, but also understanding competitive environment on deals. Uh, they've had a very strong track record, so over the 24-year history of the firm, they've lost money on one deal. Uh, that deal was back in 2007. Uh, but the track record uh, has generated a 27% gross return, a 1.9 uh, times multiple on 1.2 billion of invested capital. Uh, there is a special incentive here to be part of the first close, which you would be uh, if you decided to go forward here, but they're offering an incentive. The carried interest for first closers will be 17.5% instead of 20%, which it will be for people who are not in the first close. Well, how does it work so that they get 1.5% or 2%? They get a 1.5% one, one management fee. Maybe. After they return the management fee, um, there's an 8% preferred return that goes to you, and after so you get- So it's got a preferred return of 8%, and then, and then they, they back in for, for 17 and a half. Yeah, they will then get their 17 and percent So we earn 8% before they really make you a You earn 8% before they get a dime, yeah. How much leverage do they carry? Not a whole lot of leverage. Uh, you know, real estate. 60, 65% loan to value usually. This is sort of a, Bet that the government of the United States will continue to grow. I guess. <laughs> I, you know, DC is seems, one of those markets safe, that you know. is likely yeah. to still. Yeah, I live there. I'm in traffic. <laughs> if there are no other questions, that completes item D, Regent Chapin. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Are there any additional questions anyone has? Uh, may I hear a mo motion to pr prove this item is presented? So moved. Is there a second? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? This item is hereby approved by the committee. No further board action is required. 
The next item for the committee's consideration is item E, approvals request to modify the UH system endowment fund statement and investment objectives and policies and rebalance the endowment portfolio UH system. Mr. Bartlett, would you please introduce this item? Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Uh, Kirk in a moment to uh, talk about some recommendations related to our long-term asset allocation uh, targets, ranges, and if approved, would necessitate uh, some redemptions from some of our managers and also necessitate some changes to our investment policy statement. So let me turn it over to Mr. Kirk for an introduction. Okay, thank you again. Um, if I can direct you to page 20, I see that's on the screen. Um, most of you will recall uh, that last month uh, we, we had a, a workshop with the Endowment Management Committee to discuss uh, policy asset allocation. And the workshop really focused uh, very hard on the role of asset classes, uh, that they, what they play in the portfolio, and whether the, uh, the, the construct of the policy uh, as, uh, is, as it is today, or as it may uh, be modified, could meet the overall objectives of the University of Houston system's um, uh, purposes, uh, as Aaron was referring to other, uh, earlier, to maximize sustainable spending. And we spent significant time uh, discussing really all asset classes, but we spent a significant amount of time on the asset class that's not really an asset class, which is called, uh, euphemistically called in the industry, hedge funds, the, the pros and cons, uh, and if there were a means to replicate the current risk posture without them or without as much exposure. And what you see on slide 20 in terms of the bar charts uh, is the bottom line up front or the net effect of the proposals today uh, to have what is in effect a moderate increase in the expected return of the portfolio with a commensurate uh, moderate increase in expected volatility by reducing the hedge fund segment from its current 20 to five and have that 15 points be distributed, five points to bond, reading from the bottom up, five points to fixed income and cash, five to P private equity venture capital, as Phil and Kelly just spoke to, and five to global equities. And we also discussed how increasing the uh, equity-oriented risk, uh, you know, at this point in the cycle had to be an eyes wide open uh, decision by the committee but to temper that increase, which is moderate as modeled, again, you see the increase uh, to uh, bonds and cash. Now, the committee asked us uh, appropriately to go back and do a little bit of modeling, um, uh, modeling of expected return, expected volatility, but also um, scenario testing with or without spending, scenario testing specifically on the downside. What might this mean if it's gonna be a little more equity-oriented, a little more risk-oriented, a little more return-oriented, uh, how different, how much, and what would it mean if we had a uh, significant uh, drawdown on the magnitude of what we saw in 08, which, you know, let's, let's remember, if we have to, uh, that that was quite dramatic. And so, turning to slide 21, you will see these two portfolios, the first being the status quo or the current policy, the second being the proposal in orange, with a simple, what's known as mean variance optimization model. It's been around forever. Uh, all models are wrong, some are useful, this one's useful, uh, <laughs> all are wrong at least to some degree. Uh, but what it does is it takes the expected returns for individual asset classes, it takes the volatility of those, expected volatility of those returns, and it takes the statistical covariance or the correlation, expected correlation of returns between them, and it says, absent a view on valuations, looking out 25 years, what does this say we can compound at? without any manager value add or subtracted. So just kind of like on an asset class basis. And can we compare that to how much we're spending? What's the probability of achieving that? And therefore, do we, are we able to earn what we spend and maintain our purchasing power? Well, the good news is both policies should do that. And the outputs, uh, really turning to the data table on the right-hand side, first we have the differences, right? Global equities 40 to 45, private equity 20 to 25, hedge funds 20 to five, Real assets stays the same, bonds and cash 10 to 15. The outputs say, and let's focus, I don't want to get too math geeky here, but let's focus on the real compound return because that's the midpoint of the return distribution. 
uh, not the probability weighted return of, uh, of uh, the arithmetic return, and the compound return is factors in volatility, um, and it's more conservative. It says the, po the portfolio policy goes from an expected return, if you see there, a real compound return of 6.2 to 6.4. Okay, doesn't seem like a lot. 20 basis points, 20 basis points on $800 million over time is a lot of money uh, if, you, if you're able to capture that premium. And this, again, is before any manager value add or value subtracted. Now, that's a real rate of return, a real expected return, so we don't know what inflation is going to be in the future, but let's look at you know, current expectations and say it's somewhere between 1% and 2%. That means the portfolio should be generating between 8 and 9% on a nominal basis, and you compare that to your spending rate you'll see how, if you achieve that, you're going to be able to not only maintain the purchasing power, but actually grow the real value. There's a, there's a, a metric on here called Sharp Ratio. Many of you, you know, took finance may re recall uh, that term. It's, it's, a, it's, it's named after its founder, Bill Sharp, but basically it's just a risk-adjusted return. Uh, and what this says is these two portfolios on a risk-adjusted basis are essentially statistically equivalent. Um, now, this is modeling, however, as I said earlier. And, you know, in the 25 plus years I've been doing that, I, you know, make no mistake, the new, the new targets represent at the margin a more growth orientation, a more risk accepting orientation of the portfolio. And we believe based on the overall strength, the strong operating financial position from the enterprise review we did, that this is an acceptable modification uh, to the policy. Now let's get to the modeling real quick in the time we have left because a couple other things here uh, on the agenda uh, that you asked us to do. On slide 22, um, this is a sobering slide, but we have to look at it. Um, let me orient you first. Uh, the, the, the bars that are uh, solid represent the expected returns that went into the modeling you saw on the prior page, which is to say they are what we call equilibrium returns, which is a euphemism for valuation agnostic. You know, we don't, you know, absent a view. Now, you know, you have a view based on, so this is just, if, there were, if every asset class were fairly valued over the next 25 years or so, what do we expect these asset classes to compound at? The, the lighter shaded bar next to it is not our prediction for the next 10 years because we don't make, you know, 10-year forecasts or one-year forecasts. Um, was it Mark Twain that said it's different to make predictions, particularly about the future? Or, I don't know, a lot of people are credited with that particular quote. We don't make forecasts, but what we were able to do is take each asset class as it stands today by our view of its historical valuation, and we say, hey, if over the next decade those asset classes revert to a fair, fair historical fair value, whether it means reverting upward or reverting downward, what does the math essentially say those, these asset classes will return over the next 10 years? You can see that with the exception of natural resources equities, it's all lower. All this is based on reversion of current valuation, and it's not surprising that the second one in, the most overvalued asset class today, mathematically is U.S. equities, it says rather than 8.7%, U.S. equities are going to compound at 2.1%. But it says outside the U.S. is going to do better. Develop XUS, the third one over. Emerging markets, the fourth one over. Even better. But overall, global equities, the first one, is lower. Everything is lower except for natural resources, right? But PEVC is higher. World equities, uh, developed and emerging markets equities are higher than hedge funds. And then bonds over there in yellow. We don't expect great return from bonds. You know, the 10-year just hit an all-time low. Uh, yesterday. But we think the new targets gener uh, necessitate uh, an increase in the fixed income component to provide some risk, risk offset and some ballast to the increase in private equity, to the increase in public equity, uh, uh, if you will. Uh, some, and so that's hence the 10 to 15 percent there. So we don't know that this is the way it's you know, going to play out exactly this way. And of course, this is a 10-year regression. So it says nothing about the path, right? I don't know how many of us are going to even be here in 10 years uh, around this table anyway. <laughs> um, but it does provide some framing in terms of 
the general expectation of the next decade is not likely to be as robust as the past. Now, a little more specific to what would what may this portfolio, new portfolio proposal, asset allocation look like in a significant downturn. That's on slide 23. We do a liquidity stress test at the top half of the page, and then we show the resulting asset allocation of that liquidity stress test at the bottom panel of page 23. And the three bars are pre-stress, i.e. sort of today, post-stress, and then post-stress plus the spending. And remind me of 5.3, uh, 5. 5. spending. So that's the far right bar. What is the stress period? We basically run the portfolio through November 2007 through February 2009, peak to trough of the great financial crisis. So in terms of market values, you'll see, let's just go from pre-stress to post-stress plus spending. That's a, that's a drawdown from $778 million to $476 million. Then the color coding of the bar charts, you see liquid, semi-liquid, illiquid. That refers to the liquidity of the endowment. Liquid is daily and monthly liquidity. Semi-liquid is quarterly liquidity. And illiquid is any investment that has annual or greater lockup in terms of illiquidity. And so that's the color coding is uh, green is liquid, blue is semi-liquid, and of course orange is illiquid. You'll see the, mar the, the, the numbers, but essentially the percentage is, uh, although this percentage is really not on the top half, if you want to write this in the margin, basically today, pre-stress, top panel, $230 million illiquid, that's about 23% of the portfolio. Post-stress plus spending, that's 34% of the portfolio. So we call it the denominator effect, right? So the marketable portfolio falls. The private equity marks don't fall like that. Maybe you're still getting some capital calls. Maybe you're not getting distributions in a crisis period. And so the illiquid piece goes from about a quarter of the portfolio to a little more than a third. Just gives you a sense, okay, as a sniff test, is this something we can live with? Fortunately, the liquidity portion, although it declines significantly, is still post-spending $282 million. On a percentage basis, asset allocation at the bottom, same uh, scenario, uh, the great financial crisis, pre-stress, post-stress, post-stress plus spending. We have there the, the percentage in each asset class. And so, not surprisingly, in yellow, your fixed income goes from 15 to 21% of the portfolio. Not surprisingly, your public equities go from 45 in the bottom, pre-stress, to 33, post-stress plus spending. Again, these are draconian, dramatic, unwanted, unhelpful uh, outcomes. But the question is, does it materially alter the ability of the university to draw from the endowment to make its spending and support its programs? And we believe that even in a dramatic situation like this, that it does. Let me turn it over to Aaron to bring us around third base here. Can you pause for questions yeah. or thoughts? Yeah. Because the next couple sure. pages get into implementation in yeah, terms of point. how we, we how we would change the portfolio to reach the new targets. Yeah, what, what the committee asked for, just so we're clear, we said, okay, we're in this forever. And so, you know, we need to have a long view of, of the, the, the world economy is going to grow at some rate. Uh, so we could afford to take more risk than, say, a person might who's you know, my age. Say. And, and so that was the view, a little more risk. But we wanted to make sure that for several years there would be enough cash to pay the five point some percent that we need to pay out to, to, meet, to meet the numbers. So that's why you see the growth in the you know, zero return bonds and cash to provide more, more, more assurance that there, there will be that. So we, we wanted a safety net, but we also had to take a, a view that this is around forever. Uh, admittedly, it's a bias towards um, that the world isn't going to come to an end in the next little bit, but, but, it, but it also, and it's not intended as market timing. Uh, it's basically saying we need a little more return than we've been getting. 
we need to take we can afford over a long period of time to take more risk but not a lot more risk but we also need to have a, a big pile of cash uh, to, to do this and I think this my personal view is that this uh, accomplishes that for now uh, you understand we you know a year from now or six months from now or whatever we can change the plan and this isn't uh, it's not the Ten Commandments so uh, I, I think I think it's a rational way to deal with this returns if, if you cut off over a long period of time if you cut off your um, over you know above benchmark returns by some hedging strategy you'll never get the average I mean just a fact because the market tends to move up more than it moves down you remember the downs more but on average the market moves up over time so you can't really afford to say well I'm just going to go to bonds or something so you know this is sort of a tweak of the system we are eliminating the high highest fee uh, elements of, of the portfolio which are the hedge funds you know the hedge fund takes 20 percent of the upside and uh, so even if they make just a little bit and they underperform the market, they still get 20% a little bit, you know, and, and that's really what we're taking out of here. So we're, so on a after fees basis, uh, we, we should be we should be better off over over time, and, and that's really the so they were they were asked to test are we making the returns better over time on average? Yeah, but we also wanted a, a fairly good size safety net. Don't, you can correct me if I'm, you know, mischaracterized. No, that's that, that, that's correct. Um, about your point about flexibility, I had the opportunity to use this quote uh, at, a, at a meeting yesterday in Florida. That, you know, uh, uh, Marcel Proust is not normally quoted at investment committee meetings, but uh, he famously, uh, well, maybe not so famously, said that all of our final decisions are made in a state of mind that's not going to last. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I would just follow up to that point. Um, certainly the plan can be changed. I would say that changing asset allocation policy targets frequently um, ultimately ends up churning the portfolio, which is not something we would recommend. So if we're if this is the plan, this is the plan for the medium term. This isn't something that we then want to go and redeem from a bunch of hedge funds to then go reallocate and increase a hedge fund allocation a year later, uh, because the time that it involves being out of the market the time that it involves identifying managers and re-upping and getting back in um, is meaningful. And so, I, I, Regent Chazen, to your point, it is not written in stone, but it's certainly not something from the Cambridge team's perspective that we would look to change within, you know, within a five-year period. Sure. Yes. So on page 24, what we've given you here is just the mapping for redeeming the hedge fund allocation. Just to give you a sense of the magnitude, it is about 17.5% of the portfolio today. The goal is to get it to around 5%, or the target is 5%. Um, $142 million today will be going down to $40 million. This first set of trades laid out on page 4 effectively is redeeming $82 million from your hedge fund portfolio. One thing I do want to point out here, or two things I want to point out here, is first of all, hedge funds are somewhat illiquid. They tend to fall in that semi-liquid category, so some of them take a couple of quarters to get out. Some of them we can only get out annually, so this will take some time. I also do want to note, in the process of redeeming, we don't want to be left with a portfolio that's out of balance. So you'll see we're trimming from some managers um, and redeeming in full from others, but that is intentional to afford us not too much concentration in any one given manager, but ultimately to end up at the point of a, port of a hedge fund allocation of around 5% within managers that we feel like make sense for that size allocation. I won't read through every single one because you have it in front of you. In terms of page 25, um, as we receive these hedge fund redemptions, the first step of this process will then be to redeploy those assets into public equities commensurate with the increase in the target. And again, here you can see these are all existing managers in the portfolio. The idea being here is also that we want to maintain our geographic uh, allocation in terms of looking at the global market and making sure we're not taking any big or significant uh, tactical tilts other than those that we desire to take. And then secondly, um, making sure that we're not outsizing any given manager within your global equity lineup. 
The last thing I'll point out is given that the hedge funds will, some of those will take time, you should expect us to come back in May with an additional plan of redeployment. Um, but we have a little bit of time to do that just given the, the way that um, redemptions will come in. For those of you that like spreadsheets, you can see further detail on 26 and 27 to lay out those cash flows. Um, I like looking at both, but uh, needless to say, pages 24 and 25 capture the full recommendations from a, transit, from a first stage of transition in text. Any questions or comments? Aaron, would you, would you go over the investment uh, yes. policy? Okay, so then shifting, if there are no questions on that, we'll shift to the investment policy statement. Right, it's, it's so fine. commensurate with these changes, as Raymond mentioned, it will require changes to the policy statement. Uh, as you'll see on page 30, um, we've laid out a summary of the changes uh, in terms of the pages specifically that were redlined. The first thing I will note is page 32 is largely a housekeeping item as we're adjusting uh, the total spend rate to reflect the new administrative fee. And then secondly, on page 43, you will see that we have updated the policy asset allocation targets and ranges commensurate with this new asset allocation strategy. I'll pause just to give people a chance to look at those two pages before we move on to the non-endowed policy. One thing I will note on page 43 is that we're maintaining a relatively wide range in terms of our uh, ranges for each asset class, which is something that we have maintained for a long time just to give us flexibility and not have to rebalance constantly. Um, but we've kept the bands of those ranges similar to they, what they have been under the prior asset allocation. Regent Chasen, if there are no other questions, that would complete item uh, Do you want me to go through the, oh, no, non endowed sorry, item. got it. So I'm, I'm going to ask for Yes, a, item E, yes. Hmm? For yes, E. Ask for the vote. The next item, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Are there any additional questions on item E? May I hear a motion to approve this item as presented? So moved. Is there a second? All in favor? Any opposed? item is hereby approved by the committee. Item F, approval is requested to modify the UH system investment policy for non-endowed funds. UH system is the next item for the committee's consideration. Mr. Bartlett, would you please introduce this item? Yes, sir, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Schumacher to discuss uh, some recommended uh, changes to our non-endowed investment policy as well. So I'm on page 46 here, and similar to what we did for the endowed policy, we've given you a summary of the red line changes for each page in this policy. Uh, for the first section here, benchmarking, I would kind of categorize this again in the housekeeping area. As we change the structure of the liquidity pool, um, we're modifying benchmarks accordingly. The one thing to note here is similar to what we do for the endowment. We'd like to add a dynamic benchmark to the non-endowed pool to formally, even though we're doing it in the performance section of the book, but formally in policy to give us a benchmark that looks uh, exclusively at manager performance now that we've added more active management to this pool. Page 48, we're modifying the targets to the cash and liquidity pool, really a reflection of how the portfolio has been managed. We're also updating those ranges accordingly. Um, again, more of a housekeeping item. And then last but not least, in terms of rebalancing, uh, if you turn to page 50, we've adjusted language uh, such that in conjunction with uh, Raymond and the, the Cambridge team, the ability to really execute cash management into a meeting as it relates to this pool to move money between cash and liquidity as needed. We think it makes sense given those uh, funds can, are fungible and can move quite quickly not to have to come to seek approval at a quarterly meeting, um, but rather be able to do that when the universe, when the system, um, when the needs of the system warrant it. This completes this item as well. Uh, are there any additional questions? May I hear a motion to, to approve the item as presented? Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? This item is hereby approved by the committee. Our final item for approval for the, the committee's consideration today is item G. Approval is requested for the fiscal year 2020 University Advancement Endowment Assessment Rate UH system. Mr. Bartlett, would you please present this item? Yes, sir. We're, we're asking uh, the committee's approval 
uh, to maintain the annual assessment uh, on the endowment uh, to cover fundraising uh, expenses and administrative costs uh, at the 1.3%. Uh, as you may recall, uh, we reduced that rate from 1.5% to 1.3% last year, and we're asking to maintain that same rate going forward for fiscal year 20, which would generate the necessary funds uh, for fiscal year 21's budget. And we will continue to work uh, because our long-term goal is to try to move this uh, assessment down to 1%, uh, and we hope to do that over the next few years. Uh, we will continue uh, in our various efforts to try to get there uh, in that period of time. How, what, what, if, how do you go from 1 to 1.3 to 1? I mean, what, are you, what are you actually going to do? I, I know you're going to try. but I'm Right. Gonna... Yeah, so it's a combination of, of, of things. Obviously, uh, as you know, we've, we've been looking in the past with uh, our foundations. Um, uh, Don't use the T word. Yes. Um, no, no, no. Um, we're looking as well as uh, looking at the advancement uh, operation itself and in terms of the services that it is actually providing uh, and, and perhaps um, assessing that uh, directly to the colleges themselves for those services. Um, so, you know, there, 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 are, there are a limited number of, of options available to us short of um, the university if you will, making up that difference, um, you know, through through some well, type I of central allocation. If the endowment allocation. were twice the size, you see, you could cut it. Correct. If the endowment were twice the size, you could cut the percentage. Theoretically, that was the goal many years ago. That as the endowment grew, that that we would, in fact, be able to reduce the the rate. Obviously, as we've increased our uh, fundraising goals, uh, that takes more development officers and other support staff. Uh, and so, yes, the, the fee or the cost has, has kind of leveled at a certain uh, budgetary for, level. For, for Cambridge, I guess. So this 1.3, 1%, how does that compare with, I know, there's, I know there's some people use other methods to pay for this, but how does that compare with other uh, institutions? Yeah. Well, we, we, we publish on this, so we have the. I don't have the exact answer here. I mean, it's, it's pretty much. Well, no, it's, it's pretty much down the fairway. I mean, I, I've seen, I see 150. You know, 1.5. I've seen that. Um, I actually worked with one institution where it was two percent. Um, that's been coming down for the last eight years. But one one and a half is not uncommon. Uh, somewhere between one and one and a half is very common. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I just say that we we. Um, Several years ago, when we had our first uh, capital campaign here, after that, we just didn't maintain the level of support and level of funding, and the, the, the enterprise just wasn't ready for any kind of uh, serious fundraising or capital campaign. So we made the decision to have support from the endowment. I mean, we looked at many things. We looked at national trends. We looked at both options, whether it would be endowment tax, whether it would be gift tax, I'm not using the word tax, but we looked at that. <laughs> but we decided uh, that the best thing would be for us to have university support and as well as some support from endowments. So we literally split it half-half. So half was, came from the university's thing and half we did from endowment assessment. We have the enterprise right now, which is, um, I would say, is extremely well functioning. If you look at the size of it, and if you look at the productivity, and uh, I would say we do a lot more with a lot less, um, and I, we continue to look at this every two years for sure. And when we looked at last time, our desire was that we reduce it to one. We just can't do it within in the same year. And therefore, our goal is to go down to the 1%. Uh, however, right now, we go from 1.5 to 1.3, and then we'll just reduce it. In a couple of years, we'll be at 1. So. Yeah. The reason I asked the question was I didn't see how you're going to get there. Right. <laughs> not, not that I, I, I wasn't saying it's not worth it. Right. It's, wor it's worth it because it raises a lot of money, and the university can't absorb it all. 
but one way to you know is to, is to raise the size of the endowment. Right. Well, my, my first thought was after the campaign is over, why don't we just uh, you know reduce the support now? But I think that is going to yeah. be detrimental for the institution in the long run. We need to keep our you, development. The campaign you know. never ends. Yeah, right. <laughs> because our dreams never end. Your dream dreams never end. The campaign so, never ends. So we, we want to keep that, but we're just looking at. I mean, we we are in the right now in the entire budget um, process transformation anyway. So all of this is just fitting right with our strategic plan and the strategic budgeting. If there are no other questions, this completes that item, Merchant Chasen. Okay. Um, any other questions anyone has? May I hear a motion to approve this item as presented? Is there a second? Mm -hmm. Second. All in favor? Mm -hmm. Any opposed? This item is hereby approved by the committee. This concludes the presentation of three action items for the committee's consideration and approval today. I would now mm -hmm. like to request that these three action items be placed in the board's consent docket agenda for final board approval as follows. One, approval is requested to modify the UH system endowment fund statement of investment objectives and policies and rebalance the endowment portfolio UH system. Approval is requested to modify the UH system investment policy for non-endowed funds UH system and approval is requested for the fiscal 2020 university advancement endowment assessment rate UH system. May I have a motion to place these three action items on the board's consent agenda? Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? These three items unanimously approved by the committee will be placed in the board's consent docket agenda for final board approval at the Board of Regents meeting of later today, February 27, 2020. The last item on your agenda is the quarterly update on the Here We Go campaign, the University of Houston system. Ms. Eloise Bryce, Vice Chairman for University Advancement, will you please present this item? I've been looking forward to this part. <laughs> this is the fun stuff. This is the good stuff. <laughs> All positive. Numbers go up. Numbers go there up. No dips. Never go down. <laughs> so uh, I think we're, we're calling up the screen. We've got six months and five days left in this campaign. So we are on the home stretch. Um, it'll end August 31st, 2020. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to celebrate October 14 to 16. So those will be on your calendar soon because we want you to be there to celebrate all the, the good work that has gone on. So I, I'll callously round up our fundraising totals to $1.2 billion at this point. We're actually at $1.196, and we have some verbal commitments that would allow me to say that we're basically at, at $1.2. So pretty fantastic. Thank you for all of that. Um, we have so far 100 and thank you very much. Um, we have 100, I'm trying to go fast because I know that we're a little bit over time. So we have 185,000 uh, donors thus far, uh, which is remarkable in terms of the, the reach of this campaign uh, across Houston and across the nation. And then I'll show you what, what is my favorite, uh, only to be exceeded by the favorite of Regent Chazen, uh, the gift chart, which, which we have used since the very beginning of the campaign. That is, we knew when we were when we were dealing with the one billion dollar that we needed to get some very some big gifts at the top, some in the middle, and some at the at the lowest levels. And so, where we have exceeded uh, remarkably, if we could go to the next slide, please, um, we are at the very top level, and we have some gifts that we're working on now that'll make that even more even stronger. Um, and at the at the bottom level, and we are very much focused on the the you know peanut butter in the sandwich right now in terms of uh, what we would say entry-level major gifts. Those are people who are giving 25,000, 50,000, 100,000, 250,000, which are obviously hugely handsome gifts. Those will be so important for the end of this campaign as well as uh, the next campaign. Um, so what we're doing in that regard is we're, we're going uh, gangbusters on UH Giving Day, which will be on March 7th, the, the university's anniversary, and asking donors to uh, make their major gifts by March 7th. So we started counting on February 18, um, and we will then run through to March 7th. So this is it's gifts of all level, but there, there are a number of people who I think uh, will find a deadline and a reason to celebrate uh, to come in at that level. So we're, we're already seeing some success. If you go to the next chart, you'll see the, the constituencies in, in a broad brush who have supported the campaign. Uh, we have 22% from friends 
Uh, I think that obviously shows the reach of the university generally. A lot of those friend gifts are obviously Houston Public Media and athletics, um, but, uh, but clearly a number of them and, so, and some very handsome gifts um, from, for the academic programs. And then within corporate and foundation, we're, it's roughly sp split there between corporate and foundation um, and other organizations is a much smaller part of that. We've raised $330 million toward endowments. Um, and some of those, well, the reason why you don't see those numbers reflected necessarily in the infusion is some of those are longer term pledges. They're being paid over a number of years and some of them are bequest commitments. So those will come in, but, but you don't have the, that money yet uh, to invest. 518 endowments have been established um, in the, if you could, yeah, just go. So we have 518 endowments established since the campaign start. We have never raised the level, the minimum level of endowments uh, during this campaign, and that might be something that we want to consider uh, as this campaign ends. So that's my quick report on the campaign. Thank you all for all that you do for the campaign. I really appreciate being up here and be able to talk about the great results. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. It's, it's just an amazing, effort. when you look at the, at the chart with the, with the money spread out and the large number of small gifts, that, you know, it's a much larger a generation of small gifts by a very large number of people. It's really a remarkable uh, result in uh, all those responsible, because uh, it's not just Eloise, it's just other people who harass you. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's been a remarkable result for the school, and uh, uh, I think everybody who worked on it uh, deserves everybody's thanks. Thank you all. Well, you're very kind to say that. We have a remarkable advancement team. I mean, it has really been... It's really been good. Um, going full bus. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bryce, for your presentations. I have present for information only and no committee action is required. I would, like to, would now like to move to the next section listed in your agenda, section three of the executive session. It should be noted that an executive session will not be held today, which is the best part of my whole thing. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any further questions? If not, being, being there being no further business coming before this committee, this meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you. The sound of mariachi music will fill the air at UH this fall. Over 45 students signed up for a new mariachi ensemble in the Moore School of Music. The Mariachi Pumas are open to all students and will play events on the UH campus as well as perform at special events in the Metro Houston area. UH and the UH Law Center have been awarded the Higher Education Excellence in Diversity Award from Insight into Diversity Magazine. The HEAT Award is the only national honor recognizing U.S. colleges and universities that demonstrate an outstanding commitment to diversity and inclusion. This marks the fourth year the university and the Law Center have been named as award recipients. And for the first time in 20 years, men's basketball season tickets are sold out. The American Athletic Conference coaches selected UH as the preseason favorites to defend their American Athletic Conference title. The Cougars open the season November 12th against Alabama State. For the latest from UH, make sure to subscribe. The University of Houston has the number one ranked undergraduate entrepreneurship program in the country. This is the 14th straight top 10 ranking for the Civia and Melvin Wolf Center for Entrepreneurship in the list compiled by the Princeton Review. Wolf Center students and graduates have started more than 1,200 businesses over the past decade. 
A significant gift from the John M. O'Quinn Foundation will name the new UH Law Building the John M. O'Quinn Law Building. The gift will support construction of the state-of-the-art building, set to begin in 2020. Equipped with the latest technology and flexible space, the building will also serve as a hub to engage and serve the public. And a fleet of 30 Starship autonomous delivery robots has been deployed on campus, making UH the first university in Texas to offer robotic food deliveries. Using an app, customers choose their order from 11 dining locations. The robots can cross streets, climb curbs, and travel at night, expanding dining schedules and options on campus. For the latest from UH, make sure to subscribe.
Hello, here's your delivery. Thank you. Have a nice day. Oh man, I'm starving. I wonder what's at the dining hall. Let me check the UH Go app. Whoa, what's up, man? Oh, chicken. That's my favorite. It's so beautiful outside. I wonder what's going on around campus. Movie night, and I haven't seen this one. Oh man, to register for class. I wonder what's available. Nice, I got what I wanted. And I know this one. See you guys, gotta catch the bus. When does the next one come? Whew, made it. Nice shades, man. And now I'd like to give out the People Who Make a Difference Award. This award was established to pay tribute to individuals who have supported the university and made a difference in the quality of life in their communities. It is indeed an honor to present the People Who Make a Difference Award to my friend and colleague, Dr. David Hines, president of Victoria College. As many can confirm, Dr. Hines is a great leader at VC and a wonderful partner to UHV when it comes to collaborating and promoting higher education in the crossroads. He has served as president of Victoria College since August of 2015. His higher education journey began at Midland College after an anonymous person awarded him a $500 scholarship. Dr. Hines then went to Texas State University where he obtained a Bachelor of Science. He earned his Master of Business Administration from the University of Houston and his doctorate in higher education administration from the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Hines started his career as a high school teacher in San Marcos, worked in the private sector for two years, and then served on the faculty at Brasses Ports College for 22 years, 11 of which as division chair for business and computer technology. He served as senior vice president of instructional affairs at Allegheny College in Maryland before becoming the fifth president of Victoria College. Under Dr. Hines' leadership, Victoria College has continued to strengthen partnerships with the Victoria Independent School District, surrounding area high school districts, UHV, and businesses throughout the crossroads. Under his leadership, Victoria College has earned national recognition for the past three years as a great college to work for. Dr. Hines serves on the Victoria Economic Development Corporation's Executive Board, the UHV President's Regional Advisory Board, the Texas Association of Community College Legislative Committee, and the Golden Crescent Regional Planning Commission, Regional Economic Development Advisory Committee. Unfortunately for all of us, he's announced his intention to retire this coming fall and spend some well-deserved time with his family. Our condolences to Kim. David, on behalf of myself and the entire UHB family, thank you for being a, such a great partner for UHB and all that you've done to promote higher education in the Victoria community and the surrounding region. I'm certainly proud and pleased to be able to call you both friend and colleague. Please step forward to re receive this well-deserved <laughs> award.
Thank you, Bob. As my mother would say, ridiculous. <laughs> Bob, Bob called me a couple months ago to talk to me about this. And um, my wife, Kim, was listening to half the conversation. And I said, that's very nice. I would be very honored. I'm sure there are other people more deserving than I am. But yes, where should I be? And when should I be there? And what should I wear? And when I got off the phone, my wife asked, did Bob just ask you to marry him? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I said, no, but, but, he, but he certainly uh, gave a, a, a pretty compelling proposal. I would just say that um, I've learned so much from, from everyone in this room. Uh, so many of you have become friends in such a short period of time. And um, there are just a couple of folks I would like to give credit to uh, individually. I would say that this award is really fundamentally about being cooperative. And I've never gotten an award before in my entire lifetime. And if I was going to get an award, I'm very proud to get one for being cooperative. But I will tell you that there were two individuals when I got here that insisted that I be cooperative. And, and those two individuals were uh, Roger Welder and Ron Walker. And Roger, as you know, was former regent at UH, and, and Ron serves on our board now and was then our board chair. And they insisted that we sit down with Vic Morgan on a monthly basis and talk about all of the things that we needed to collaborate and cooperate on so I'd very much like to thank Roger and Ron and Vic for everything you've done for me since I've been here. And I will say, if you can't get along with Bob, you can't get along with anybody. <laughs> so um, just thank you all so much. It doesn't mean the world to me. I really never have received an award in my entire lifetime. This is very special, and I'm so proud. I have been a part of a variety of higher ed institutions, and I have learned so much. And one of the things I have learned more than anything else is that the more we communicate with each other, the more we learn about each other, particularly diverse student bodies, it expands our understanding of life and world situations. I talked today earlier about nonviolent protesting. There are so many ways to respond to injustice. And it is one of the hardest things one has to do, and that is not to respond in anger immediately, not to respond out of an emotion, but try to respond thoughtfully and do a lot of listening. And when you do respond, give yourself time to really think about how you want to respond. Nonviolent protest training was one of the best things that I've ever done. I do presentations all the time, and people ask me, well, it's so good to have you here because you're not angry. And, and so often we run into angry people. And I say, who told you that? <laughs> I am angry. I don't respond to that anger in ways that you might respond or that you think I should respond. I try to respond as unemotionally in this moment as I can. And that's what I would ask students to do. And I would ask them not to be alone, always be identified with groups. And these groups don't have to be limited to uh, people of your own race. There are people from all walks of life uh, who are experiencing other kinds of oppression. And we must be allies to others as well as open our arms to those and find out what we have in common because groups have a power to change things. Groups of one mind have the power to change. It's time to honor a student who's really made a major impact in her time here at UHV. 
Each year we give out the Student Leadership Award to recognize a student who has demonstrated excellence in academic and leadership qualities. The 2018-2019 award goes to Ms. Catherine Burke. Ms. <laughs> Ms. Burke is a senior from YPO Hawaii. She is, a she is double majoring in psychology and business administration with a concentration in human resource management. During her time here at UHV, she's been a part of several student organizations. She was president of the Business Student Association and a member of the Residence Hall Association and the Jaguar Activities Board. She also previously served as a senator for the UHV Student Government Association and as vice president for the National Society for Leadership and Success. She has worked as both a senior resident assistant and a student worker in the UHV Career Services Office. And on top of all that, she has been named to the UHV President's and Dean's List multiple times during her tenure here. Please join me in congratulating a student who did not know she was getting an award tonight, <laughs> Catherine Burke. I definitely wasn't expecting this award at all. As you can tell, I'm super nervous. But thank you for everyone, I guess, who made me get this award. I really couldn't have done it without like my friends, my family, my staff members, um, especially my professors and my assistant director, um, Camilla Sutton, and all those different people. Oh, I'm super nervous right now. But um, honestly, I'm just, my heart's pounding. And all I can think to say is God bless everyone. And I'm just so happy to have receive this. I worked so hard, and I'm sure everybody else has too, so thank you so much. At University of Houston Clear Lake, our goal is simple, your success. With 45 years of educating astronauts, business leaders, scientists, engineers, and educators in the nation's fourth largest city, UHCL is the place to find your path. We are Hawks, a community of more than 9,000 students who come from different countries around the world, speak many languages, and represent diverse cultures. A testament to our designation as a Hispanic-serving institution. So whether you're in college for the first time, transferring from another college, affiliated with the military, identify as LGBTQ, or have different cultural beliefs, we have two words for you. Access granted. Get ready to be challenged and guided by professors who combine classroom learning with research, hands-on experience, and their industry knowledge to prepare you to contribute to your community and the world. There's even more to discover outside the classroom. With more than 100 student organizations, you'll build new relationships, learn new skills and leadership, and find your voice. Our Treeline Campus offers green space to create, relax, and recharge. Get ready to discover more at UHCL. We're ready for the journey. Are you?
get started. Uh, uh, we won't tell them that. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our meeting. As chair of the Finance and Administration Committee, I'd now like to call this meeting to order. As a quick reminder, please uh, speak into your microphone so your presentations and remarks can be recorded correctly. The first item requiring committee approval today are the minutes from the November 14, 2019 Finance and Administration Committee meeting. Does anyone have any corrections to these minutes? Do I hear a motion to approve these minutes as distributed? Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The minutes are hereby approved. We have seven action items requiring committee and board approval and one item for information only listed on your agenda today. After each action item has been presented, I'll ask if anyone has any questions and then call for the vote. Once the presentations have been concluded, I will then seek a motion to place the approved action items, if appropriate, on the board's consent docket agenda for final board approval at our board meeting held later today. The first action item for the committee's consideration today is item C. Approval is requested to delegate authority to the chancellor to negotiate and execute contracts exceeding $1 million for the purchase of goods or services, excluding construction contracts at the University of Houston UH system. Mr. Bartlett, Senior Associate Vice Chancellor for Administration and Finance, will you please present this item? Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, we have nine contracts uh, for your consider consideration today. Uh, the first item is a ratification of a contract with uh, clinical pathology laboratories. It is a, a vendor who, who provides uh, specimen testing um, for the Student Health Center. Um, a critical service that is provided to our students. Uh, the contract actually originated back in 2015 and is uh, set to, was set to expire in 2020. At the time that it was approved, uh, nearly five years ago, uh, the amount was $900,000. Uh, due to the growth uh, of, of uh, our student body and the use of the services, uh, the contract has been extended or, or amended a few times. Most recently, it was amended in December of 19, as I say, under a an emergency provision, um, uh, but we are bringing it to the board today, the total value of the contract uh, through its uh, termination uh, is $1.3 million. Average is about $260,000 a year over that five-year period. Um, Raymond, uh, yes, in, the, in the previous five-year period, what was about the average amount? 260000 a year. So it's, it's about this projected to be the same? Yes, sir. Okay. So, so as w the next item would, would follow because so once, once this contract expires, uh, they will be going out uh, for, for bid on the same services uh, to secure a five-year, uh, a three-year contract with two one-year renewal options. And the estimated cost is about $300,000 a year. So a little bit of a projected increase, about 10 to 15%. And again, it, it may be a function as well of just the increase uh, in usage uh, and or enrollment. The third item is a uh, request uh, for uh, route maintenance and, uh, and modernization of uh, elevators down at the U of H downtown. Um, we are looking to secure uh, a contract uh, for up to five years with two, uh, a two year renewal option. Uh, UH Downtown has over 30 different, if you want to call them vertical lifts, elevators, uh, dock lifts, things of that nature, uh, freight elevators, passenger elevators, and so forth. Um, They're looking for a, a, a vendor to provide uh, both maintenance and modernization of uh, these various elevators as I say, over a five-year period. The estimated cost is uh, $2.655 million over the five years, inclusive of the optional term. Um, if, you, if you look at it just over the initial term of three years, 900000 about $300,000 a year. Um, and, and again, about um, 825000 of the total cost is elevator maintenance, and the rest is... Uh, uh, modernization of the particular elevators. The next item is a request to um, approve a contract with Market Ingenuity. Uh, Market Ingenuity provides a sales staff uh, for corporate underwriting 
uh, sales for Houston Public Media. Uh, this contract, uh, th this service has been in existence in, since 2015 through a request for proposal. Uh, HPM is requesting to uh, continue to use market ingenuity uh, for a term of five years with uh, an additional five-year term uh, option. Um, if I'm not mistaken, when this RFP went out on the street uh, five years ago, uh, Market Ingenuity was the only firm who had uh, responded. Uh, Market Ingenuity, uh, in essence, is the outsourced, as I say, sales staff uh, for HPM and its underwriting. Uh, they have done a tremendous job in terms of boosting revenue, uh, underwriting revenue for Houston Public Media. Uh, uh, they have increased uh, that revenue of about 34% over this term. Um, for the cost of their services, they take a commission on those sales uh, at 25%. Under the terms of this agreement, uh, they would be reducing that commitment, uh, that commission to 24%, saving Houston Public Media about $300,000. Um, if they were to go back out on the street and perhaps uh, find another company that's out there, uh, HPM anticipates that they could, through a transition, lose as much as one and a half million dollars through just the, the normal transitioning period because Market Ingenuity has built a lot of relationships with these uh, sponsors of, um, uh, who, are, who are sponsoring uh, Houston Public Media. So uh, with the, this being a, you know, an additional term here, I mean, 25 percent, that's pretty rich and they reduced it to 24 percent. I mean, yes, why wouldn't we get this down to around 20 percent? I mean, since they built the yeah. relationships and this, the structures and we know who we're raising money from, yeah. I and mean, why is it still 25 or 24 percent? Yeah, and, and, and we can continue to talk to them about reducing it. Um, you know, again, I think they are, um, it appears they're, they're the only game in town, or at least based on the information that we have seen thus far. Um, but we can continue to ask them to reduce reduce that that rate over time. Yeah, let's see if we can get it down. Okay. Another couple of percent. The next item is a request for um, the acquisition of some uh, high performance computing equipment. Um, the Data Science Science Institute and the Cullen College of Engineering. Need, uh, needs new computing clusters for the expansion of uh, computational high performance resources. Um, this particular purchase, it's a one time purchase, uh, includes a five year service contract. Um, <clears throat> the actual list price of, of the particular equipment uh, was eight and a half million dollars. It has been reduced to five and a half million dollars uh, pursuant to a contract uh, uh, under the uh, uh, DIR, uh, the state contract, but uh, HPA, uh, HPE, uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprises, will provide reduction in the, in, in the cost uh, to get it down to two and a half million dollars. So it's kind of an in-kind, if you will, contribution, uh, which will cover the amount. Um, and so the, our total cost on this particular contract is 2.55 million. Um, and as I say, it's an initial one-time purchase for um, the Data Science Institute and the Cullen College of Engineering. The next item is the pouring rights uh, agreement. Uh, so Coke is cur our current vendor uh, for pouring rights. Uh, this is a system-wide agreement and includes athletics. The request for proposal had, has been on the street. Uh, we are nearing, uh, we're going through the evaluation process and should in the next week or so uh, be awarding this contract. Uh, the initial term of this contract uh, would be for five years. Uh, it is a revenue contract. Uh, the estimated revenue over the five-year period is $7.76 million, which is an increase from the current uh, arrangement that was estimated at about $6 million for the current five-year period. Um, I also wanted to mention that as part of the agreement that uh, we're looking at or, or the deal, uh, the sponsorship guarantees to athletics will increase to approximately $900,000 from the current $462,000. Uh, 
Again, it's a five-year uh, contract. So Raymond, did Pepsi also participate in this? Yes, there were two, two as you might imagine, there were two, uh, yeah. Pepsi and Coke. And again, we haven't completed the, the, the final, uh, but uh, we're close. The next item is a request for uh, the extension of a lease with uh, UH Clear Lake in the Texas Medical Center. They are currently leasing space uh, off of West Holcomb Boulevard uh, for their allied health and applied science programs. Um, we brought this item to the board in November seeking a one-year extension of the lease, uh, but we believe that uh, we will have much more bargaining uh, power uh, if we go for a five-year extension. So we're bringing the item back and asking the board to consider a five-year extension of this agreement. Um, it's, uh, they are currently leasing right under 13,000 square feet uh, in that uh, particular facility. Average lease cost uh, over the last 15 years uh, that they've been there has been about $276,000. And we would expect uh, to be able to negotiate current market rates uh, in the city of Houston and uh, TMC area. If there are no questions on that item. I'll move to the next one. The next item is a request for a sharing a, a services a sharing agreement with uh, the Fort Bend Levy Improvement District, number 17. Um, this particular uh, district was created for the purposes of constructing and maintaining levees and other drainage improvements uh, in and around the Sugarland area, which includes the, our Sugarland location. Uh, this contract has been in place, uh, or this agreement, since 2003, and at that time, our cost or contribution to uh, the levy was 10.65%. Um, what we are doing with this particular agreement is if, uh, codifying uh, the ongoing uh, commitment to uh, the next five years for maintenance and operation of the levy, uh, as well as contributing our portion of the capital improvements uh, that are required uh, to, the, to the levy itself. Our historical average cost has been about $226,000 a year under this agreement and the new cost will increase to $286,000 a year for the five-year period, which again includes the capital cost um, that's amortized over that five years. The next item, or the last item, is a request uh, for uh, the uh, acquisition of some broadcast, uh, digital broadcast equipment, and to procure design and installation services for a production unit to support broadcast and digital distribution of athletic events and ancillary programming such as coaching, coach shows and podcasts. Um, this is for $1.5 million. We would expect, of course, the equipment purchase is a one-time purchase, and we would expect uh, a design and, and installation services not uh, to exceed about 18 months. This is a, uh, as you may recall, there is an agreement between the American Athletic Conference and ESPN, um, whereby the university uh, and all uh, members of the American Athletic Conference uh, have to provide uh, some digital content. Um, the American Athletic Conference is, is giving us $1.5 million uh, for this effort, and so uh, we are requesting approval to move forward in this regard. We are also evaluating additional opportunities um, for uh, the integration of this digital broadcasting functionality um, within the university, but at this time we're focusing on what is required of us pursuant to the agreement uh, between, uh, with ESPN. So did I hear you correctly in that the conference is, is actually giving us the money to purchase this equipment? Uh, I believe that is correct, yes. So that's a pretty good price then. That's pretty good. Yeah. Nothing. But we'll own it. I mean, we'll we will own the equipment. Yes, sir. And th this will have no impact on our athletics. N no, sir. Funding. No. no. Okay. 
That's a good deal. We'll, we'll yeah, take more of those. We'll, we'll, we'll take more of those, absolutely. <laughs> conference and ESPN Plus because now we are required to produce a lot of streaming uh, material. Right. So the deal was that uh, conf uh, the ESPN will give us $20 million to the conference which will be distributed to all the schools so they can upgrade whatever is needed in order to produce those shows for ESPN Plus. Mm -hmm. They need the content so they're going to help us yeah. pay for the equipment to give the content. Right. Okay. It, but yes, sir. If it doesn't impact the conference distribution, the seven million that we received. No, it was all calculated all already, in, all built together. in, yes. Okay. okay. I don't know if that... So we didn't really get anything. <laughs> well, they're getting a lot more, though, because they've got, they've got our basic content, the, you know, football and basketball sure. games, etc., and then we're now right. producing other material yes, for them. absolutely. Uh, it's no cost to us, but there's no revenue, no additional revenue. Right. Yeah. Well, PR. I guess. Okay. Right. That completes this item, Regent Kelly. It, does anyone have any further questions? May I hear a motion to approve this item as presented? Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? This item is hereby approved. Item D, approval is requested to delegate authority to the Chancellor to negotiate and execute construction contracts exceeding $1 million for projects at the University of Houston system, UH system. Is the next action item to be presented? Mr. Bartlett, we Please present this item. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, we are requesting approval for a $4 million uh, contract to upgrade the technology, the hardware within uh, some of our, uh, dorm, our dorm facilities. Um, Cougar Village 1, Cougar Village 2, and Cougar Place representing about 1,400 uh, rooms. Um, we are going to bas basically be changing out the old hardware. Uh, upgrading some and basically uh, adding access control devices. Um, this will allow additional uh, central control of access for security purposes, so it's enhancing security for our, our students. Uh, again, about uh, $4 million, and we will be working with residential life and housing uh, over the course of time uh, to do this uh, at minimal disruption uh, to the operation. Any further questions? Do you hear a motion to approve this item as presented? Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? This item is hereby approved. Our next action item listed on the agenda is item E. Approval is requested for changes to the fiscal year 2021 and fiscal year 2022 fixed tuition and fee rates. Variable rate undergraduate and graduate tuition and fee rates, mandatory student recommended fees, and voluntary and optional fees at the University of Houston system, UH system. Mr. Bartlett, please present this item. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, what I want to do is kind of jump to the punchline and go back for just a moment. Uh, and what we'll be presenting to you today are tuition and fee increases as it relates to tuition for all four of our universities. As it relates to tuition, um, really, this is an inflationary adjustment uh, to, to our tuition. Um, we will get into that a little bit more in detail as well with, with fees. Um, one of the things that I'd like to mention to the board is that we are very deliberate and, and thoughtful um, before we recommend any tuition and fee increases. Um, we evaluate any and all such requests. Um, we involve multiple stakeholders. Uh, there are multiple advisory committees throughout uh, our universities. Uh, these are basically the customers uh, who consume these services. Um, and before anything is advanced uh, to the board, it is thoroughly vetted and thoroughly considered and deliberately, deliberatively uh, considered um, by not only these committees, or advisory groups, but also by the administration. Um, and so we take, we take this responsibility very seriously, as, as I know you do too. Um, and so, uh, as I say, we'll be diving into this a little bit more in detail. So next slide, please. Uh, for most of you, this, you've seen this slide as we often include this both for uh, tuition and fee, but also for our budget presentations. And, 
Well, what this really, if you look at the top section, what this is really illustrating is it's indicating the, uh, showing the state of funding for higher education, higher education over time. Uh, if you go back uh, to the peak uh, of 2010, 2011, uh, we were receiving from the state in terms of formula funding over six, $62 per weighted credit hour. Now, for those of you who uh, may be seeing this for the first time, uh, what this is really about is this, this number here that you see is the quotient. It's the output of a numerator and a denominator, the numerator being the amount of funding that the legislature appropriates to the formula every biennium. And it's divided by the total weighted credit hours um, that are produced uh, by all universities with, within, all public universities within the system. Um, so, in essence, the, the pivotal thing to, to take from this is that you can see that over the last many years, formula funding has been relatively flat. Uh, that is not to say that the legislature has not allocated or appropriated additional resources, but relative to the growth that our universities have had, uh, in effect, they've just kept pace um, uh, uh, with, with that. Um, if you look at the line within the bars, and you'll see that 32.98 in 2020, what that reflects is the um, inflation-adjusted purchasing power today of uh, that, that dollar, if you will, the weighted credit hour. So today, uh, that credit, it really, our purchasing power relative to 2000 is $32.98. Um, that's in, adjusted by the Higher Education Price Index, uh, which is the inflationary index for higher education. Uh, and again, all that is to say, it sets the backdrop for the fact that funding at the state level has been uh, relatively flat when it comes to formula. Um, and that has an impact on each of our institutions as they continue to grow and as they continue to provide uh, or look, to w look for resources to provide the much needed services to our students. If you look at the bottom section of that slide, you can absolutely see uh, what I've just discussed. Over the last three decades, you can see the decline in overall state support from 54% to 24% in 2020 and a commensurate increase in the student support, which is principally uh, tuition and fees. Raymond, what sort of things make up the other support, the green box? Yeah, good question. So that's going to be our auxiliaries and gifts. So uh, a lot of our food service, parking, and the things that we'll get into a little bit, but generally okay. your self-funded operations. Okay. The, uh, the contracts and grants are research and financial aid. You go to the next slide. Um, continuing along, if you will, on the theme of, of overall uh, funding at a higher or macro level, <clears throat> the university uh, does not, for every dollar that it generates uh, through tuition, not every, every one of those dollars is available uh, to the university uh, directly because the, there are different uh, exemptions and waivers that are, are required by the state. Um, one of them in particular, um, and what those waivers and exemptions do is that reduces the, the amount of revenue that the university actually collects. So if you think about it, you, you bill, that's the gross tuition, the exemptions and waivers kick in, then you have your net tuition. Your net tuition is the spendable or investable dollars, not the gross. Um, and so one of the larger uh, growing or fastest growing um, exemptions that, uh, you know, within state law is called the Hazelwood exemption. Uh, the Hazelwood exemption or act has been around for quite some years uh, and it, it allows qualified veterans, spouses, and dependent children, um, you know, to, to or provides a qualified uh, veteran, spouse, and dependent children with an education benefit. Basically, it'll waive their tuition and, and fees uh, up to a certain number of hours. Um, <clears throat> what has really gone on over the last uh, 10 or so years has been the introduction of the Hazelwood Legacy Act. Now, the ha Hazelwood Leg Legacy Act is, is, if you will, an extension of the original act because what it does now, it allows the veterans to, in essence, um, 
transfer the unused portion of their exemption or benefit uh, to, their, uh, to their children under certain conditions. Um, just to give you some perspective, the legacy component has grown 41% over the last five years. The total cost to the system is nearing $15 million. And the real, real kicker here is that the cost of this program is not funded by the legislature. We, 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 we own that cost. Um, the chart above is a, a, a representation of what the actual amount that students who do not receive the benefit are paying for, if you will, this, uh, this cost. So at the University of Houston, a student who is not receiving the Hazel One benefit uh, pays an extra $225 a year. At Clear Lake, 240, downtown, 128, and at Victoria, 175. So, so, so Raymond, just, just to be clear on the, on the legacy piece here, uh, that's not really increasing the cost of the program because if you look theoretically at a, a Hazelwood beneficiary, he has X number of credits. If he doesn't use them, he transfers them to a related party. But the total number of Hazelwood credits doesn't grow as a result of that. Am I correct? Or? That is correct. It, uh, the, the only issue is that um, <clears throat> under, under the original act, perhaps they would have lapsed, but in right. the, but by, right. by being able to transfer, then, yeah. if you will, the okay. velocity picks up. Yeah. So we would expect that perhaps some credits to lapse, but correct. we don't, so we pay the full cost of the That's program. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Next slide, please. Each of our universities uh, have uh, different strategies to enhancing student success. Uh, as, you, as, you, as we all know, student success is our number one priority. Um, at the University of Houston, uh, we, are, we are increasing uh, financial aid uh, to make college affordable to, to all students. Um, one, one in particular thing that we'll talk about in the next slide is the expansion of our Cougar Promise, uh, but I don't want to steal my own thunder too, too quickly. Uh, one of the other programs that we have talked about to the board before or with the board before is our UH and 4 program, uh, which you may be familiar with, is a program that allows uh, students to, uh, we guarantee if students will take 30 credit hours in an academic year, we will provide them the resources necessary to graduate within four years. It's been a resounding success at the University of Houston. Uh, I want to say 70 to 75 percent of all incoming first time in college freshmen sign up for UH and 4. Um, and uh, Provost Short and her team uh, and Dr. Couture should be applauded for um, the implementation of this program. It has been a tremendous success. And you can see that success when you look down at the box below, and you can look at our six-year graduation rate uh, over the last five years. We have reached the original goal of 60% uh, within six years, uh, about a year in advance, and uh, we are pushing beyond the 60% with uh, a goal to get even more students graduated within uh, six years. Um, next slide, please. So talk about uh, Cougar Promise. Um, Cougar Promise, of course, is the university's promise to uh, low-income families that college is accessible to their children and that financial aid will be available to them. Um, we are pleased to put before you today uh, a uh, a recommendation to increase our Cougar Promise from the current $50,000 or up to $50,000 for families with an adjusted gross income less uh, up to $50,000. We are looking and asking uh, for approval to move forward up to $65,000. So moving Cougar Promise from $50,000 up to $65,000 uh, for families uh, uh, and that will provide additional uh, free tuition and fees to our students uh, who fit uh, within that criteria. Additionally, we are uh, going to expand that even farther for uh, individuals whose adjusted gross family income is between 65,001 and 125,000. We're going to provide them some additional tuition support as well. So 
well, we are we are very very excited about this opportunity uh, to uh, expand our Cougar Promise to our uh, students and and uh, and their families. How much how much does the incremental the increment cost? The well, incremental going cost from fifty to sixty-five. What's the the impact on? D Dr. Walker, do you have that number? Uh, uh, a little under a million, a little <coughs> under a million dollars. There is a lot of restructuring that has gone in place. Um, however, uh, I think the important thing to note note is that it is still does not meet all the need. We still have unmet need for students because. Um, they still can take loans, and those loans are not necessarily for tuition and fee. The loans are for personal expenses or other things. So we have to even do more in order to help the students besides covering tuition and fee, particularly for the lowest of the lowest class. We also have to look very seriously at financial literacy piece, and that we are looking right now to how is it that we make them aware so they're, they're, they're taking responsible way for loans for personal expenses and things like that. So does this, how does this, I don't want to get off track here, but just in terms of overall financial aid, I mean, they, aren't most of these students still eligible for Pell Grants or other types of financial aid? Uh, right. So I think either Raymond can also explain, but basically it's the same way as uh, other Texas schools are doing as well, which is you first take the Pell Grant in, into this, then you will take the state Texas state grant into consideration. You, you also, if there are any scholarships that are already uh, clear by that time, they would take, be taken into consideration, and then whatever is the remaining need left, that is what institution comes in and covers that's the for them. That's covered by that's, that's what we are covering now. Okay. That's correct. Is that's it, why the number is so small. That's why it's so that's small. Right. 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 Raymond, okay. is there a percentage goal on the new up to 125,000 support or do we know that yet? No, we don't. I don't know that we have that. that I mean, no. we, know, we know based on current data, we know how many students, we, we have an estimate of how many students would fit within in that range. I think the important thing to notice is that um, we are required by state law to set aside 15% of tuition that we uh, collect from students for financial need program. So we have that part of money and that's what we use to really be able to help the students. And then the scholarships fill in and now we are looking, okay, if we can do this much, what is the next thing that we can do to help the students? So, so that's where we, I mean, we have shifted our focus after fig figuring this out as to what are the other intangible things also that we can do because it's really distressing is still to see that the lowest of the lowest family income students have is still carry a large portion of loans. Well, what, what do we say, what do we tell people, tell students, what the, putting aside tuition, what, what's the rest of it cost? What do we, what do we just tell them? 40,000 a year or right. whatever it is. We do have a total cost of attendance. The co total cost of attendance is about 13. No, no, it's more no, 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 it's going to be more than that because it, it includes housing, it includes living expense, uh, uh, tra transportation expenses, yeah, things of that nature. 23 at least. We can get Moira to come forward maybe. 20? Moira can. Okay. Yeah, so 24. So 25,000. 25,000. 25,000 yeah, over and above tuition is what it costs you know, for the living expenses, housing, transportation, on some kind of average. Correct. It's, it's not over and above tuition, it's inclusive. It's total. Including housing. To, yeah, tuition. Now, but housing, but, tuition. But it doesn't, it doesn't know. Yeah, yes. it's inclusive yes. of tuition Includes and fees. It, right. Includes tuition? Yes. yes. So w w what's the excess over the tuition? I'm trying to get to a number for a 65, somebody whose family doesn't earn. So, so it's about half. So it's about half. half It'd be about thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars. Because if, if you're thinking, if you're saying twenty-five thousand, then the average cost would be about eleven to twelve thousand for a student uh, per per year. So you're talking about a half. So you're talking about a fifty thousand dollar loan over. A, they'd have to, you know, 
they, they over four years. Right. Over over four years. Our yeah. students don't take that much loan. I know uh, they work some. Right. They, they work. Our average loan actually is is, is uh, looking at national comparison of universities. We are generally among the very top twenty or so in terms of where our students take loan. And we, what we have seen it in last three years with all the efforts that go on in student affairs to to educate them about the loans and, and what their responsibilities are, that each year the loan amount has actually declined, and even though the tuition has gone up, but we need to just, I'm just saying we need to just ratchet up one more level and just figure it out whether we make it mandatory for, for all students, a zero credit or zero cost type of a course, or what do we do? Because it's just, I mean, if you look at it, it's still their debt. It's just not, it doesn't look good. It's still, even though we can cover tuition and fees. are out of state and international. All three categories are only yeah. U.S. residents. These are tax for Texas, Texas, Texas residents. What about out of state? Yeah. No, yeah. it doesn't no. cover this. So we don't support uh, out of state students. They have to pay higher tuition fee. Well, yes, I mean, they, they, they do pay higher tuition, yes. And they should pay higher because Texas residents are already paying in their taxes. I mean, that's the whole advantage of being in residence. Right. Uh, and I'll put a little cherry on top of, of this program in that, uh, just as a data point, it is also, th this program uh, is also renewable for up to four years for the majority of our students as long as they maintain eligibility. and, and uh, there, there is one particular program where it extends to five years, but for the most, it's four years. So, um, it's it, we're very proud of, of of what we're we're doing to try to again make um, continue to make um, education uh, accessible and affordable to to our students. If we can move to the next slide, um, so kind of transitioning into uh, tuition, uh, if you will. Um, and this is really just a, a, a kind of a high level just to compare where we are as of fall of 19, so the semester in which we're in or the prior semester in which we're in for that academic year. Uh, if you look at the University of Houston's uh, tuition uh, and fee cost on a 12 credit hour basis, you can see that uh, we uh, compare very favorably to our Texas uh, brethren. Uh, next slide. If this is looking at it more on a macro level at the national level, uh, this is for each one of our universities, uh, comparing where each of, each of those universities uh, fit uh, relative to those peers. The peers are per the tire, Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Uh, so it's not a, a group that we've chosen uh, for convenience. It is a group that's been selected through the, and reported into the Texas Higher Edu Education Coordinating Board. Uh, and again, you can see how we compare very favorably uh, in terms of our affordability relative to our national uh, peers as defined in this particular presentation slide. Next slide, please. So getting, getting to the meat of the uh, request uh, before us today, is we are requesting a 2.6% increase for fiscal years 21 and fiscal year 22 for the University of Houston um, for its tuition and fee increase. And you can see, relative to the rest of uh, the state uh, universities uh, that are uh, kind of U of H, uh, if you will, peers in quotations, uh, you can see <clears throat> that we are very well in line with our peers. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, peer set for the University of Houston Clear Lake, University of Houston Downtown and Victoria, uh, you can see that they too are requesting a 2.6% increase uh, in tuition and we'll get into the details in a moment for each specific university, but you can see again amongst their peer set, um, they are uh, not out of line with uh, the peers. Slide 10, uh, this is looking at the University of Houston specifically uh, and our variable rate tuition. As you may recall, we have both a variable rate and a fixed rate plan, as do all of our universities. Uh, on the variable rate plan, we are proposing, as I said, a 2.6% increase for fiscal year 21 and 22. 
Uh, if you look to the very bottom of the uh, slide, you will see that uh, the average increase uh, for a student would be per semester $166 in 21 and $170 in fiscal year 22. And as you may recall, the University of Houston uh, has uh, had for some years a tiered uh, pricing structure for its tuition based on the particular college uh, or major of the, uh, of the student. Um, and, and again, those tiers are based on uh, <clears throat> the general cost of delivering instruction within each of those particular disciplines. With respect to uh, graduate tuition, the University of Houston is proposing a 2.6% increase in fiscal years 21 and 22 as well uh, for its master's in professional programs. Uh, next slide. Uh, if we look at the University of Houston downtown, University of Houston Victoria, and University of Houston Clear Lake uh, in terms of their tuition setting and where, where they're positioned today relative to the 37 other public universities in the state of Texas, you can see that their tuition is priced, um, quite frankly, at, at, at you know, the lower third of universities within the state. Um, and so, um, it just kind of a, gives you a, a, a kind of a snapshot of, of you know where they're positioned relative to uh, the rest of the public universities in the state. Uh, again, as I mentioned, each of our four universities has uh, different strategies to improving student success. Uh, within Clear Lake, uh, they have many strategies. I'll just uh, highlight a few of them: uh, tutoring uh, and academic advising. Uh, they are uh, increasing the, uh, their proactive uh, efforts towards advising uh, throughout the university. Um, I think we have all re recognized that uh, the more interaction we have with our students, um, the, m the, the more effective we are in retaining them and uh, matriculating them through um, their uh, time here at the university uh, leading to graduation. Uh, next slide. Uh, U of H Clear Lake. Uh, for their undergraduate uh, uh, tuition is requesting a 2.6% increase as well for fiscal years 21 and 22. And you can see the dollar change there, $116 in 21 and $118 in 22 uh, for a 15 credit hour semester. Uh, their graduate uh, uh, tuition, they are requesting an increase of 1.4% in 21 and a 0.2% almost flat in fiscal year 22. With respect to the University of Houston downtown uh, strategies, uh, I, I do want to point, uh, direct you to uh, the table below the narrative, and in particular, the first row, the FTIC first year retention rate. Um, I, I want to highlight uh, the fact that uh, UH downtown has done a remarkable job uh, in uh, improving its first year retention rate among first time in college students. Um, this is a tremendous um, uh, upward swing and trend uh, for UH downtown uh, and they, uh, we want to commend them for, for their efforts. Uh, likewise, uh, their graduation rates uh, have improved. Uh, if you look back to 2008, when it was at 15%, today it's nearly double that rate. Um, and the number of baccalaureate degrees that they are awarding uh, have topped 3,000, um, almost a, well, over a 1,000 uh, degree increase since the base year nearly 12 years ago. So again, a tremendous effort. Um, and the proof is in the, in the results, and the results are um, wonderful. UH down, next slide, I'm sorry. Next slide. UH downtown um, is requesting a 2.6% uh, increase in its variable rate tuition for fiscal year 21 as well as in 22, uh, as well they are for graduate tuition in 21 and 22. And you can see the uh, increase for a 15 hour load for an undergraduate student per, per semester. Uh, somewhere between $109 to $113 over the two-year period, um, and then $122 to $126 increase for a graduate student taking nine hours. 
at UH Victoria. Uh, they continue to focus on uh, student success and campus growth, increasing uh, faculty uh, and staff, uh, particularly tenure and tenure track faculty, um, continuing to focus on supporting the growth out in the UH, UHV, uh, Katy area, uh, and uh, investing in their infrastructure, which supports student success. Uh, UH Victoria is requesting a, uh, an increase of 2.6% as well for years, uh, fiscal years 21 and 22, both in the undergraduate and graduate uh, program. If we looked at now our fixed rate program, uh, the, again, as I mentioned, each one of our universities has a fixed year, uh, uh, fixed rate uh, uh, tuition plan. Um, if you look at the University of Houston, relative to its uh, peers in the state, based on a 15 credit hour uh, semester, you can see again, we, we are positioned uh, very favorably compared to the other uni public universities uh, in the state in terms of our um, tuition and fees. We show it here as a, for an education major, and next slide, we also, for, for transparency, we also show it for a business major, so two different uh, if you will, undergraduate rate groups. So we show one of the lower ones and we show one of the higher ones uh, just so uh, uh, we can demonstrate uh, transparency in terms of what we're comparing. With respect to our four-year fixed uh, rate plan at the University of Houston, we are requesting a 2.6% increase in each of the different rate groups within our fixed rate plan. Um, as you may recall, about a uh, year, year and a half ago, uh, the University of Houston modified its fixed rate plan uh, slightly to uh, also differentiate between first-time in college students and transfer students. And so what you see reflected here are the different rates for the four different rate groups that we already have for our undergraduate students plus transfer students. Uh, so again, going up 2.6%. Uh, in fiscal years 21 and 22. And next slide, University of Houston Clear Lake and the University of Houston Victoria, U of H Clear Lake is going up 2.6% in fiscal years 21 and 22 for its four-year fixed tuition plan. And UH Victoria is proposing an increase of 2.5% uh, for both years in its fixed uh, tuition plan. University of Houston downtown has a five-year uh, fixed rate tuition plan. They are requesting a 2.6 percent increase for both fiscal years 21 and 22. Okay. And, uh, go ahead, uh, next slide. Yep. And I'm going to transition now, if there are no questions, I'm going to transition from tuition uh, to uh, mandatory uh, fees. With respect to our mandatory fees, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation and the outset, uh, there are multiple advisory groups uh, that represent our students, faculty, and staff uh, across these different fees. And so no one of these fees gets through uh, a, without having some form of a vetting process uh, by those who have to consume and pay for those services. Uh, at the University of Houston, uh, the student service fee for fiscal year 21 is not changing, although we do bring it to the board uh, as uh, it needs to be approved on an annual basis, uh, regardless of change. With respect to the campus recreation fee for fiscal years 21 and 22, we are requesting a $3 increase each year. So going from 106 to 109 in fiscal 21 and from 109 to 112 in fiscal 22. The increase in revenue generated by these uh, fee increases to the campus recreation fee will fund the debt service associated with a two-phase project uh, for renovation work uh, at the Campus Recreation and Wellness Center. Uh, that two-phase project is broken into uh, phase one being basically the envelope of the building, uh, the roof and, and, and other exterior of the building, um, and phase two will be 
the uh, repairing damage that was done to, uh, from a leaky roof, if you will, uh, and the intrusion of that water into the flooring and, and other areas within the interior of the campus uh, recreation and wellness center. It's a thir all in, it's a $13 million project, both phases, and again, this fee will support that, um, th those fee increases. UH Clear Lake is proposing a, an increase of $12 or 5% to its student service fee and included further into these materials, which I uh, don't uh, intend to go over unless you, you would, would like to know more. Um, there, they have a dedicated purpose for which the fee revenue will be used. Um, it is uh, in line with student success. Um, with respect to UH Downtown, again, uh, they are not requesting an increase in their student service fee uh, uh, for FY21, so it will remain at $150. And UH Victoria is requesting a 7% increase each of the next two years, uh, anywhere from $20.52 $20 to $21.96 uh, for each year uh, to support uh, various initiatives within their university. Victoria's student fee is so high. Yes. What, what, what's the main? I guess what's the uh, what's the main reason that's so much higher than the other universities? Yeah, I I, I think there as a as a downward expansion uh, university, a destination university. I think they're still trying to build a lot of their uh, programming, and so I think they need the resources to continue to to uh, become that destination campus. Uh, I'm sorry, if you go back for just one slide. Uh, and uh, there are other academic mandatory fees at both UH Clear Lake and UH Victoria, um, such as course-based fees, IT fees, things of that nature, but uh, they're very detailed type of stuff. Uh, they are provided uh, in the presentation uh, and are on file in the board office. I'm going to skip ahead uh, to page 30, uh, 34, 35 actually. Um, and again, in keeping in the theme of uh, um, advisory uh, units that, that oversee a lot of these fee increases, uh, the University of Houston will be recommending or is recommending a 3% increase in I its housing rates. And again, this has been uh, fully vetted by uh, university constituents and you can see there, um, the Residential Life uh, Advisory Board and its composition, um, and this, and again, this has been vetted by uh, that group as well as various town hall meetings. Uh, next slide. And what you'll see here on slide 36, uh, it's a little difficult to see, but uh, UH down, uh, U University of Houston is requesting a 3% increase for uh, fiscal year 21 in its uh, uh, housing uh, rates. Um, Dr. Walker does a really good job of, of, of monitoring the properties around the university uh, and making sure that we remain, remain competitive and he's, he's, he's satisfied and he's satisfied us that uh, we remain competitive uh, with these increases. Uh, to give you some perspective, the Houston area apartment rent uh, inflation uh, projection is 4.2% for, for 2020. Uh, and so we are uh, below uh, what is the projected uh, rental rate, uh, inflationary rate increase uh, for rents uh, for apartments in, uh, in the Houston area. Um, <clears throat> as well, I would like to point out that our partnership properties, Cullen Oaks uh, is, is planning a 3% increase and Cambridge Oaks is planning an average increase of about 1.3%. At the University of Houston, uh, with respect to meal plan rates, uh, I, the story here is that the University of Houston is actually um, increasing the number of service days uh, that we are providing uh, food service to our students. We are going from 216 days to 245 days beginning uh, this, this fall. Um, and that uh, increase uh, in number of service days does come at an associated cost, but I am pleased to report to you that the students have asked for this, and so they're very supportive of 
uh, this additional um, these additional service days and the and understand the associated cost with it. So, with respect to fiscal year 21, uh, meal plan rates for residents uh, are are going to go up anywhere from 4.7 to 5.3 percent. However, 3.4 percent of that or 3.4 percent of that is due to uh, a, a contractual uh, clause within the contract that says that uh, food prices, uh, the price has to go up by the uh, cost of inflation, which is for food is 3.4%. Uh, so of the total 4.7%, for example, in our platinum plan, 3.4% or 3.4 points of the 4.7 are in fact uh, due to inflation the other 1.3 percent or points are due to the additional service days. Now we're spreading this cost of additional service days across the two years so you'll see it again in the second year but we're doing that in order to try to um, you know uh, manage the, the cost increase uh, not over the, the one year but spread it over two. So if we go to the second uh, page th slide 38 you'll see the rates for uh, residential meal plans for the University of Houston in fiscal year 22. Again, going up similarly between 4.3% and 4.8%. Again, you, you see the food away from home CPI uh, increase, and then you see uh, the, the, the cost uh, attributable to the additional service days um, there at uh, the University of Houston. With respect to the University of Houston's commuter meal plan rates uh, for students, uh, likewise, commuter, uh, the commuter students uh, also are, are uh, able to take advantage of or, or have the benefit of the additional service days, uh, and they too are contributing to the overall cost or spreading of that cost to our uh, students. Um, that also, for the commuter meal plans in fiscal year 21, are going up similarly as the residential meal plans four and a half to four point seven percent again the majority of that being the food CPI for FY 22 rates going up uh, four point one to four point three percent depending on the block plan and again uh, it's CPI plus the second half of the phase in of that increase with respect to UH parking and transportation and our parking rates. I uh, wanted to spend just a few moments in terms of talking about our, you know, the, the, our parking and transportation uh, services. Um, of course, as you may be aware, uh, parking and transportation is an auxiliary unit. Uh, it is self-funded. The revenue it generates to support its operations is, is what it has. Uh, and as its operations grow, um, it too uh, has to find additional ways to support that growth either through more efficiency or um, uh, additional uh, rates. <clears throat> when we think about parking and transportation, we think about three specific things, safety, mobility, and sustainability. When we, when we talk about safety, uh, the principal uh, vehicle through which we uh, provide that safety to our community is our Cougar Ride Program. It is an after-hours transportation service for all students, faculty, staff, and visitors that began in the fall of 2018. Uh, the service extends to the campus uh, perimeter. The most common uh, destination for our community is uh, the residence halls, the parking lots, and the library. Um, we had over 13,000 individual rides during the 18-19 academic year, so this is a very well utilized program uh, and our community really um, is appreciative of, of this. Um, this program, the Cougar Ride program, actually uh, before a parking and transportation uh, took it over, it was actually being run by our uh, UH Police Department. And so, if you will, some of their resources were being diverted to providing, albeit a very essential service, now we're able to free them up to do other types of, uh, if you will, policing and security and uh, centralizing this through parking and transportation. When it ter in terms of mobility, um, you may have seen throughout the university our shuttle bus system. 
Uh, we have a 20 bus uh, propane powered shuttle service that's moved uh, 574,000 uh, students, if you will, not obviously discrete students, but one student could be uh, getting onto the shuttle service multiple times a day. Um, but it, the point here is that it's moving a lot of people around the campus. Uh, and instead of them using a vehicle, um, they're able to jump on the shuttle service. Um, we have seven routes serving the campus, including the Eastwood Transit Center, Technology Bridge, and for those students who take classes both here at U of H as well as at Sugarland, we also provide service back and forth between Sugarland and the University of Houston's main campus. Um, so the shuttle bus service, as I say, limits or reduces the amount of cars that have to circulate, giving us a little bit more of a pedestrian feel at the university. And the, and the service uh, is operated uh, anywhere from five to seven days a week, depending on the, 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 the time period. So from 7A to, to 9P, it operates five days a week, and its after hours are from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. With respect to sustainability, um, the, la the other focus uh, at the university, uh, I believe Dr. Mesa has provided uh, to you in the past a, an update or a presentation on our COAST program, which stands for Cougs on Alternative and Sustainable Transportation. It is our way, it's our program, and it's our way to try to curb uh, the demand uh, for parking on campus. Um, it, this program started in 2016 and has grown 40% each year since its, incep its inception. Uh, as I say, it is focused on reducing demand, um, reducing our carbon footprint, and offering our students, um, faculty and staff, an affordable transportation option. Um, we have five sustainability partners within the parking and transportation program. Metro, uh, which I'm proud to uh, advise you, uh, awarded the University of Houston last year the Transit Partner of the Year Award, um, and we're very proud of that. Uh, a lot of great and hard work in our parking and transportation unit. Uh, we have a van pool uh, program that, of course, partners with Metro, and we also have, we, we partner with Uber, uh, B-Cycle, and Zipcar. Uh, and I think what's interesting is the university of Houston actually will pay uh, members to use some of our alternative uh, means of transportation. We've got 4,400 members in the program right now. Um, so right about 10 to 11 percent of our, our, our total uh, student body. Um, that, but we will provide, for example, discount uh, for metro fares. Uh, we will provide credits uh, for people to take Uber. Um, we, of course, have the B-Cycle program, which allows students, which allows students to uh, move about the camp interior of the campus uh, using a bicycle, um, with again, without having to uh, jump in a car and go somewhere else, you know, from one parking lot to another, for example. Um, so we, we are, we, we're doing a lot of creative things to try to, um, manage, if you will, the demand for parking at the University of Houston. That's all uh, kind of a precursor to uh, and a lot of hard work uh, that I wanted to acknowledge in our parking and transportation uh, area. Um, with all that said, um, there is a, a need to, um, after careful consideration, to increase our parking rates uh, for fiscal years 21 and 22. Um, on average, with, uh, within our student uh, uh, permits, we're going up about 5% in uh, 21. Uh, that's not taking into consideration uh, the reduction in the, re the resident garage rate from 965 to 905. Um, we're also going up uh, uh, about 35 to 4.7% in fiscal year 22 for our students. Um, with regards to our faculty and staff, if you look at the first three lines in faculty and staff, the reserved covered, the reserved and the gated, these are some of the more convenient, more proximal uh, spot, uh, parking spots to the interior of the campus. Um, they are the most coveted uh, and they're often waitlisted. And so um, these are, if you will, premium uh, parking 
people, people will pay for, for, for this parking. Um, we are, uh, if you'll notice on faculty and staff on the garage, uh, again, we, we, uh, we have no rate increase for the garage. We have frozen that rate, and if you compare that to the resident garage above where we reduced the rate from 90, 965 to 905, we basically uh, created an equilibrium uh, in pricing between faculty and staff and student parking garages. Um, in essence, where we're, where we're ultimately trying to go is that a garage is a garage is a garage regardless of whether you're a faculty member, a student, or a staff member because what we're trying to do is maximize the use of each of our assets. Um, and if we can uh, not designate something for a specific cohort, but in fact look at it as a total asset that can be used by anybody, then in fact we can uh, reduce the need for continued building of parking garages. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with respect to visitor parking at the University of Houston, um, we are increasing rates uh, for visitor parking as well. Um, we, are, we are basically trying to encourage students. In essence, we're trying to make sure that we have enough parking spaces truly for our visitors um, and that we're encouraging those individuals who may use uh, our visitor and meter parking for short-term parking that, in fact, uh, we would prefer, if we can change uh, behavior, uh, ask them to uh, buy a, a parking permit. Um, and, you know, visitor parking is part of the overall pricing uh, strategy within parking and transportation services. I won't go into a lot of uh, detail here. I'll just hit the highlights here with respect to voluntary and optional fee changes uh, at the University of Houston. There are some uh, changes related to international student fees, um, but these are very cohort specific. Uh, they're not broad in their application. Uh, another example would be an application fee and a deposit fee for the College of Medicine, uh, as well as uh, we are uh, ex expanding the use of certain fees. Uh, by definition, it's more of a housekeeping item. And we are also eliminating a couple of fees, one in pharmacy and the Graduate College of Social Work. And again, any detail that you may uh, wish to, to view is available uh, in the detailed section of the presentation that is on file in the board office. With respect to the University of Houston Clear Lakes housing, uh, they are actually proposing uh, a reduction in a couple of their units within Hunter Hall. If you may recall, Hunter Hall is their new uh, on-campus housing uh, uh, facility. 298 bed facility. Uh, they are actually requesting a $400 reduction in fiscal year 21 to their single room, their suite, and their suite style double room. Um, they believe that this decrease will better align uh, their, their pricing and make them more competitive with housing rates in the area. University of Houston Clear Lakes residential meal plans uh, they are all declining balance plans, uh, and so they, are, they have one minimum uh, required plan for their resident students, and it is the lower, it's the bottom uh, dining plan, uh, the $1,000 declining balance uh, per semester. Uh, they have two voluntary uh, declining balance plans, one for $2,100 and $1,680. So they're going up. Uh, they're reducing actually the uh, one plan from 2120 to 2100, and they're increasing by $400 the uh, second plan from 1280 to 1680, as well as increasing the minimum required residential plan from 700 to 100. Uh, excuse me, to 1000. U of H Clear Lakes parking rates, uh, a relatively small increase in. Uh, their parking rates uh, for fiscal year 21, uh, two to three dollar increase uh, across the board for faculty, staff, and students, uh, and no increase is being proposed for fiscal year 22. U of H Clear Lake also has uh, recommended increases in some uh, academic uh, optional fees, again, very specific to very small cohorts of students. 
um, things like a records processing fee, an application fee, uh, and various and sundry other miscellaneous fees. Uh, again, that information uh, is available uh, in the detail section of their of the presentation. Uh, if if uh, you'd like to review that in more detail. Next slide is University of Houston downtown's parking rates. University of Houston downtown is going up uh, on average five to six percent for students in fiscal year 21 and about four percent on average for students in uh, fiscal year 22. Uh, they are also uh, aligning um, some of their rates to be more consistent across uh, the different cohorts um, uh, within their university. Uh, next slide, University of Houston Victoria's housing rates going up 4.5% uh, each of the years, fiscal year 21 and 22. Uh, next slide, with respect to the University of Houston Victoria's residential meal plans, uh, they are actually, this is uh, as part of their continued downward uh, as a destination campus, uh, they are extending service hours. Uh, for their, uh, their, their student, their resident students. They're also going from the traditional block plans to the unlimited plan. So uh, if you will, unlimited anytime dining, um, which of course has an associated cost with it. Uh, they are also creating meal exchanges uh, into the retail for the first time. Uh, I believe they're gonna have a Chick-fil-A on campus. Uh, so it's the, it's the, if you will, the growth of the University of Houston Victoria's um, university uh, in, and as it continues to grow in terms of resident students, it has to grow its, its, uh, its uh, food service program, both in, a, in terms of residential meal plans as well as uh, retail food service. Uh, they are going up, um, they're going to take most of their increase in, all of their increase in year one. Um, one of, but basically they're adding about 48% more meals uh, than the previous plan for the red plan. Uh, again, they have an uh, inflation factor in, embedded into the cost increase as well as a uh, increase for service. In, and again, you'll see that both years 21 and 22. Uh, and in year 22, you see the 2.8 to 3.5% increase. That is uh, basically the inflation factor. Um, their commuter plan, uh, they are adding a $100 declining balance to their commuter meal plan in 21, um, as opposed to uh, the current plan. And again, our commu their commuter meal plan students will benefit from the extended access hours uh, and uh, are part of that overall pricing model. Uh, and again, you can see in slide 57 for 22, they're recommending a 2.3% increase, again, uh, generally an in inflationary adjustment. And lastly, with, re with regards to tuition and fees, uh, UH Victoria's parking rates, this is the first year in which the University of Houston Victoria will uh, charge uh, faculty, staff, and students for parking. Um, and so this is their, if you will, foray into uh, that arena. Uh, and they are setting their rates for the first time, and their rates are based on within students, uh, I'm sorry, within faculty and, and staff, uh, they are um, based on compensation. So they have kind of a, tier, excuse me, a tiered, a, a tiered structure with respect to uh, their uh, fee structure. So if you, the higher your compensation, you pay more in parking. Um, <laughs> so, um, yep. all right. Regent McKelvey, that completes the <coughs> tuition and fee agenda item. Okay. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? May I hear a motion to approve this item as presented? So moved. Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Item is hereby approved. <clears throat> the next action item for the committee's consideration and approval today is item F. Approval is requested to delegate authority to the chancellor to, to negotiate and execute contracts for design and construction for the John M. O'Quinn Law Building located in the professional district at the University of Houston. 
Mr. Bartlett, will you present this item? Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> we actually brought this item to you back uh, in August of last year, and you approved the project at $78 million uh, due to uh, some additional fundraising. Uh, we are requesting your approval to increase the project budget to $90 million. Uh, so a very positive story. Um, uh, there's a slide in the presentation uh, that shows where, uh, just as a refresher, where the law school, uh, new law school will reside. Uh, it is at the end of uh, uh, Cullen Boulevard, uh, right in front, it's the parking lot, right in front of the existing law school. So, any questions? What happens to the existing when the new one is built? Yes. So uh, we, we certainly will be considering um, many different options uh, for that uh, uh, particular building. We haven't uh, uh, finalized anything, but we are certainly in discussions in terms of the use of that, that building. Uh, well, we'll be, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, so we're gonna take that pad, uh, but garage six, uh, which will be completed this fall, well in advance of this will basically be where we would offload those, those, uh, those patrons. Young lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? Hmm? May I hear a motion to approve this item? Mm -hmm. Is a second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Item is hereby approved. Next on our agenda for the committee's consideration is item G, approval is requested to write off accounts and notes receivable for fiscal year 2019, UH system. Mr. Bartlett, please go ahead. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, we are requesting a, a, to write off accounts and notes receivable totaling $7,742,606 uh, for fiscal year 2019 across all four of our universities. Um, this is really, if you will, um, you know, wh whenever a, a receivable goes uncollected uh, or there's no activity for uh, two years, we remove it from our financial statement presentation, which is really what this is amounting to. Uh, just to, uh, as a reminder, uh, we are required to provide uh, extended credit uh, to our students um, without regard to credit capacity or credit history. Um, and secondly, although we may write it off for a financial statement, uh, presentation purposes off our books, uh, we do not forgive the debt and we continue to attempt to collect it um, uh, going forward. Uh, to give you some perspective, uh, the total write-off represents 0.73 percent of, of that revenue, uh, which is materially lower than any of the comparative uh, data points that we look at. So, for example, the Federal Reserve credit card, card default rate, which is 2.58 percent, uh, the Nukubo Institutional Loan Rate, uh, default rate, which is 3.3%, and the Department of Education Student Loan Default Rate, which is 10%. So, um, again, that's correct. That's right. That's right. So, again, I went more of a financial statement presentation, uh, cleaning up of the books, if you will. Right. Absolutely. Any questions? Now I hear a motion to approve this item as presented. So moved. Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Items hereby approved. Item H, approval is requested to delegate authority to the Chancellor to negotiate and execute insurance policies for fiscal year 2020 UH system as the next action item. Mr. Bartlett. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, we are requesting approval uh, for an amount not to exceed $7.1 million in delegating the authority to the Chancellor to negotiate and execute uh, such insurance policies as needed for fiscal year 2020. Uh, as as uh, you may recall, um, the State Office of Risk Management facilitates most of the, our property uh, and uh, casualty insurance. Uh, we are up under the State Office of Risk Management. They negotiate uh, these, these uh, premiums. Um, the increase over uh, the prior year is a function of a couple of different things. One, certainly, uh, g global catastrophes, um, but we're also the total total value of our uh, property, our insured value, has increased uh, over uh, this year uh, to the tune of uh, about 155 million dollars. Uh, that is uh, part of our insured value. 
Um, and so, uh, again, this is um, not something that is 100% within our control vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the State Office of Risk Management. Um, and um, as I say, with, with the various ca casualties uh, and, and catastrophes around the world, this is basically the passing of cro on that cost to the universities and other uh, insurance policyholders. <clears throat> Any questions? May I hear a motion to approve this item? So moved. Is there a second? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Item is hereby approved as presented. The last action item for our presentation today is item I. Approval is requested for the University of Houston system fiscal year 2021 holiday schedule and to amend the fiscal year 2020 holiday schedule for the University of Houston Clear Lake UH system. Mr. Bartlett. Yes, sir. Uh, we, we, uh, the state sets the number of days uh, per fiscal year that uh, we are permitted to, uh, or the board is permitted to grant for holiday. Uh, we have 14 days uh, in fiscal year 21, and uh, uh, included in, in the, on the slide is those specific days, uh, and we are requesting your approval of that, uh, those 14 days as noted in the materials. In addition, uh, we're requesting a housekeeping adjustment to the current fiscal year's holiday calendar. Last year, we had requested uh, a, a, uh, that UH Clear Lake's uh, spring break day be March the 20th. Uh, they, we just, there was a little bit of a snafu, admittedly, um, in setting that date, uh, and we just want to correct the record. Their date is actually uh, March the 13th, not the 20th. Okay. Any questions? May I hear a motion to approve this item as presented? Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Item is hereby approved as presented. This concludes the presentations of the seven action items for the committee's consideration and approval today. I would now like to request that these seven action items be placed on the board's consent docket agenda for final board approval as follows. Approval is requested to delegate authority to the chancellor to negotiate and execute contracts exceeding $1 million for the purchase of goods or services, excluding construction contracts at the UH system. Approval is requested to delegate authority to the Chancellor to negotiate and execute construction contracts exceeding $1 million for projects at the UH system. Approval is requested for changes to the fiscal year 2021 and fiscal year 2022 fixed tuition and fee rates, variable rate undergraduate and graduate tuition and fee rates, mandatory student recommended fees, and voluntary and optional fees at the University of Houston. Approval is requested to delegate authority to the Chancellor to negotiate and execute contracts for design and construction for the John M. O'Quinn Law Building located in the Professional District at the University of Houston. Approval is requested to write off accounts and notes receivable for fiscal year 2019 UH system. Approval is requested to delegate authority to the Chancellor to negotiate and execute insurance policies for fiscal year 2020 UH system. And approval is requested for the University of Houston system fiscal year 2021 holiday schedule and to amend the fiscal year 2020 holiday schedule for the University of Houston Clear Lake UH system. May I hear a motion to place all seven action items on the board's consent docket agenda? Second. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? These seven action items unanimously approved by the committee will be placed on the board's consent docket agenda for final approval at the Board of Regents meeting held later today, February 27, 2020. Our latest item today, or excuse me, our last item today is item J, a report on the sale of the Board of Regents of the University of Houston System Consolidated Revenue and Refunding Bonds, Series 2020A and Series 2020B, UH System. Mr. Bartlett, will you please introduce this item? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, back in mid-January, uh, the University of Houston system uh, sold $483 million worth of bonds. Uh, we were joined by Regent McKelvey, uh, the, our treasurer and myself, and it was a very successful sale uh, that day. 
Um, and I want to thank you for, for your, your participation in that as well. I'd like to think that was worth a basis point. <laughs> Maybe too. It certainly was. Um, we, as I say, we sold $483 million worth of bonds. Uh, included in that was approximately $147 million worth of refunding, the balance being for multiple projects across the university. And in, you see those listed at the bottom of the uh, materials that are uh, up on the screen and on your pad. Um, with respect to the uh, refunding, um, that $147 million refunding netted us on a net present value basis uh, $27 million in savings or debt, call, debt service avoidance, if you will. $27 million in, 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 in uh, current day terms. Uh, on a gross basis, that, that number was $33 million. The average life of those bonds was about nine years left, so that's why there's not a huge spread between the gross and the net. Um, with respect to the 2020A bonds, uh, we had seven bids. Uh, uh, Bank of America was the successful bidder at a total uh, rate of 2.44%. Um, very, very good rate, about what we were expecting on, on the 2020, actually a little bit better than we were expecting on the 2020As. On the 2020Bs, um, we were expecting actually a little bit higher rate, uh, near, near to 3%, and we actually wound up at 2.75% uh, based on eight bids. So again, the, the market uh, uh, really enjoys the University of Houston's uh, credit uh, being out there in the marketplace. Uh, our, our issuances were well received. Uh, we got uh, some good publicity uh, from it because, in fact, that week we were the largest issuer uh, in the market. Um, and so I'm very pleased to report that uh, through the efforts of a lot of, uh, a lot of people, um, we have yielded the system uh, $27 million in today's terms of debt cost, debt service avoidance. 99.5, uh, and a half, I'll correct myself, I said in our briefings it was 95%, 99.5% of that $27 million is directly beneficial to the system. Uh, only 2%, only a half a percent of it goes back to uh, the state through, because of the TRBs that were part of that refunding. Um, so it's, um, we're, we're very pleased with, with the overall sale, uh, and um, we got a very good uh, response from our credit rating agencies, both Moody's and Standard & Poor's, when we met with them in December in anticipation of the bond issuance, and they affirmed our long-term credit rating of AA, which is one grade below uh, the highest grade you can get, uh, of AAA, and they affirmed our short-term credit rating, which is the highest you can get, which is an A1+. Plus. So overall, a very positive uh, story for the University of Houston. And again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your yeah. uh, support. Thank you. I think it was an outstanding uh, issue. Uh, thank you for your presentation. This was presented for information only, and no committee action is required. Uh, I would now like to move to Section 2 listed on your agenda, the executive session. It should be noted that an executive session will not be held today. Does anyone have any more questions or comments? If not, the meeting is adjourned. So we're going to break for lunch now. And if you see all the scurrying around right now, uh, there's a major water line break out on 610. As a matter of fact, people are having to climb on top of their cars. And we have no plumbing here at the University of Houston. And so right now, determination is trying to be made what we should do. And we're trying to make the right decision. So uh, just let's go have lunch and uh, try not to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll just keep you posted. But uh, we, might, we might have to cancel certain functions the rest of the day and cancel school the rest of the day. We're just taking it on a moment by moment basis right now.
having many students on campus, that's one issue for us, and then all the meal plans and everything. I, I have a little more information. You know, for, this uh, was a 96 inch water main break, as uh, alluded to, and right now the city's not giving us any ETA on a repair. So. Yeah. I don't think it's on the west side of town. From what I hear, it's only on it's, the east side of town. The it's on the east side closed, of town. Right? Yeah. The meeting has been closed or no? The meeting has been closed? Not this meeting. No, no our meeting, this finance committee meeting. Oh, finance. Yes, it's closed. it's closed. Yeah, we're on break right now, so stop recording sure. everything. Okay. Uh, chairman wants to know what to do. Sure, sure. So, uh, we'll call the time did we start?
My name is Preston Johnson and I attended the University of Houston Clear Lake uh, and graduated in 1983. I also uh, had a career in the manufacturing sector of industry and spent over 40 years in manufacturing oil and gas and exploration and production. I came up from, from very humble beginnings. My, neither of my parents ever graduated from high school. And so the thing that you found in my household is that education was critical and became the, the great differentiator. There were times in my career when I would uh, sit in a boardroom and I would be surrounded by a bunch of people in those, in those rooms and m most of those people didn't look like me. Uh, most of them were the same gender, but at the end of the day, uh, I developed a relationship with those individuals and everything that we do is about making the business successful. And I didn't concentrate on the other stuff, peripheral stuff I can tell you, uh, in terms of, well, you black and, and they're all white. You're different uh, from them and uh, you're probably not going to be taken seriously. Uh, nobody's going to listen to what you got. You have to say. But I found that if you work hard, you prepare well for what you're going to do, and you are confident and committed to everything that you're doing, then nobody in that room is going to be any better than you at the job that you've been assigned to do. Take advantage of that and, and win. Each year we give the Community Partnership Award to a person, business, or organization that has helped advance the quality of life in the region and the university. This year I am offered to present the Community Partnership Award to the Alcoa Foundation. Alcoa has been a part of the Crossroads community since 1948, and Alcoa has been supporting UHV through gifts, grants, and donations for 35 years. Since 1984, the Foundation is one of our most generous and long-term supporters. In fact, Alcoa Foundation has given UHV more than $525,000 during those years. Its contributions have funded scholarships, leadership programs, programs for girls, and most recently, an array of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics-related programs. UHV Mathematics and Robotics Awareness Day is now entering its 25th year and has been heavily supported by the Alcoa Foundation during much of that time. Thanks to the Foundation's generosity, thousands of Victoria area middle and high school students have been introduced to and encouraged in STEM fields through camps, events, and programs. We appreciate all that the Alcoa Foundation has done to support education at UHV and in the crossroads. I am pleased and privileged to present this year's Community Partnership Award to the Alcoa Foundation. Accepting the award on behalf of the Foundation are Mr. Kevin Riggs, Site Manager for Alcoa Point Comfort Operations, and Ms. Martha Toller, Executive Lead Team Coordinator for, for Point Comfort Operations. Please join me in thanking the Alcoa Foundation. I'm honored and I'm flattered um, to, to receive that. 1,300 donors, um, and you have so much exciting things going on here at UHV. And so I won't, I won't take any time from you other than just I'm amazed and impressed. And, and the young man that spoke to us earlier, that's why you, you invest in young lives, to, to come here to play goalie and leave president of the Student Association. That's awesome. And congratulations on that. Very impressed. Thank you. We were created for NASA Johnson Space Center at the center's request to provide advanced study uh, and other learning opportunities for their administrators, staff, 
scientists, engineers, and astronauts. They saw that as a need, we met it. Our legacy as an institution that was created to solve problems is important for us to recognize, to own, and to see what portions of that we're going to bring forward. What we're ready for is the next era. The wonderful thing about the University of Houston Clear Lake is that it is 45 years young. It's absolutely an extraordinary place to study, an extraordinary place to develop uh, relationships, to become the next version, hopefully better, of oneself. My name is Mohammed Abdul Jalil. I am majoring in biology. I am the student body president here at the University of Houston Clear Lake. I personally built um, some personal connections with professors, um, got to know them more on a personal level and vice versa as well. Essentially without them, I would not be where I am today. Dr. Dabrowski was one of the main reasons I shifted from one way of studying to a different way of studying. Not the memorization aspect, but the wanting to understand and the curiosity. Dr. Hart, the Vice President of Student Affairs here at the University of Houston Clear Lake, as well as President Blake, they always say that they are working for us, right? They care about what we want and they want to see our growth and help us in any way that we can. As a UHCL alumni, um, sooner that, rather than later, um, I can't wait to see the more buildings that are going to be built on this campus, the increase in student population, the more student organizations that are going to be created, and the more opportunities that there will be offered to those students that are going to be coming here. Hopefully what makes UHCL unique and stays the same is, you know, the student to professor ratio, being able to still go to professor's office hours, not being a number, rather an actual individual, was, would be the amazing thing to continue to see throughout the growth of UHCL itself. There is a genuine love for this university, and I really do believe that it comes from the legacy of being focused on connecting students to the real world in meaningful ways. All those different parts create this greater outcome, which for us, I think, is a love for who we are and what we do and how we contribute out there in our region. A researcher from the University of Houston is developing the next generation of pacemakers that come from the human body. Associate Professor Bradley McConnell is taking stem cells found in fat, converting them to heart cells, and reprogramming them to act as biologic pacemaker cells. Biologic pacemakers are able to grow with the body and become much more responsive to what the body is doing. A team from the UH College of Education is working to help students with dyslexia. Using a $1.6 million grant from the Department of Education, the researchers will work with schools to help educators better identify students with dyslexia by providing professional development on dyslexia screening while creating a blueprint to help reading proficiency rates increase. And a new statue and wall honors the legacy of Roy Hoffines at the arena he helped build. 
UH unveiled a nine-foot statue of Hoffines outside Fertitta Center in the new Hoffines Plaza, and the Judge Roy Hoffines wall inside of the arena chronicles his achievements as a visionary entrepreneur. We wanted to talk about some of the great things that have happened this year. We started the year out with some wonderful news when we were received a $1.5 million donation, which was the largest in our history from the M.G. and Lily A. Johnson Foundation, uh, who have been faithful in their support over the years, Buddy Brock and Robert Halapaska, uh, right over here. Uh, let's have a round of applause for the Lily Foundation. Their gift is going to enable us to outfit some labs in our new science and technology uh, building, as well as in the new uh, Town Plaza Mall renovation, which we're undergoing. And they continue to su support so much of what we do, particularly in the sciences and the healthcare, and we'd certainly appreciate it. In addition to breaking ground on both the Town Plaza and the STEM building, we also broke ground and had a topping out ceremony for the Don and Mona Smith hall which will add about 300 beds to our uh, on-campus residence uh, capacity we also opened the university commons which many of you were uh, at our ribbon cutting for that 80,000 square foot center uh, where the new library is located uh, which also serves not only uhv but victoria college students uh, and the community uh, we're also growing in katy uh, and in the fall of 2019, we moved into a new academic building with the University of Houston. This 80,000 square foot facility, three-story building is located near the intersection of Interstate 10 and the Grand Parkway uh, with both UHV and UH degree programs being offered there. In addition, we were at work partnering with San Antonio Independent School District to identify up to 10 graduating seniors each fall and provide these SAISD scholars with extensive advising and financial support to come to UHV. Back in February, Crossroads Bank gave US, UHV the wonderful news that it was donating 300,000 to the university over 10 years to support the expansion of UHV athletics. This gift, the largest cash donation ever in support of UHV athletics, also designates Crossroads Bank as a UHV athletic sponsor for each of our sports throughout the academic year. And while I'm mentioning uh, UHV athletics, I would also note uh, that our men's soccer team just won the conference tournament and on their way to nationals. We also have the great news that the Rebuild Texas Fund by the Guitar Harvey Fund gave us a $100,000 donation to provide partnerships to our students still struggling with the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. Spring brought the good news that the Texas legislature had approved the assessment of a $125 a semester student fee to help finance the construction of a new UHV recreation center. 74% of our students living within 50 miles of the Victoria campus voted to assess themselves the fee after an initiative led by the UHV Student Government Association. I'd like to particularly thank our students who are here tonight because it's their being able to see forward that made the University Commons possible and now makes the UHV Recreation Center a definite uh, uh, feature of our future. So it's been a great year. <laughs> Much of our 
Our legacy could not have happened without the hard work of former administrators, faculty, and staff and community. Uh, during the last 46 years, they had a vision when they started UHV in 1973 as an off-campus center of the University of Houston, and look where we've come now. UHV couldn't have grown this much or come this far without everybody in this room. Because of this, we've selected expanding our legacy as this year's annual report theme. Tonight, we've asked students, faculty, and alumni and community members to talk about their successes in 2018-2019. We've also put together a couple of short videos to focus on these amazing individuals. Once again, our annual report is available completely online. You have a program book in front of you, which contains uh, in it the online address where you can go and review all of the videos that are here tonight uh, and all of the um, uh, uh, things that we talk about tonight will be on our website in just a few days. On the annual report website, you'll be able to view the videos you will see here uh, with the faculty, staff, and students and alumni highlights, UHV's enrollment and financial figures, photos from this past year, a list of our generous donors, and much more. We will also be adding videos filmed tonight and an event photo gallery that will feature all of you. An obvious example of the Expanding Our Legacy theme is UHV's academic programs and all of their great accomplishments over the past year. Hey everyone, I'm Chef Alex Brueger, Senior Executive Chef for University of Houston. Today we're gonna have some fun with some Thanksgiving leftovers. First one I'm gonna show you is a Kentucky Hot Brown. It's an old favorite of mine. I actually uh, learned this one from the wife. So we've got two pieces of bread. We're gonna go ahead and toast them up. I like to use brioche. We're gonna split one in half, go end to end. Then you've got some of that delicious turkey hopefully mom made for you and it's nice and juicy. If not, it's quite all right. We're gonna have a nice sauce for you to lay on top. Pile it as high as you want, like four or five slices so you can see on everything. Next thing we're gonna do, let's go ahead and take four slices of bacon right on over here. That looks great. Now, obviously add as much or as little as you want. Let's do a slice Roma tomato. Probably about four slices on this one. Then I've got a delicious bechamel sauce right on over here. And bechamel, it's real easy to find in Google. Just go ahead and pull it up. Any base recipe is going to work. It's just a vehicle to put our nice, cheesy goodness on this one. About four to six ounces on that. A little bit of parm cheese to finish. And in the oven we go. And here we've got our delicious bubbling right out of the oven hot brown. Hit it with a little parsley and enjoy. Hope you like today's recipe. Let me know. Now let's make a tasty dessert. Caramel pumpkin empanadas. Super simple and easy to make. First, I've got a delicious empanada shell which you can pick up anywhere. Walmart, your local grocery store. We're gonna go ahead and use a crimper that we bought as well. Don't have to, you can use a simple fork if you wanted to. Let's just go ahead and throw a couple of tablespoons of our empanada mix right on in there. We're gonna hit it with a little bit of our egg mix right on one end. Come on in, we've got our empanada crimper. We're just gonna go ahead and fold that over in half. Get yourself a nice empanada there. And then we're just gonna drop them in the fryer for about two minutes at 350 degrees. I've got some down here for you. Wow, these look great. Now all we gotta do is dress up a good looking plate, serve them up to your guests, dress them up any way you want. We've got that. Do some strawberries on the outside. Let's get some mint on there into our delicious ice cream. And finally, some caramel right on top. No rules, just right. Look at that. Simple, easy, delicious caramel pumpkin pie empanadas. Enjoy. Container security at ports is a big problem for the U.S. government. The Borders Trade and Immigration Institute at UH is partnering with Lantern Unmanned Autonomous Systems to create an innovative solution, testing drones that are able to scan shipping containers for radiation. Only about 5% of shipping containers are searched once they arrive at ports, and the autonomous drones could create an important additional tool for port security. 
President Couture joined city and county leaders to break ground on a $19 million construction project to transform Cullen Boulevard. The project will add larger sidewalks and bikeways while improving drainage to help reduce street flooding. The first phase is expected to be completed by March 2020. And visitors to Blaffer Art Museum can catch a rising photography star and hear a Latin American experimental musician at two new exhibitions. The first major museum showcase of photographer Paul and Poggy Sapuya is at Blaffer through March 14th. And visitors can take a seat and listen to Jacqueline Noba's Creación de la Tierra through January 4th. My nature of being an explorer, uh, when we lived out in New Mexico and Arizona, one of the things that we did as kids uh, on the weekend is that we would form a group of us and we would, we would go and, you know, explore the mountains. And so I was always looking what's on the other side, you know, I go to that hill and then there was another hill and I had to go down the valley and go to the, the top of the other hill and always was very curious. So looking up in the heavens, then and seeing those stars also made me curious about exploring those and who was exploring those astronauts uh, watching neil and buzz Aldrin go and you know, go and land on the moon and i said i want to follow in their footsteps and the biggest challenge that uh, i faced was uh, being a person of color in america in the 60s uh, because as i looked at that little black and white television of them landing on the moon I didn't see anybody uh, that looked like me. I had already done my research at NASA and I found out that there were medical doctors who worked in the space program. I, it was a, again a godsend for me because one of the other things that I discovered very, very early on is that I liked helping people. And so with those two seemingly separate goals, I was able to put them together and saying, you know what, I can become a medical doctor who then travels in space. In order for you to be able to take care of yourself, take care of your family, and take care of your community, you have to be a knowledgeable person. And that knowledgeable person requires uh, expertise, you know, education from somewhere. And the best way to get that is through college, through a formal education, like, you know, the University of Houston Clear Lake. And I chose that. If you think about, I went into medical school, then I went into astronaut school, and, and then later on I went to business school. Uh, all of that, I chose college, the formal education, in order to do that because it was so important. Being a UHV student athlete has been an experience in its own. It's taught me to be more competitive on the golf course than what I used to be in the past. And it's also led me to be a lot more competitive in the classroom. The school really wants you to succeed and they're really there to support you. JAG stands for Jobs After Graduation and it really sets us up to make sure we know what we're gonna do and we have the resources that we need to succeed after we graduate. My experience at the PGA Works Tournament in Port St. Lucie, Florida was a great one. It was actually my second year there. I shot some of my best golf I have there, which was a pretty amazing experience. Anytime the women's team is together, we always just have a really good time. UHV has been nothing but great. Being part of the UHV Jaguar soccer team is the best part of my life. There's no better sense of family, of knowing that your teammates have your back in all situations. And it's crazy because there's a lot of cultural differences, but one common goal brings us all together. It's definitely a better way to experience college. Being named one of the 2018 Dactronics NAIA Main Soccer Scholar Athlete was an honor. 
Just the fact that I was considered for such an award makes me really happy. Being captain of the UHP soccer team means a lot to me. Knowing that my teammates chose me for this position, I'm there for them as a friend, for anything they need. I try to push them to be better, put in the effort, keep them motivated through the hard times and the best times. It felt great to earn the NSEAA Team Academic Award for exemplary performance in the classroom as a team. It feels good because it shows how much effort the coaches put into us being a student before an athlete, and it also shows how much we focus on our school work as well as soccer during season. It was great being crowned homecoming king. It was something about all the students cheering me on and then me actually winning and their emotions with my emotions. It was like, ah. I've always had a big interest in the fashion industry, everything about it. Thankfully, the Department of Student Life allowed me to help them create what they envisioned Jax should look like for homecoming. We interpret it as a 90s jumpsuit. I really just want to be prepared to enter the workforce. Since I do have a knack for things in the fashion industry, I really hope to get a job along those lines. I was also involved with being the entertainment chair for the Jaguar Activities Board, which really gave me the opportunity to coordinate events for students throughout the year. I really like a lot about UHV, but it's one of those things that you really just have to experience for yourself. Something about that positive energy, the community, faculty, staff, students, it's truly one of a kind. I decided to join UHV Student Government Association because the president of last year's administration recruited me to join. He'd seen that I was actively involved with the university and wanted me on his team. I founded the Creative Writing Association. I wanted to create something where students felt comfortable with engaging with their peers and collaborating on a creative idea and just being able to talk creatively about anything, whether it's poetry, whether it's fiction, whether it's screenwriting. I definitely wanted to create that safe space where they felt comfortable enough to share their projects. It is so exciting to see the University Commons building finally open for future generations of students that come to UHV. They're going to see that hard work actually does pay off here. How y'all doing? Hello everyone, my name is Christopher Leroy McDonald and I'm currently serving as Student Government Association President at UHV. I came to, to Victoria to attend UHV as a freshman in the fall of 2014 and graduated with my bachelor's degree in psychology in 2017. I am a proud alumni of Jax Nation. I am currently a graduate student pursuing my master's degree in clinical mental health counseling with plans of joining the Air Force as a commissioned officer after I graduate. I consider it a privilege to be able to apply the skills and lessons that I have obtained at UHV to serve this country. SGA is continuously working on the enhancement of the overall student experience. One recent addition to the student experience we accomplished is a new UHV branded regalia that has been worn by graduates for the first time this fall, this fall at commencement. I have learned from my time at UHV that it is the minor things which are often overlooked that make a huge impact on the student's experience. I will never forget and appreciate the investment that this institution is making. Like most of you, I have witnessed and been a part of the institution's growth. UHV is a much better place now than it has been, than it was when I arrived in 2014. I find our growth inspirational and it has been, it was a driving force in my decision to run, run for SGA president. Like a lot of the students at UHV, I came from a much bigger city. It might surprise you that it took a while for me to adjust to UHV and Victoria. Looking back, I now see that everything that made me uncomfortable was my biggest opportunity for growth. Now, not many people know this, but I was a, I was a great goalie in high school. Actually, the opportunity to play for the soccer team was my biggest inspiration for coming here. So I tried out for the team, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it. Despite this, I've been able to obtain experiences here at UHV that I wouldn't have gotten at any other institution. These experiences, many of which put me in uncomfortable situations, have allowed me to grow. It may come as a surprise, but many times these positions made me feel incompetent. Over time, I realized, one, feelings can be deceptive, and two, Rome was not built in a day. Ultimately, I decided to stay involved on campus, take feedback from others, and apply it when necessary. 
those uncomfortable and unfamiliar situations allowed, allowed me to grow as a student leader on campus, but more impor importantly, as a person. Many students will look at me now and see the successes, but what they do not realize is I was once where many of them currently are. I have experienced my fair share of failures and successes. I have learned that as humans, we all experience failures. I have, to, I have had to remember to keep my head high through the storms and know that I will overcome any obstacles that make me feel less than what I am. Without a doubt, UHV has taught me to, keep, to try new things, get comfortable with failure, and when you're knocked down, get back up. I'll forever be grateful to UHV for teaching me these important life lessons. I am truly blessed to be afforded the opportunity to talk to you all tonight. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. I would love it if you could all attend the upcoming commencement ceremony to show support and see our students proudly wearing their amazing new regalia. And one more thing, I would like to give a shout out to our SGA advisor, Dr. Michael Wilkinson, for his dedication and support to SGA and the student body. Thank you. Go Jack. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, it is an honor to be here tonight to share some highlights from our last year. In 2018-2019, more than 75 students learned leadership skills at our fifth annual War Leadership Conference. Several students also earned certifications in the War Certified Leader Program, which encourages students to think critically about their leadership skills and how those skills could impact their future careers. Students gave back by participating in our fifth annual alternative spring break trip to Biloxi, Mississippi, and several local service projects during National Volunteer Week, including volunteering at the Dorothy O'Connor Pet Adoption Center, Rotama Mater South, and the Food Bank of the Golden Crescent. Career Services served more than 400 students with job searches and career coaching through individual sessions. The office also hosted 37 career-related programs Job, job fairs and workshops. JP's Market, a free food pantry and career closet open to UHV and Victoria College students had another successful year thanks to the continued support from the Food Bank of the Golden Crescent. We couldn't do it without them. The initiative served 433 students and provided 13,417 pounds of food in just one year. UHV hosted its fourth annual Family Weekend, where more than 400 students, their families, and university faculty and staff enjoyed two days of activities, including a magic show, boot fest in downtown Victoria, and the President's Picnic, featuring food, games, inflatables, music, and more. Residence Life started the year with a 98% occupancy in the University Residence Hall. This is the highest occupancy rate ever and a 1% increase from the previous year. UHV also held its fourth annual Homecoming Week, featuring a tailgate, kickoff concert, alumni banquet, talent show, and more. The 90s theme was keeping it fresh at UHV. That's my personal favorite. <laughs> Um, participation in intramural sports grew with the continuation of the cross-campus challenge battle for the cup. More than 200 students from UHV and VC competed in flag football, volleyball, soccer, and basketball. Unfortunately, VC won the traveling trophy, but we're working really hard to get it back this year. More than 130 students and individuals registered to vote during our voter registration initiatives on campus. Student Life provided more than 170 activities for students, including more than 20 multicultural events. This included a poetry slam and open mic night featuring poet Ashley Hayes and UHV students. The event was held during Women's History Month. The Counseling Center saw an increase in student appointments from the prior academic year and hosted more than 50 programs related to substance abuse and mental, physical, and sexual health. 10 student organizations were chartered during our annual student organization and leadership Please. banquet. Would somebody tell Chairman Jack Moore that he needs to be seated, please? <laughs> or I'm going to take over his committee. <laughs> Yes, 
student success next. We just need to Good morning. Just type that. Excuse me. Yeah. Good afternoon and welcome to our meeting. As chairman of this committee, I would allow not, now like to call to order the Academic and Student Success Committee of the University of Houston System Board of Regents. As a quick reminder, please speak into the microphone when presenting or making remarks as your comments can be then uh, recorded correctly. We have six action items. No, six items will be presented before the committee, two action items and committee's consideration. Following the presentation of various items, I will ask the committee if there are any questions and call for a vote. Once all action items have been presented and approved, if appropriate, I will make a motion to place these items on the board's consent docket agenda for final approval of the Board of Regents meeting scheduled for later today, February 27, 2020. The first item on your agenda today for the committee's consideration is item B, the approval of the minutes for the November 14, 2019 Academic and Student Success Committee meeting. Does anyone have any corrections to these minutes? Do I hear a motion to approve? Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The minutes of the November 14, 2019 committee meeting are hereby approved. The next action item on your agenda today is item C, review and approval of the University of Houston system man, uh, mission statements. University of Houston System. Dr. Pa Paula Myrick Short, Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Provost, would you please introduce this item? Thank you, Regent Madison. In order to be compliant with SACS, which is our uh, institutional accrediting agency, our Board of Regents uh, is required to review and approve the mission statements for all four of our uh, UH system campuses. This really is a housekeeping <laughs> item this time, uh, and it's done even if the board has recently approved the campus's mission statement. All four of the mission statements are listed in your materials and the board book. I would like to point out that the University of Houston Clear Lake recently changed their mission statement, and in May of 2019, you did approve their new mission statement. So today, uh, as a SACS requirement, we're asking you to approve all four mission statements. Uh, this is an action item, and I recommend approval. Thank you, Dr. Short. Does anyone have any further questions? If not, may I hear a motion to approve this item as presented? Is there a second? All in favor? Opposed? This item is hereby approved. The next item listed on your agenda is item D, approval of a Master of Professional Accountancy, University of Houston Downtown. Dr. Short, will you please present this item? Thank you, Regent Madison. Uh, the University of Houston Downtown is proposing a 30 semester hour uh, Master of Professional Accountancy uh, degree. Um, as you know, the Texas State Board of Public Accountancy requires uh, 150 credit hours, including 30 hours of upper level accounting classes to sit for the CPA or the Certified Public Accountant exam. UHD currently has a 120 hour undergraduate accountancy program, but it does not qualify students to sit for the CPA exam. And this new program would address that requirement. Demands for CPAs are strong. Uh, the Data indicate that this will be a very popular program, will not be a low producing program for UHD, uh, and they would like to uh, get your approval for their new Master of Professional Accountancy degree. Uh, there are degrees like this in other institutions in Texas. Um, a professional of uh, Master of Professional Accountancy in five institutions, they are all located outside of a 50 mile radius of UHD. There are uh, similar programs in our system. Uh, the one that would be uh, probably the closest competitor for UHD would be the University of Houston. Uh, but the University of Houston downtown serves a strong population of Hispanic students. 
uh, and they, this program would, would be very popular with them. So we are uh, recommending your approval of this program. Does anyone have any further questions? If not, may I hear a motion to approve this item as presented? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? This item is hereby approved. Thank you. This concludes the presentations and approval of our two action items today. May I have a motion to place these two items unanimously approved by the committee on the Board of Regents consent docket agenda? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? These items have been unanimously approved by the committee and will be presented on the Board of Regents consent docket agenda for final approval at our board meeting held later today, February 27, as follows. Review and approval of University of Houston Systems mission statements, University of Houston System, and approval of a Master of Professional Accountancy, University of Houston Downtown. Item E is next listed on your agenda. Introduction of Vice President of Enrollment Management, University of Houston Downtown. Dr. Short. I'd like to introduce President Juan Munoz, who will introduce the new VP for UH Downtown. Thank you, Provost Short. Regent Madison, I'd like to introduce uh, Jimmy Young, who was named Vice President for Enrollment Management, Dr. Young. Uh, served as Vice President for Student Affairs and Enrollment Management at uh, New York City University. Prior to roles also as Vice President for Enrollment Management at the University of Maine, Assistant Vice President for Enrollment Management at the College of Brockport, and uh, uh, Student Affairs and Enrollment Management at Baruch College. Dr. Young, also let me invite you up to the microphone to just introduce yourself very quickly. And, uh, uh, Jimmy's been with us uh, for a number of months now, doing an extraordinary job. Typically, our provost, Dr. Link, would be here introducing him, but we have an issue on our campus as well that I sent him over to take care of, having to do with water. And I'll ask Jimmy to introduce himself, but just a moment of, of privilege. Dr. Musali, Michelle Musali, just stand up. This is a new uh, vice provost that we've hired 20 years at UH Downtown, but she's assumed a new role of leadership in the provost office. You're off script, but I wanted to recognize you. Uh, it's a privilege to be here at the University of Houston uh, system and uh, working at UHD um, and it's an uh, honor to meet you all and so that ends my introduction. Thank you. Well done Dr. Young. Brevity. Uh, during his time we've consistently realized enrollment increases. We were up in SCH and enrollment for the spring for last fall and we look forward to great things working with Dr. Young. Thank you Dr. Short. Thank you. This item will be, uh, was presented for information only and no further committee action is required. The next action to be presented to the committee will be item F, research collaboration between the University of Houston and Baylor College of Medicine, University of Houston. Dr. Amir El Nashi, Vice Chancellor of Research and Technology Transfer, will you please present this item? Did I get your right ear name right? Is it El Nashi or? I've been watching for 40 years, so what's different? <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, I apologize for being the 4,1231st one. I thought that we are not doing the information like. That's fine, go ahead. I have a problem. Okay, well, um, it seems that uh, all my presentations are associated with disasters. The first time I, the first time you remember that uh, one, the first time I presented to you was uh, in August 2017 in the wake of the hurricane, when uh, the chancellor kindly introduced me as the new VPR. I thought this would be a disaster-free day, but as you can see, so very quickly I, uh, we have had a very uh, interesting and nice uh, activity that we have uh, worked on for about a year or so, and uh, we wanted to share that with you. It's. Uh, um, a program jointly between the University of Houston and uh, Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, the slide will show how it has progressed since uh, the start of uh, discussions between our Chancellor and the President of uh, Baylor College of Medicine. As uh, many or most of the good things that happen in this university or maybe all the things that happen in this university in a positive way it started with a conversation with 
the president, uh, President Katur, who informed us that she has been talking with uh, President Klotman and they signed a really broad um, uh, collaboration agreement that included uh, mutual access to equipment and labs um, and a plan to see whether we can form joint research uh, teams that would really break um, barriers and, and, and um, result in um, uh, additional discoveries in, in the field of medicine in general. We started working with them uh, after the signature of the agreement in January 2019. We had a workshop where 25 faculty from each institute came together. We had a whole day together, the 50 of us, and we came up with a plan to have a teaming, uh, funding for teaming agreements that we put together teams, we fund them competitively, and uh, we see whether this would result in externally funded research and uh, permanent teaming between uh, the two institutions and, and these research subjects. We selected also the research subjects uh, during the workshop. We then uh, called for proposals in September 2019, and we announced that we will uh, fund six uh, proposals. The budget uh, from us is uh, 300,000 and from them is 300,000, and we, we, we started uh, reviewing. We were really sort of taken aback by the number of uh, um, letters of intent that were sent we were expecting 12, 15, we got 108. Um, the conditions of, the, of these letters of intent, that ha they have to be unique. E nobody can apply twice, and it has to be one person from uh, Baylor at least, and one person from UH at least. So seeing that there is at least 108 from each institution who want to work together was a very nice surprise, but also it was sort of challenging because we end up with very little in terms of uh, uh, success rate, if you like. We received full proposals. There were 97, uh, including 194 professors from both institutions. And we increased the number of awards from six to nine via increasing the budget uh, that was divided between the two institutions. Uh, this February 2020, and the work has started, and our teams have been working together. Just wanted to give you an idea of the spread of subjects. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, there is a word cloud that shows the topics that come up in the proposals that were approved. Uh, the winning proposal had to have impact and innovation aspects, plan for external grants, quality of research and collaboration, and long-term sustainability of the research contribution. The teams covered 15 of the UH colleges, which is almost like the entire university is contributing to this effort. And the research is focused on these uh, very good uh, topics. We're looking forward to seeing the outcomes. Uh, the conditions that we give the money under are pretty stringent. They have to submit a proposal within the life of the project, uh, external proposal to an, uh, another agency, and then we have to submit a proposal at the end of it as well. And that's it from me. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your presentation today. This item was presented for information only, and no further committee action is required. Next on our agenda is item G, an introduction of the College of Medical Medicine fa uh, faculty, University of Houston. Dr. Stephen Spann, the founding dean of the College of Medicine, will you please uh, come forward and present this item? Uh, as he's uh, coming up to the podium, I'm pleased that the University of Houston's College of Medicine has received preliminary accreditation status from the Liaison Committee on Medical Education. And I'd like to congratulate Dr. Spann for his leadership uh, in making that happen. And we're excited to have faculty here today, and he will introduce them to you. Well, it's a real joy to be with you and to uh, introduce some of my faculty colleagues. We have onboarded a total of 26 full-time faculty. We have another 11 faculty members that we're recruiting. We hope they will be here by the time we open our first class, uh, July 20th. We have over 100 voluntary clinical faculty in the community, community physicians that will be teaching our uh, medical students, and we're very excited about that. They will contribute immensely to the training of our students. Just a, a, a late-breaking update. As of uh, right now, we have 1,840 applications for 30 first year position. So that is amazing. That's over 60 applicants a slot. So our work is cut out for us as we seek to choose the very best 
and brightest of those applicants. Uh, we're going to be working really hard because we have to sort through those applications and interview probably around 180 applicants uh, and have our selections by no later than uh, May 15th. So it is a privilege for me to introduce uh, members of our faculty. Uh, Dr. David Buck is Associate Dean for Community Health. Uh, he is a family physician. Dr. Ruth Bush is our Associate Dean for Medical Education. Dr. Bush is a vascular surgeon. Dr. Bill Elder is Chair of our Department of Behavioral and Social Sciences. Dr. Elder is a clinical psychologist. <coughs> Dr. Winston Liao is our Chair of Health System and Population Health Sciences. He is a family physician. Dr. Oliveira Nesic Taylor is our Chair of Biomedical Sciences, and she is a neuroscientist. Dr. Catherine Horn is our Associate Dean for Student Affairs, Admissions, and Outreach, and she is a family physician. Dr. Brian Reed is our Chair of Clinical Sciences, and he is a family physician. Dr. LaChauncey Woodard is our founding director of the Humana Integrated Health System Sciences Institute, and she is a general internist. Dr. Kenya Steele, director of our physician patients and populations course, also clinical associate professor. She is a family physician. Dr. Raj Kumar, who is clinical professor in biomedical sciences is a biochemistry uh, expert. Dr. Michelle Carol Turpin, clinical assistant professor in biomedical sciences, is a pharmacologist. Dr. Kevin Rowland, who is clinical professor in biomedical sciences, is a physiologist. Dr. Stephen Starks, he is a clinical assistant professor in our departments of behavioral and social sciences and clinical sciences. He is a psychiatrist. Dr. Joel Bloomberg, clinical associate professor in clinical sciences, is a pediatrician. Dr. Jessica Hartos, who is assistant dean for assessment uh, and quality improvement, uh, is a psychologist. Dr. Camille Luger, is clinical associate professor uh, in clinical sciences, is a family physician, Dr. Gregorio Gomez, associate professor, clinical associate professor in biomedical sciences, is an immunologist, Dr. Shane Hassler, clinical associate professor in cell biology and genetics and biomedical sciences. Did I leave anyone else out? Everybody's accounted for? Uh, I'm proud of this team. Uh, they are doing a great job, and I believe that they will be ready July 20th to welcome our inaugural class. Thank you very much. Give here, let's applause. <laughs> welcome to all of you. This is truly an exciting time for the university and for our community, administrators, faculty, staff, and students. You couldn't possibly get a more heartier uh, welcome from us. This item was presented for information only and no further committee action is required. Once again, uh, congratulations to all of you. We're so very excited uh, for this to be happening at the University of Houston. So thank, thank you. you very much. Very good, thank you. Sure. I'm totally thrilled, uh, Dr. Span. Thank you for your leadership. I'm not heard of having 1.2 professors per student anywhere before. <laughs> if you have, please tell me. I'm a student of math. 30 times 1 point is 36. You're going to have 37. Thank you very much. <laughs> As we said, we have big ambitions for you. Thank you. Any other comments? OK. This item was presented for information only, and no further committee action is required. Our last item to be presented today, item H, a presentation on academic points of pride. Dr. Short, will you present this item? Yes, um, and I'd also like to add my congratulations to our new faculty. It's been a joy to work with uh, Dean Spann and others as these new faculty have arrived on campus. It's been fabulous. Um, I am very pleased to um, 
present uh, uh, through our Honors College a very brief presentation about something we're very, very excited about. As you know, we have the Fulbright program here uh, at the University of Houston. Uh, it is a United States cultural exchange program within the Department of State. Uh, the goals are improving intercultural relations, cultural diplomacy, and intercultural competence between people in the United States and people around the world. Through exchange of people, knowledge, and skills, it was founded in 1946 by the U.S. Senator J. William Fulbright. It's considered one of the most prestigious and widely recognized scholarships in the world, so all the more reason why we are so proud of where the University of Houston is today in the number of Fulbright scholars uh, that have, have, are being honored here. Um, the program is important to the University of Houston's mission of global engage, engagement. And I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Bill Monroe, Dean of the Honors College, who will introduce Dr. Ben Rader and tell you more about our Fulbright recognition. Dean Monroe. Thank you, Provost Short. Nope. <coughs> Chancellor Couture, Academic and Student Success Committee Chair Madison, Chairman Fertitta, members of the Board of Regents. It gives me great pleasure to bring news of the success of the University of Houston's Fulbright United States Student Program. As Provost Short said, this international program was founded by Senator J. William Fulbright in the wake of World War II. As the Senator said of his namesake initiative, the Fulbright program aims to bring a little more knowledge, a little more reason, and a little more compassion into the world and thereby increase the chance that nations and communities will learn at last to live in peace and friendship. This month, the University of Houston was recognized by the State Department for the first time ever as a top producer of student <coughs> Fulbright Awards. Twelve of our students were awarded grants in 2019, and as you can see from the video, they are currently serving as UH ambassadors and representatives of our country in Russia, Latvia, Bosnia, Turkey, Taiwan, South Korea, India, and a half dozen other countries. The success of these students places the University of Houston among an elite group of renowned institutions. UH, <clears throat> UH is one of only two universities in the entire South Central Re Region to be named a top producer. By comparison, Rice students won four Fulbright Awards, and Texas A&M and Texas Tech received two each. LSU and Arkansas got one each. Five years ago, nope. Can we wrote to, to the, there we go, thanks. Five years ago, Provost Short moved the Student Fulbright program into the Honors College. And two and a half years ago, she approved the hiring of a Director of National Fellowships and Major Awards. Dr. Ben Rader is a large part of our Fulbright story of success. Ben was a Fulbrighter himself to Germany and earned his PhD from the University of Bamberg in Comparative Politics. I'm gonna ask Ben, who was personally featured in yesterday's article on top producing Fulbright programs in the Chronicle of Higher Education to explain the details of our program, where he sees us going in the future, and to share the stories of two Fulbright scholarship recipients who we can all be proud of. Ben. Thank you for that introduction, Bill. 
Uh, I will provide, as said, a, a brief overview of the emergence of a Fulbright culture in recent years, present where UH ranks among peer institutions, and then highlight a couple of students who demonstrate why the University of Houston has been so successful. In the last three years, the number of Fulbright applicants supported by the Office of Undergraduate Research and Major Awards has tripled. We attribute that development to enhanced outreach across the university, intensive advising practices from which students benefit from reflection regardless of their final application status, word of mouth, and simply more wins. As students observe their peers competing in for and receiving Fulbrights, we've observed a clear shift in the Fulbright culture at UH. In the end, most people only see the final tally of recipients, but this represents only one indicator of our students' competitiveness. We have also seen a significant increase in the total number of semifinalists considered for selection. That number has also tripled over the last three years. You will notice that we do not have any data for 2019. Uh, notifications for individual countries occur on a rolling basis throughout the spring, and as of this reading, only three countries have actually reported. However, Fernando Flor, a graduate student from the physics department, applied for one of those countries, France, and he was named a recipient last week. Nationally, UH has joined 45 other research institutions as top producers. You can see from the list in the Chronicle of Higher Education that we are competing with large public institutions such as Southern California, Florida State. I'm not going to mention that other one there by name, um, as well as private universities including MIT and American. <laughs> Another point of pride that I want to highlight is our yield. In the Office of Undergraduate Research and Major Awards, our goals are to increase the number of applicants, but also ensure that our candidates receive quality advising. This table shows a brief extract of the rankings for research institutions, but even among the entire set of 45 research schools, we rank in the top five for yield rates of applicants to recipients in our Carnegie classification. One of the major factors contributing to Fulbright success at UH is our dynamic student body. Fulbright seeks candidates from all walks of life to represent the diversity of the United States. The daughter of human traffic parents who were brought to the United States, Danielle Nyangar always had an interest in issues pertaining to immigration. She came to UH from Pearland to study political science and sociology. During college, she worked at Human Rights First, Refugee Services of Texas, and immigration law firms. Last year, Danielle turned down a position with the UN to accept a study research grant to analyze the societal integration of immigrants in Italy at the Italian National Institute of Statistics in Rome, where she's currently pursuing her research. Johnny Zapata was born in South Texas and grew up without speaking a word of English until the time that he was 12. Upon receiving admission to UH, he declared a political science major and then later another major in history and a minor in Spanish. In 2016, Johnny was the first student to participate in the exchange between UH and the ADA University in Baku, Azerbaijan, where he studied for a year and served as an English Conversation Club leader while on a Gilman scholarship. Dur despite his late introduction to English, Johnny was awarded a Fulbright to teach English to college students in Turkey, and this past year became the first UH student to be awarded the prestigious Thomas R. Pickering Graduate Fellowship, which pays for two years of graduate school before Johnny will enter the Foreign Service. Students at UH have always been the perfect fit for the Fulbright U.S. student program. We are only beginning to hit our stride. The Office of Undergraduate Research and Major Awards looks forward to working with more students from across UH in carrying out the university's mission to develop globally engaged citizens while achieving national recognition for the University of Houston. Should I give any time at all for questions? No? Do we have any questions? <clears throat> I do have one more slide. Um, if I can make this thing work right. Otherwise. All right. Here, here. <laughs> that's the end of that. It's the end of the formal part of the presentation, but uh, not only does UH beat its American Conference competitors on the hardwood, it does so with Fulbrights as well. So we would like to present Chancellor Couture and Chairman Fertitta with commemorative basketballs to celebrate the University of Houston's designation as a top producer of United States Fulbright students. Here, here.
We got to yeah. get him one. We got to find a way to get him somehow. So. <laughs> Good job. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That, that's exciting. It really is. I'm going to put it with, I've got a few other basketballs I'll put. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. That's very exciting news. Great graphics. Thank great you. Gifts. Good job. Um, Dr. Short, does that conclude your comments for today? We thank you for your presentations. This item was presented for information only and no uh, committee action is required. Uh, section two, executive session, is on the next item listed on the agenda. It should be noted that an executive session will not be held today. Does anyone have any other questions or comments for this committee? If not, there being no further business to come for this committee, the meeting is hereby adjourned. And we got the whole agenda in. Thank you, Chairman, Chairwoman, Madam Chairwoman. All right. Good afternoon. As chair of the Facilities, Construction, and Master Planning Committee of the University of Houston System Board of Regents, I'd like to call this committee meeting to order. As a reminder, please speak into your microphones so your presentations and remarks are recorded correctly. The first item requiring committee approval today are the minutes from the November 14th, 2019 Facility Construction and Master Planning Committee meeting. Does anyone have any corrections to these minutes? Do I hear a motion to approve these minutes as distributed? Is there a second? Any, any, anybody opposed? These minutes are hereby approved. We just have one item that will be presented before the committee today. It will be presented for information only. Do we want to call an audible, Mr. Chairman, and just move quickly through yes. this? So uh, I think what I can say quickly, and I think Raymond has throat lozenges just from earlier, and sorry, David, but no uh, basically just an update. The U of H Hilton expansion uh, will break ground summer of 2020 on track. The uh, law building break ground summer of 2020 on track. College of Medicine in Great Brown, summer of 2020 on track. Student Wellness Center, uh, break ground January 2021. The Auxiliary Dining Center, break ground summer of 2020. Quadrant replacement is moving along and will be ready for students next fall. Thank you, Mr. Oliver, for that report. Awesome job. <laughs> next on our agenda is section two, the executive section. It should be noted for the record that an executive session will not be held today. Does anyone have any further comments? Thank you for the fastest committee meeting in history. <laughs> you will get an award for that one day. <laughs> All right. So we move on to the audit. And compliance committee, Mr. Chairman. What's that? <laughs> Mr. Hurd? Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the meeting. As chair of this committee, I would like to call to order the Audit and Compliance Committee meeting of the University of Houston System Board of Regents. As a quick reminder, please speak into your microphone so your presentations and remarks may be recorded correctly. We have two action items for the committee's approval today and seven items pre presented uh, in short order for information only. I would now like to move to the first item of the committee's approval, item B, approval of the Audit and Compliance Committee minutes from the November 14th, 2019 meeting. Does anyone have any questions, corrections, comments to these minutes? Do I hear a motion to approve these minutes as distributed? Is there a second? Okay, all in favor? Minutes are for the November 14th, 2019 Audit Compliance Committee are hereby approved. Our next item uh, on the agenda today is item C, ratification approval is requested for the appointment of the Chief Audit and Compliance Executive for the University of Houston Systems, U of H Systems. Um, let me just briefly um, see this gentleman sitting at the end of the, end of the table, uh, Mr. Philip Hurd, 20 years with Georgia Tech, uh, last 12 years spent as their Chief Audit Executive. Uh, prior to that, uh, Philip was uh, in the U.S. Army and served in their uh, chief intelligence uh, uh, group and organization. So he's an Army veteran. Um, 
But Philip, we are thrilled to have you. And I want to uh, give a special shout out to uh, Regent McKelvey and Madison for being part of this uh, search team that, uh, that landed him here. And uh, we are thrilled to have you. We're looking forward to uh, a, a great career uh, at the University of Houston. Um, now, with all that introduction, uh, do I have a motion to approve this item as presented? Do I have a second? All those in favor? Aye. You are hereby approved. So this concludes the presentation of this action item for the committee's consideration and approval today. I hear a motion to place this item on the Board of Regents consent docket agenda. Second? second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, this item, item is unanimously approved for the committee and will be placed on the board's consent docket agenda for the final board approval at the Board of Regents meeting held later today. All the remaining items listed in your agenda today will be presented for information only. Uh, the information first, inf uh, and I, I would just uh, ask uh, Philip if you would please, uh, and I know you've got an abbreviated uh, <laughs> version of this, uh, but if you could touch on a couple of items that, uh, that you feel are significant uh, that were the information only category. You just want me to run through it rather than by the agenda because there's, there's two things specifically I wanted to address. Well then uh, please address those specifically because we have a lot of others that have been, uh, been read. So please do. Senator, could you bring up the first chart? All right, I want to draw your attention to the hotline activity. Um, it is robust, and in my short tenure here, I've spent a great deal of time learning this system. One of the things that uh, has become clear to me, um, and after consultation with legal counsel, I understand that there is a change in the law, particularly in reporting of sexual harassment and. Uh, other things revolving around that particular um, genre of report. So we are seeing a trending upward of complaints because it is now mandatory or uh, mandatory to report any knowledge of those type of events or termination. And so we have received a number of reports where people will literally put in there, I reported this because I know I have to. And they're, they're really things that you're kind of looking at going, hmm, I'm not really sure that's even actionable. But uh, I did want to point that out. So it, just mainly to calm your nerves, there's no great uh, change in uh, terms of, of the actual type of activity. But there certainly will be more reporting. And as such, we are likely to require some more resources uh, in the long term, if it keeps up, to investigate those, because we do take them seriously. Are there any questions on that? Any questions, of Phil, on the uh, on the new procedures around reporting sexual harassment? Okay. All right. What else, Sandra? If you would skip to the last slide. Um, out of all of the reports that we looked at. Um, for this session, there were no major issues that weren't addressed. The only thing that came to my attention that I thought would be worthy of, of the board knowing, um, particularly given the effort to put into athletics, is the tickets. Uh, each year, the NCAA requires that we do a uh, audit of the paid ticket sales. In 2019, they were at 20,345 as the average attendance per game. Um, I went back uh, to the year starting after your stadium was built, and you can see that uh, under Coach Herman, uh, you went up significantly and you averaged at your high in 2016, 34,011 paid attendance per game. You have been trending downward um, quite a bit. Now it has leveled off between 2018 and 2019 to only a 6% drop. However, if you drop the same amount in the next two seasons as you did in the previous two seasons, you will be hitting the 15,000 mark, which is where you begin to have trouble with NCAA compliance issues. 
Um, this is a trending issue, and I just simply wanted to put it out there. Now, I did talk to um, your athletic director, and he assures me that he sees this as the bottom, and it will go up because we're going to win next year. <laughs> I hope that he Good. is right, but I felt it was my responsibility to at least point out the trend. Do you have any eligibility left as a player? You know, I, I do not, and I'm, I'm not 100% sure you would want me on your football team. Right. Just, you know, I want to be clear, I mean, what is the compliance issue if you drop to 15,000? If you drop below 15,000... Kick us the, out of the NCAA? Uh, <laughs> we should be so lucky. Division two. It, you will your division in which you compete may be changed. Now, I have not seen it. It's not an automatic. It, it, they, they give yeah. you time to, yeah. and the, you know, an opportunity to correct it. But ultimately, be... if you couldn't correct it over an extended period of time, speak of the devil, there he is. Um, He's got a just, plan. Yeah. <laughs> we, we no longer are Division I football. Yeah. <laughs> right. so, I mean, has anyone been dropped? You know, I don't, in Chris, last, has anybody ever lost years. eligibility from Division yeah. One to Division yeah. Two? Yeah. 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 I think we spent enough time on this. Yeah, I think, I think we have. It's a trend that, uh, that Philip identified and uh, one we're all aware of, and you addressed it with athletic directors, so I think we're in a good place. I mean, Gerald, you need to do a better job of hiring a football coach next time. <laughs> 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 okay, let's get control of this again. Okay, um, with that, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to have a quick executive session with, uh, with our new uh, head of uh, compliance. Yes. Could, could we just introduce Tony Benoit? Oh, yes. Is our interim stand up, Tony. Tony is our interim uh, Title IX coordinator for the system and and she has been in charge of kind of getting us up to speed on the implementation of Senate Bill 212. She took the lead on um, getting our mandatory training for our employees, and she is uh, ready to, to answer any questions if you had any. But I will tell you that um, the board will uh, be more involved in Title IX because of the changes in the law, and she will be making a report to you in August and every August, as long as she's here, uh, about our Title IX <laughs> numbers and compliance. So I just wanted to introduce her to you and let you know that that will be coming. Thank you, Tony. She's done a lot of compliance training too, I understand. Yes, she has. Yes. Okay, uh, with that, uh, the committee will uh, go into executive sessions pursuant to sections of the Texas Government Code listed on page two of your agenda. And we have more interest groups uh, forming as we speak. And disability services continue to see a rise in students receiving academic accommodations and support services. More than 150 students registered with the office, ensuring they received equal access to participate in and benefit from UHV academic programs and activities. Now on to UHV Athletics, where our student athletes continue to drive the university legacy both on and off the field. UHV began the year by being named an NAIA Champions of Character five-star institution. The university's student athletes were recognized for their excellence in the classroom with 62 of them, nearly 50% named Red River Athletic Conference Scholar Athletes. The softball team won its second conference regular season title in three years and made its seventh appearance at the NAIA championship tournament. The team also collected its 11th season of 30 plus wins. The softball team swept a doubleheader from the NCAA Division III Texas Lutheran University. TLU would later go on to win the national championship. The team knocked off the top ranked of Science and Arts of Oklahoma and the semifinals of the Dodge City Bracket of the NAIA opening round, 
but came up short of a trip to the NAIA World Series after losing twice in the finals. The men's golf team won its four straight PGA Works Golf Championship, the fifth in six years for the Jaguars, and its second straight South Padre Island Invitational title. The team also earned a number 21 ranking in the Bushnell Golf Week NAIA Coaches Poll. It was announced that the men and women's golf teams would rejoin the Association of Independent Institution Conference beginning with the 2019-2020 season. In soccer, the men's team advanced to the RRAC semifinals. The men fell short to Louisiana State University of Alexandria 3-2 in the conference semifinals. And the women's soccer team battled to the conference quarterfinals and played LLSU of Alexandria. The game ended in a 0-0 draw, forcing a penalty kick shootout that the Jaguars eventually lost 5-4. A historic gift expected to have a total impact of $15 million will help ensure the Sivia and Melvin Wolf Center for Entrepreneurship remains in the nation's top tier of entrepreneurship programs. The gift from the Sivia and Melvin Wolf Foundation will be used to create three endowments for the Wolf Center, which was recently ranked as the number one undergraduate entrepreneurship program in the country by the Princeton Review. Jeff Reimer has been awarded the state's top honor in engineering for his pioneering discoveries about how crystals form and how they can be dissolved. The Academy of Medicine, Engineering, and Science of Texas chose Reimer for his work in understanding the process of crystallization to improve drug treatments for malaria and kidney stones. And congratulations to all the UH Fall 2019 graduates. Nearly 5,000 students received degrees during Fall 2019 commencement. The youngest graduate, just 18 years old, and the oldest, is a 72-year-old former CEO graduating with his second PhD. A free on-campus food pantry is now open at the University of Houston in partnership with the Houston Food Bank's Food for Change Market Network. Cougar Cupboard is available to any student enrolled at UH to combat food insecurity. Students can receive up to 30 pounds of fresh food each week. UH is expanding higher education offerings across the Houston region by offering three new undergraduate engineering degrees in Katy and upper division business classes in Sugarland. Starting this fall, UH at Katy will offer undergraduate degrees in computer engineering and analytics, construction engineering, and systems engineering. And UH at Sugarland will begin offering classes from the Bauer College of Business for the first time. And a new Bauer program is helping fill a void in Houston's technology industry. The Sales Academy is an eight-week certificate program for early and mid-career professionals that trains a sales force to promote tech companies and their products. Tuition is due only if a student secures a job offer for at least $50,000 at the program's conclusion. As we celebrate 50 years of public art and how this collection has blossomed into one of the most significant university collections in the country, we're reminded of how this group of people came together early on around this notion of bringing public art to campus. Aaron Farfell was visionary and he was a humanitarian and art to him was an indicator of the future and he wanted to bring that indicator to the next generation. The public art program had been established in the late 60s when the Board of Regents voted to dedicate 1% of all future building construction project costs to public art. UH was really the first state institution to dedicate some of its, its construction costs to, to this. I'm pretty sure that they saw that having world-class art in a visible way was just going to help the reputation of the school. My father thought the public art collection was important because it brought art to the community, to the students as well as to any visitors on campus. And he felt really strongly that art changes who you are as a human being. Arts are important to us. Uh, they touch our soul, they challenge our mind, and we have here on our campuses 50 years worth of public art collection. Why keep it to ourselves? Why not share it with everybody else? Invite the public in. So I'm very proud of this initiative. The public art collection is, it, it, it means a lot for this city. It's uh, 
first of all, showing the dedication of the city's public university, but more than that, it's an invitation for people to come onto campus and engage with everything that happens here. I knew about this collection from, you know, the early 80s, the mid 80s. I mean, it was it was something that many sculptors were talking about because you guys were the leaders. It's a real honor um, to be invited to be, you know, a very permanent part of, of that legacy. I think being invited by a university with such a long-standing history as, you know, uh, a learning institution, but also a place where uh, artistic ideas are valued, uh, that to me is microcosmically speaks to what Houston is to me uh, and has revealed itself to be to me, which is a place that is accepting of all ideas and all people. We have a history here and we went to school here. And uh, the reason that uh, I'm here in Houston at all is, is to have gone to University of Houston. We, we're dedicated to the school and then to be asked to come back and, and to do a work, a major work, um, was a great honor, frankly. I think public art is, um, is a great thing to have because you're not expecting to see it. When you see a piece of artwork, it could compel you to take a moment and reflect on what it may be and what it is. And hopefully that will lead you to other things. And that's what education is about. This project helped me further something I've been interested in, you know, for 20 years when my art career, you know, started, which is the democracy of imagery and symbology and the fact that a lot of people don't get to go to museums or if they don't feel as if that is an institution that's open to them. Thankfully, you know, a university like, you know, U of H downtown is has a program that allows people to come through and they, they get to experience it not roped off, but they can go up to it and be in it, in the round, and understand that art can be part of their lives as well. Everyone can enjoy it. It's, it's free, it's wonderful, it's spectacular. As our collection has evolved from steel, and bronze to glass and paper artworks. We look forward to seeing how the collection evolves even further. I mean, I wouldn't have dreamed, you know, 50 years later what it had become. My father would be thrilled. One of the last notes that he wrote to himself was that the public arts collection program was one of the happiest things he had done while he was chair for so many years. As we look towards the next 50 years, we are truly establishing ourselves as a platform where cutting edge art, diverse communities, and um, the expansion of knowledge around public art can converge in a very meaningful way. The future is just, you know, our oyster. I mean, we just, we, th there will be a lot of building always, and um, I think we'll continue to engage really important artists here. I came to UHB in 2011 to get my bachelor's in criminal justice and I really enjoyed the program and the opportunity that the small class size and the student to professor ratio awarded me by being able to sit down with my professors and really understand all of the things that they were teaching me. After I got my bachelor's in criminal justice from UHB I decided I wanted to take it a step further and get my master's in criminal justice and homeland and international security which I got in 2015 from UHB just because I liked the program so much and wanted to continue my education there. UHV helped me to prepare for my work in the Office of Emergency Management here in Victoria by helping to establish those networking relationships to be able to work with individuals not only at UHV but in other organizations and agencies from the local to state to government or federal level. The Alcoa Foundation has been so generous with us. 
And last year, they raised the money to $30,000. And with that, we could do more summer camps and improve the programs that we have. UHV's Math and Robotics Awareness Day is probably one of my favorite days in the year. One of the ideas is to show students that uh, math and robotics, but specifically math, can be really, really fun. They come here, they see application of mathematics to magic tricks, and they see application of mathematics in, in real business, and they get more excited. Once the students are here, they get to see the university. So they visit campus, they see that we have good math faculty, we have nice facilities, we have dorms, we have all the excitement going on. And in 2020, we're gonna have the STEM building, which is the entire building just dedicated for science, technology, engineering, mathematics. It's really nice because there we can house biology labs, computer science lab, physics lab, now we're going to have a dedicated space just for us to do research and teaching in these labs. I teach math educators the math methods, which is how to teach math to students. I attended the Canadian International Conference on Education. My project was unraveling the mysteries of the language involved in math problems. I received the School of Education, Health, Professions, and Human Development Research Award for the 2018-2019 school year. I really felt that I was doing what I liked to do. I enjoyed doing it. I didn't think I was doing anything really special, and I was very honored that my colleagues felt that I was. I received my bachelor's degree from UHB in interdisciplinary studies. Went on to get my master's degree from UHV as well, and that was in administration with an emphasis on principalship, and I graduated in the fall of 2018. I wanted to be a teacher ever since I was in fifth grade. I had a wonderful fifth grade teacher. I wanted to be like her. After graduating from UHV in the fall with my master's degree, I decided to go ahead and start pursuing a job as an assistant principal in Katy ISD. My degree from UHV really prepared me for the assistant principal position that I have today. I was named the outstanding graduate student in the fall of 2018 for the School of Education, Health Professions, and Human Development. And I was just so excited and humbled because I attribute my success to my family and everybody that supported me through the journey of getting my master's degree. After high school, I went to a private university in Southern California, and I went for two years, and I wound up getting into the grocery industry. My mother went back to school and received her master's in education when she was 50. She always told me that one day you're gonna go back to school. I thought about it every single day. I chose to get my bachelor's of business administration in finance from UHV because I love numbers. My father had been ill for some time. One of the last gifts that he gave my mother was a plane ticket to Houston to watch me graduate. The one thing that I was really happy about is the fact that he knew that I had finished school strong. Having my mother there with me was a very special moment. I know my dad was there with me too. UHV helped prepare me in so many different ways. It's really difficult to pinpoint just one. The influence that my professors had reach way beyond the classroom. Regional Steel has been very fortunate to have received many awards and accolades. Most recently in 2018 at the Leadership Excellence and Development Conference, the League Conference, we were recognized as having the best team building model in the world at that conference and I was recognized as one of the top corporate leaders over 35. Our team is everything. It's the heart of who we are. And I think a lot of that actually sprang from the experiences I had while attending UHV. I'm so excited about the growth at UHV. When I got my degree back in 2004 to look at things then compared to now, I'm so proud of our community leaders who invested so much over the years to make sure that the University of Houston Victoria had a chance to grow and prosper. It also enables us to bring talent into Victoria that otherwise maybe would never be here.
I've, I've often said that the way to distinguish Dr. Glenn and myself is that uh, one of us is handsome and the other one is tall. So I'm going to raise the, uh, for, for the tall one. The true power of an academic institution can be measured by the impact it has on the community that it serves. Our community is made up of our students, faculty members, staff, administrators, alumni, residents of the surrounding region, and those who love and support this institution. Academics have the ability to transform lives, and yes, to transform communities. Being new to this uh, blossoming institution, as well as this community, I marvel in the achievement of the faculty just as, as you do. So with that, I want to take a few minutes and, and let you know a little bit about our faculty and those who lead those faculty, uh, our, our deans. So our, our faculty is arranged in three schools, and each school is headed by a dean. So allow me to introduce them to you, and I'll ask them to stand as I call their names. And please remain standing so that uh, each, each of you can get a, uh, the round of applause that you so richly deserve. Um, so first of all, the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences is Dr. Jeffrey DeLeo. The Dean of the School of Business Administration is Dr. Ken Colwell. The Dean of the School of Education, Health Professions, and Human Development is Dr. Fred Litton. Okay. And Dr. Beverly Tomek is Associate Provost and Dean of University College. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you. You can be seated now. So with the, with the School of Arts and Sciences, I'm going to give you a few highlights of, of, of what's happening or what has happened over the course of the 2018-2019 uh, academic year. So a, a 30,000 grant from Alco Alcoa Foundation allowed the university to continue its popular mathematics, robotics, and computer science classes, camps, and events, and helped the university offer the Texas Women in Computing Summer Camp for middle school girls for the first time. An additional $7,500 grant to support the summer camp came from Dow Chemical Company Foundation to purchase portable computers and, portable, and a portable computer station. A $10,000 grant from the National Center for Women and in Information Technology supported university programs to increase enrollment, retention, and graduation of women majoring in undergraduate computer science degrees. For the first time, the UHV American Book Review reading series showcased three UHV faculty members, Diana Lopez, Anthony Madrid, and, and Saba Radvi. Are any of those faculty members here tonight? Well, let's give them a hand. The series started in 2006 and has brought more than 120 authors to Victoria for community readings, book signings, workshops with UHV and high school students, and receptions. The Master of Fine Arts uh, in Creative Writing program was recognized by two national ranking organizations, College Factual and Online Masters. Mr. Chairman, are we ready to reconvene? Yes. Okay, I would like to reconvene the Audit and Compliance Committee meeting. The Regents met in executive session, discussed personnel issues, and consulted with the General Counsel on legal matters. There was no action taken in executive session. Does so anyone have any further questions? It is coming apart. If not, there will be no further business to come before this committee. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you, sir. Let me get on.
organized here. All right. I'm calling to order the University of Houston Board of Regents meeting. Can I have, just give me one second. The first item listed on your agenda today is open form. Has anyone signed up for open form today? We'll move on to the next item listed upon the agenda. We'll move on. Can I get the approval of the minutes of the November 14th meeting, please? Thank you. Second? Second. All in favor? This motion carries and the minute is hereby approved. The next item to be addressed is the Houston Faculty Senate President. Is he making his presentation? Are we moving through that? Um, he's here. Go ahead and let's, can we do a, a brief presentation? It's three minutes, anyway. it's three minutes? all right, well, two, two minutes and 45 seconds. <laughs> all right, fair enough. I like compromise. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, Chancellor Couture. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Geronimo Cortina. I'm the president of the Faculty Senate for the next 18 months. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Political Science, and I'm also the associate director at the Center for Mexican American Studies. I have been a faculty member for 12 years at this institution, and since I got here, I've seen how the university has been transformed and how we have transformed the community. And over the past months, as I embarked into this position, I started to think, what is the role of our university, of a modern university, in a democratic society? The university, first of all, is the quintessential socioeconomic equalizer available to underserved and less privileged population. A role as a modern university is to create choices, to create and generate new ideas and new horizons that eventually are gonna move the status quo to a different equilibrium. We are a public institution, indeed, but in the public service. Our mission is not only to educate professionals, but we are in the business of cultivating the new generation of independent thinkers, the new generation of creative thinkers, the new generation of problem solvers, the new generation of civic-minded citizens. A role of our modern university is to expand and recreate previously defined boundaries to allow people of all socioeconomic backgrounds, of different colors, of different creeds, of different sexual orientations to realize their potential and aspirations. The role of the modern university is to provide students with the theoretical and practical tools so they can forge their future. Our role basically is to change lives. The role of the university is created by the collection of ideas that are exchanged every day in the classroom, by the research that opens doors to new discoveries, by the staff who silently keeps our university running. The role of the university is created by all of us. You're not the board of regents of a faithless university. You are the regents of dreams and aspirations of 46,000 students. You are the regents of endless research hours of more than 2,700 faculty, and you are the regents of more than 6,200 staff whose dedication goes beyond the call. It is a distinct honor to be allowed to serve the faculty and the institution, and through the principles of shared governance, the faculty and I are co committed to continue our role as proactive co-participants in recreating and molding the university that we want. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, you are, you are our regents, and we are counting on you, as you can count on us, your faculty. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you for your service. Do <laughs> Dr. Cortina, thank you so much. Look so forward to working with you over the next 18 months, and 
coming to some of your meetings. Thank you. All right. We're going to move straight to section three. Our committee reports, which uh, were listed on the board's consent and docket items. These items have been considered and unanimously approved at each of our board committee meetings, which were held earlier today. Pursuant to bylaws 6.9, any region may request that an individual item be removed from the board's consent docket agenda and addressed fully by the board. I'd now like the chair of each of these committees to present their respective reports. Our first committee today will be addressed by the chair of the endowment committee, Mr. Chasen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The endowment management committee met earlier today, February 27, 2020, and approved the following three action items for submission on the board's consent docket agenda for final board approval today as follows. One, approval is requested to modify the UH system endowment fund statement of investment objectives and policies and rebalance the endowment por portfolio UH system. Two, approval is requested to modify the UH system investment policy for non-endowed funds UH system. And three, approval is requested for the fiscal year 2020 University Advancement Endowment Assessment Rate UH system. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my committee report. Thank you so much, sir. Our next committee report will be addressed by Regent Jack Moore, who is the chair of the Audit and Compliance Committee. Committee met earlier today, February 27, 2020, and approved the following action item for submission on the board's consent docket agenda for the final board meeting today for approval. Ratification and approval is requested for the appointment of the Chief Audit and Compliance Executive for the University of Houston Systems. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my committee report. Thank you, sir. The next committee report will be addressed by Regent Beth Madison, Chair of the Academic and Student Success Committee. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. The Academic and Student Success Committee met earlier today, February 27, 2020, and approved the following two action items for submission on the board's consent docket agenda for final approval from the board as follows. Review and approval of University of Houston System Mission Statements, U of H System, and approval of a Master of Professional Accountancy, U of H Downtown. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my committee report. Thank you so much, Regent Madison. The next committee report will be addressed by Regent Doug Brooks, Chair of Facilities Construction and Master Planning Committee. Would you please give us your report, sir? Well, we basically just went through uh, updates on the construction projects. It was information only and made a very short uh, uh, meeting discussion today, Mr. Chairman. All, is, all the big projects are on time and on budget. Thank you, sir. Our final committee report today will be by Regent Gerald McGeevy, Chair of the Finance and Administration Committee. Please, sir, give us your committee report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Finance and Administration Committee met on February 27th and approved the following seven action items for submission on the board's consent docket agenda for final board approval today as follows. Approval is requested to delegate authority to the Chancellor to negotiate and execute contracts exceeding $1 million for the purchase of goods or services, excluding construction contracts at the University of Houston. Approval is requested to delegate authority to the Chancellor to negotiate and execute construction contracts exceeding $1 million for projects at the UH system. Approval is requested for changes to the fiscal year 2021 and fiscal year 2022 fixed tuition and fee rates. Variable rate undergraduate and graduate tuition and fee rates, mandatory student recommended fees, and voluntary and optional fees at the UH system. Approval is requested to delegate authority to the Chancellor to negotiate and execute contracts for design and construction of the John M. O'Quinn Law Building located in the Professional District. Approval is requested write off accounts and notes receivable for fiscal year 2019. Approval is requested to delegate authority to the Chancellor to negotiate and execute contracts for fiscal year 2020 insurance policies at the University of Houston, and approval is requested for the University of Houston system fiscal year 2021 holiday schedule and to amend the fiscal year 2020 holiday schedule for UH Clear Lake UH system. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my committee report. Thank you, sir. Pursuant to board bylaw 6.9, does any regent wish to request that an individual item be removed from the board's consent docket? agenda and addressed by the full board for discussion. 
Uh, obviously not today. If not, may I hear a motion to approve all items as presented in each of the committee reports? So moved. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All items listed under the various committee reports, consent docket agendas have been approved by the full board. We'll now move to section four listed on your agenda. Committee report items not addressed in the consent docket but requiring final board approval. There were no items brought forward from the various committees today. Next in our agenda is section five, additional board agenda items to be presented to the board. Are they here today? Regent Mendoza and, no. okay. No, they're not. Would you still like, for the record? Okay, I, I would like to do that. Uh, the first resolution and appreciation is for Regent Paula Mendoza, who was appointed by Governor Rick Perry on October 15, 2013, and whose term ended on November the 8th, 2019. Regent Mendoza was on numerous board committees, serving in various capacities, such as vice chair and chair of the Academic and Student Success Committee, a member and later chair of the Facilities Construction and Master Planning Committee, and a member of the Audit and Compliance Committee. In 2018, she was appointed by her fellow board members to the post of secretary. She is a native Houstonian, a proud double alumna of the U of H downtown, and a huge supporter of the U of H downtown, and has devoted her life to promoting small businesses and opportunities for women and minorities. She is also a strong supporter of UH's SURE program. She was honestly a tremendous board member and her, her fight for everything for University of Houston downtown, there, there will never be a bigger proponent for U of H downtown than, than her. And, and what a wonderful, wonderful trustee she was. So. Our second resolution and appreciation is for Peter Taft who was appointed by Governor Rick Perry on October 15, 2013, whose term ended on November 8, 2019. Regent Taft was a member of the Audit and Compliance Committee, serving as vice chair and chair, as a member of the Finance and Administration Committee, and ultimately becoming vice chair and a member of the Academic and Student Success Committee. Regent Taft was elected by his fellow board members to the post of vice chairman in 2018 serving through August of 2019. He earned his Doctorate of Jurisprudence degree from UH Law Center, a former professor and past board member, UH Law Center Alumni Association. His many other professional and community activities include his work as of counsel for the Busby Law Firm, member of the State Bar of Texas, past member State Bar of Texas Pro Bono College, to name a few, on this 27th day of February 2020, now it therefore resolved that the U of H System Board of Regents issue these resolutions in appreciation of Paula Mendoza and Peter Taft and deep gratitude and admiration for their fruitful and rewarding tenure on the U of H System Board of Regents. Mr. Taft was a wonderful, wonderful Board of Regent member. Anybody who serves as vice chair for me has extra loads to do a lot of my pageantry work. They get to do lots of the shuffling of the dirt and, and uh, was a wonderful member. Is there any way to give him an honorary communications and PR degree yeah, since he... <laughs> so um, I've got a, this crew here, though I have to say the governor did unbelievable again in replacing these two. So may I have this, uh, may I have a motion to approve this item as presented? This item, all, all in favor? Aye. None opposed. This item is hereby approved as presented as chair of the board and behalf of my fellow board members. It has been an honor and privilege once again to have served with these. And I will thank y'all in person, but y'all can listen to this on tape or watch it if you like. <laughs> we will now move to section six on your agenda, the chancellor's report. Dr. Couture will pass out her report. We are censoring her today because the, the mayor of the city of Houston said we are in an emergency. We have no water. So is there anything you would like to highlight? No. 
They're you just... can. We will give you three minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Since Chairman. Since we gave the faculty two forty-five, we're going to give you three. <laughs> okay, I'll take two two minutes forty seconds. I'll take always less than the faculty. But uh, there are just uh, I have written report which goes on the website as well as it is in your packets. So just great things going on um, in all of the campuses here, and I just wanted to, uh, every time I have hard time trimming down these bullets to make sure that they are, they are in, a, in, in a short format here because otherwise there are so many wonderful things happening that um, I could just talk about. But I, just, I wanted you to, to let you know just a couple of one, one item from everywhere. First of all, I know we always talk about football, basketball, but our swimming and diving team uh, won conference championship, fourth year in a row conference championship. So it's a g absolutely you know, fantastic things there too. But there are also on, on Clear Lake, um, I mean, a key accreditation has come to Clear Lake as well as uh, they have started a BAMS program in serious gaming and simulation. I mean, this is like being at the cutting edge of the program. For UH Downtown, their online programs continue to make, uh, you know, real headway and they are ranked among the top. Now UH Downtown and University of Houston will both have pantries, Gator Pantry, Cougar Pantry, and there are hundreds of students are uh, being benefited. UHD started first, we just opened um, in January, and this is our, another way for us to help out and reach out to students um, who may have uh, food insecurity. In terms of uh, UH Victoria, uh, Senator John Cornyn came to uh, give commencement uh, a speech this time and as well as um, UH, uh, UHV has been, uh, the, its programs has also been ranked uh, by intelligent.com among the top programs. Number two on the best online masters in creative writing degree program and also MFA. So it's, uh, it, there are a lot of great things. I really encourage you and plead you to read it at your leisure since you'll have free time because the board meeting might end early. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chancellor. Thank Wonderful you. things happen here at the University of Houston. We do need to move into executive session, so will the regents now go into executive session pursuant to sections of the Texas Government Code listed on page four of your agenda. quality and its affordability. In the School of Business Administration, Chinese businessman uh, Bing Zin Wu donated $700,000 to the university over a 10 year period to improve programs, research and international business studies for business students and faculty. Wu, who previously awarded an honorary doc who was previously awarded an honorary doctorate of humane letters from UHV also donated $600,000 to the university five years ago. Wu's donation helped sponsor 13 graduate and undergraduate students 2019 two week summer abroad trip in China. Nearly 100 UHV students have traveled to China since the summer study abroad program first started. Undergraduate business students helped create a social media plan for the UHV, UHV Small Business Development Center. The winning team members got to present their plan at the Regional Small Business Association Conference and attend the Victoria LeaderCast event hosted by the SBDC. OnlineMasters.com placed UHV's strategic and global master of business administration degrees in human resource management and strategic MBA in international business on its list of the best online MBAs in the nation for their affordability, academic quality, and student success. I think that's worth a, a hand, don't you think? Undergraduate degrees receiving rankings included the Bachelor of Business Administration in Finance and a BBA in General Business with Supply Chain Management concentration. In the School of Education, Health, Professions, and Human Development, 
the National Council for Accreditation of Counseling and Related Educational Programs awarded eight-year reaccreditations to UHV's two degrees in its graduate counseling and education program. The university offers the only KCREP accredited Master of Education degrees in school counseling and clinical medical uh, mental health counseling in the Victoria and greater Houston areas. The university revamped its online voice program, which allows those who are interested in teaching but have a bachelor's degree in another field to earn a teaching certificate in as little as a year. The changes make the program more affordable and give students the option of applying credits towards earning a master's degree. A $100,000 grant awarded by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas to the University of Houston Foundation funded a year-long community-based program led by two UHV faculty members that focuses on ways to reduce chronic kidney disease in at-risk populations. UHV began coordinating a $109,800 contract with the Texas Education Agency to review lesson proposals and select the ones included in a new free online database of lesson plans and accompanying videos for teachers in pre-kindergarten through 12th grade classrooms. So as you can see, the schools were very, very busy over the 2018-19 academic years. Let's give them a hand for that. Now, in University College, even though this didn't happen in 2018 and 19, I wanted to let you know some good news that uh, we just received a few weeks ago. You've probably seen or heard about this in the, in the newspaper, but building on UHV's continuing work to improve academic support services, we applied for and were chosen to receive a $2.2 million Title III grant from the University, I'm sorry, from the U.S. Department of Education. This grant will provide $450,000 a year for five years to launch new programs and to help promote student success. This will include hiring two additional student success coaches to enhance our intrusive advising program, providing additional tutoring for students offering training opportunities for faculty and working with local nonprofits and businesses to provide additional student engagement opportunities and internships. I hope you got that. The grant, along with a $50,000 grant from the American Electric Power Foundation, also provides resources to build a new summer bridge program to give incoming freshmen extra support in English and in math. So we are, are working together and utilizing resources, resources externally to build up our students and to prepare them uh, for the society that awaits them and the communities that they live in. So let's give our academic units a hand for what they've accomplished this year. $5 million gift from Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas to the UH College of Medicine will provide $100,000 scholarships for at least 35 medical students and create a pipeline program to attract underrepresented students who are interested in practicing primary care medicine. The new medical school aims for half of each graduating class to practice primary care, addressing a statewide shortage of physicians in urban and rural communities. U.S. News and World Report has ranked the online master's degree programs at the University of Houston College of Education eighth in the country. The rankings cover the college's online master's of education in higher education, special populations, and curriculum and instruction. And UH Baseball opens its season February 14th with a new 20,000 square foot practice facility. It features a new locker room and clubhouse, indoor practice area, weight room, and training room, and a virtual sports simulator. 
The facility is 100% funded by private donations to UH Baseball. For the latest from UH, make sure to subscribe. When I was in high school, when we were reading about the Civil War, um, there was a paragraph, a short paragraph, okay, on slavery. And so I asked the question of the teacher, I said, if a war was fought about a group of people who were used as property, treated as property, where are all the other dimensions of why that war happened and how it affected other people? He, my teacher couldn't answer. Well, keep in mind, um, it was the way he was socialized to teach, okay? And that's why I'm in education today, is because I'm trying to change the stories that are told. History is about stories, and, and keep in mind that whoever is in charge gets to shape the story. If we get more different experiences teaching, and we get those persons who are teaching knowing about other folks' experiences, then what we'll get is a fuller picture of what happened at any period in time. We'll get a sense of the complexity of the human experience, and we'll also become more respectful of others in terms of where they, they or representatives of their group have arrived. As an affirmative action baby, we had an opportunity to gain access to the mainstream through education. Uh, most underrepresented minority members learn very quickly that education is the key to your future, to advancement. And so I was just encouraged by my family to go as far in school as I chose to, to go. And uh, as my parents would have told you, my siblings, I'm very curious. So I've been in school all my life. This institution produces leaders. Houston's future is in this stadium today. Go Gators! The reality is that a single person can make a difference if they decide to. And you don't have to be extraordinary to do extraordinary things. Yes, thank you to my village, my Soledades. Thank you, thank you. We made it, we made it, Woo! You persevered through many trials and made tremendous sacrifices to make it here to graduate from UHD. Hey, we made it, baby. As UHD graduates, let's not fear challenges, let's embrace them. Go Gators! Whatever happens next will be possible by our ability to think, to try, and to overcome any obstacles. Go Gators, go, go, go! Where you be? I love all of you. Thank you, Mama. I want to say this is one of the happiest days of my life. Remember that you are now part of UH Downtown, and UH Downtown will now forever be a part of you. Best wishes to you in your future, and go Gators! Researchers from UH are reporting a new device that can capture solar energy and store it as thermal energy until it's needed, creating the potential for 24-7 energy delivery. Current solar cells cannot store solar power, creating a lack of energy on cloudy days and during nighttime hours, which has stalled the wide-scale adoption of solar power. UH welcomed almost 500 high school juniors and seniors to campus for the Ascending Leaders Forum. Coordinated by the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities to raise college awareness among first-generation students, the forum empowers them to achieve post-secondary access and success. And 400 new trees are being planted across the UH campus. Apache Corporation donated the trees to enhance green spaces and create a physically vibrant campus. The first 200 trees were planted as part of Texas Arbor Day, with the next 200 scheduled to be planted in the new year. For the latest from UH, make sure to subscribe. 
When you live in Hunter Hall, it's easy to get to class, make friends, and stay connected. Be one of the first to live in our new residence hall. The sound of mariachi music will fill the air at UH this fall. Over 45 students signed up for a new mariachi ensemble in the Moore School of Music. The Mariachi Pumas are open to all students and will play events on the UH campus as well as perform at special events in the Metro Houston area. UH and the UH Law Center have been awarded the Higher Education Excellence in Diversity Award from Insight into Diversity Magazine. The HEAT Award is the only national honor recognizing U.S. colleges and universities that demonstrate an outstanding commitment to diversity and inclusion. This marks the fourth year the university and the Law Center have been named as award recipients. And for the first time in 20 years, men's basketball season tickets are sold out. The American Athletic Conference coaches selected UH as the preseason favorites to defend their American Athletic Conference title. The Cougars open the season November 12th against Alabama State. For the latest from UH, make sure to subscribe. The University of Houston has the number one ranked undergraduate entrepreneurship program in the country. This is the 14th straight top 10 ranking for the Civia and Melbourne Wolf Center for Entrepreneurship in the list compiled by the Princeton Review. Wolf Center students and graduates have started more than 1,200 businesses over the past decade. A significant gift from the John M. O'Quinn Foundation will name the new UH Law Building the John M. O'Quinn Law Building. The gift will support construction of the state-of-the-art building set to begin in 2020. Equipped with the latest technology and flexible space, the building will also serve as a hub to engage and serve the public. And a fleet of 30 Starship autonomous delivery robots has been deployed on campus, making UH the first university in Texas to offer robotic food deliveries. Using an app, customers choose their order from 11 dining locations. The robots can cross streets, climb curbs, and travel at night, expanding dining schedules and options on campus. For the latest from UH, make sure to subscribe.
Here's your delivery. Thank you. Have a nice day. Oh man, I'm starving. I wonder what's at the dining hall. Let me check the UH Go app. Whoa, what's up, man? Oh, chicken. That's my favorite. It's so beautiful outside. I wonder what's going on around campus. Movie night, and I haven't seen this one. Oh man, to register for class. I wonder what's available. Nice, I got what I wanted. And I know this one. See you guys, gotta catch the bus. When does the next one come? Whew, made it. Nice shades, man. And now I'd like to give out the People Who Make a Difference Award. This award was established to pay tribute to individuals who have supported the university and made a difference in the quality of life in their communities. It is indeed an honor to present the People Who Make a Difference Award to my friend and colleague, Dr. David Hines, president of Victoria College. As many can confirm, Dr. Hines is a great leader at VC and a wonderful partner to UHV when it comes to collaborating and promoting higher education in the crossroads. He has served as president of Victoria College since August of 2015. His higher education journey began at Midland College after an anonymous person awarded him a $500 scholarship. Dr. Hines then went to Texas State University where he obtained a Bachelor of Science. He earned his Master of Business Administration from the University of Houston and his doctorate in higher education administration from the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Hines started his career as a high school teacher in San Marcos, worked in the private sector for two years, and then served on the faculty at Brasses Ports College for 22 years, 11 of which as division chair for business and computer technology. He served as senior vice president of instructional affairs at Allegheny College in Maryland before becoming the fifth president of Victoria College. Under Dr. Hines' leadership, Victoria College has continued to strengthen partnerships with the Victoria Independent School District, surrounding area high school districts, UHV, and businesses throughout the crossroads. Under his leadership, Victoria College has earned national recognition for the past three years as a great college to work for. Dr. Hines serves on the Victoria Economic Development Corporation's executive board the UHV President's Regional Advisory Board, the Texas Association of Community College Legislative Committee, and the Golden Crescent Regional Planning Commission, Regional Economic Development Advisory Committee. Unfortunately for all of us, he's announced his intention to retire this coming fall and spend some well-deserved time with his family. Our condolences to Kim. David, on behalf of myself and the entire UHB family, thank you for being a, such a great partner for UHB and all that you've done to promote higher education in the Victoria community and the surrounding region. I'm certainly proud and pleased to be able to call you both friend and colleague. Please step forward to re receive this well-deserved <laughs> award.
Thank you, Bob. As my mother would say, ridiculous. <laughs> Bob, Bob called me a couple months ago to talk to me about this. And um, my wife, Kim, was listening to half the conversation. And I said, that's very nice. I would be very honored. I'm sure there are other people more deserving than I am. But yes, where should I be? And when should I be there? And what should I wear? And when I got off the phone, my wife asked, did Bob just ask you to marry him? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I said, no, but, but, he, but he certainly uh, gave a, a, a pretty compelling proposal. I would just say that um, I've learned so much from, from everyone in this room. Uh, so many of you have become friends in such a short period of time. And um, there are just a couple of folks I would like to give credit to uh, individually. I would say that this award is really fundamentally about being cooperative. And I've never gotten an award before in my entire lifetime. And if I was going to get an award, I'm very proud to get one for being cooperative. But I will tell you that there were two individuals when I got here that insisted that I be cooperative. And, and those two individuals were uh, Roger Welder and Ron Walker. And Roger, as you know, was former regent at UH, and, and Ron serves on our board now and was then our board chair. And they insisted that we sit down with Vic Morgan on a monthly basis and talk about all of the things that we needed to collaborate and cooperate on so I'd very much like to thank Roger and Ron and Vic for everything you've done for me since I've been here. And I will say, if you can't get along with Bob, you can't get along with anybody. <laughs> so um, just thank you all so much. It doesn't mean the world to me. I really never have received an award in my entire lifetime. This is very special, and I'm so proud. I have been a part of a variety of higher ed institutions, and I have learned so much. And one of the things I have learned more than anything else is that the more we communicate with each other, the more we learn about each other, particularly diverse student bodies, it expands our understanding of life and world situations. I talked today earlier about nonviolent protesting. There are so many ways to respond to injustice. And it is one of the hardest things one has to do, and that is not to respond in anger immediately, not to respond out of an emotion, but try to respond thoughtfully and do a lot of listening. And when you do respond, give yourself time to really think about how you want to respond. Nonviolent protest training was one of the best things that I've ever done. I do presentations all the time, and people ask me, well, it's so good to have you here because you're not angry. And, and so often we run into angry people. And I say, who told you that? <laughs> I am angry. I don't respond to that anger in ways that you might respond or that you think I should respond. I try to respond as unemotionally in this moment as I can. And that's what I would ask students to do. And I would ask them not to be alone, always be identified with groups. And these groups don't have to be limited to uh, people of your own race. There are people from all walks of life uh, who are experiencing other kinds of oppression. And we must be allies to others as well as open our arms to those and find out what we have in common because groups have a power to change things. Groups of one mind have the power to change. It's time to honor a student who's really made a major impact in her time here at UHV. 
Each year we give out the Student Leadership Award to recognize a student who has demonstrated excellence in academic and leadership qualities. The 2018-2019 award goes to Ms. Catherine Burke. Ms. <laughs> Ms. Burke is a senior from YPO Hawaii. She is, a she is double majoring in psychology and business administration with a concentration in human resource management. During her time here at UHP, she's been a part of several student organizations. She was president of the Business Student Association and a member of the Residence Hall Association and the Jaguar Activities Board. She also previously served as a senator for the UHP Student Government Association and as vice president for the National Society for Leadership and Success. She has worked as both a senior resident assistant and a student worker in the UHP Career Services Office. And on top of all that, she has been named to the UHV Presidents and Dean's List multiple times during her tenure here. Please join me in congratulating a student who did not know she was getting an award tonight, <laughs> Catherine Burke. Well, I definitely wasn't expecting this award at all. As you can tell, I'm super nervous. But thank you for everyone, I guess, who made me get this award. I really couldn't have done it without like my friends, my family, my staff members, um, especially my professors and my assistant director, um, Camilla Sutton, and all those different people. Oh, I'm super nervous right now. But um, honestly, I'm just, my heart's pounding. And all I can think to say is God bless everyone. And I'm just so happy to have receive this. I worked so hard and I'm sure everybody else has too. So thank you so much. At University of Houston Clear Lake, our goal is simple, your success. With 45 years of educating astronauts, business leaders, scientists, engineers, and educators in the nation's fourth largest city, UHCL is the place to find your path. We are Hawks, a community of more than 9,000 students who come from different countries around the world, speak many languages, and represent diverse cultures. A testament to our designation as a Hispanic-serving institution. So whether you're in college for the first time, transferring from another college, affiliated with the military, identify as LGBTQ, or have different cultural beliefs, we have two words for you. Access granted. Get ready to be challenged and guided by professors who combine classroom learning with research, hands-on experience, and their industry knowledge to prepare you to contribute to your community and the world. There's even more to discover outside the classroom. With more than 100 student organizations, you'll build new relationships, learn new skills and leadership, and find your voice. Our Treeline Campus offers green space to create, relax, and recharge. Get ready to discover more at UHCL. We're ready for the journey. Are you?
Thank you. My name is Preston Johnson and I attended the University of Houston Clear Lake uh, and graduated in 1983. I also uh, had a career in the manufacturing sector of industry and spent over 40 years in manufacturing oil and gas and exploration and production. I came up from, from very humble beginnings. My, neither of my parents ever graduated from high school. And so the thing that you found in my household is that education was critical and became the, the great differentiator. There were times in my career when I would uh, sit in a boardroom and I would be surrounded by a bunch of people in those, in those rooms and m most of those people didn't look like me. Uh, most of them were the same gender, but at the end of the day, uh, I developed a relationship with those individuals and everything that we do is about making the business successful. And I didn't concentrate on the other stuff, peripheral stuff I can tell you uh, in terms of, well, you black and, and they're all white. You're different uh, from them and uh, you're probably not going to be taken seriously. Uh, nobody's going to listen to what you got. You have to say. But I found that if you work hard, you prepare well for what you're going to do, and you are confident and committed to everything that you're doing, then nobody in that room is going to be any better than you at the job that you've been assigned to do. Take advantage of that and, and win. Each year we give the Community Partnership Award to a person, business, or organization that has helped advance the quality of life in the region and the university. This year I am offered to present the Community Partnership Award to the Alcoa Foundation. Alcoa has been a part of the Crossroads community since 1948, and Alcoa has been supporting UHV through gifts, grants, and donations for 35 years. Since 1984, the Foundation is one of our most generous and long-term supporters. 
In fact, Alcoa Foundation has given UHV more than $525,000 during those years. Its contributions have funded scholarships, leadership programs, programs for girls, and most recently, an array of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics related programs. UHV Mathematics and Robotics Awareness Day is now entering its 25th year and has been heavily supported by the Alcoa Foundation during much of that time. Thanks to the Foundation's generosity, thousands of Victoria area middle and high school students have been introduced to and encouraged in STEM fields through camps, events, and programs. We appreciate all that the Alcoa Foundation has done to support education at UHV and in the crossroads. I am pleased and privileged to present this year's Community Partnership Award to the Alcoa Foundation. Accepting the award on behalf of the Foundation are Mr. Kevin Riggs, Site Manager for Alcoa Point Comfort Operations, and Ms. Martha Toller, Executive Lead Team Coordinator for, for Point Comfort Operations. Please join me in thanking the Alcoa Foundation. I'm honored and I'm flattered um, to, to receive that. 1,300 donors, um, and you have so much exciting things going on here at UHV. And so I won't, I won't take any time from you other than just I'm amazed and impressed. And, and the young man that spoke to us earlier, that's why you, you invest in young lives, to, to come here to play goalie and leave president of the Student Association. That's awesome. And congratulations on that. Very impressed. Thank you. We were created for NASA Johnson Space Center at the center's request to provide advanced study uh, and other learning opportunities for their administrators, staff, scientists, engineers, and astronauts. They saw that as a need. We met it. Our legacy as an institution that was created to solve problems is important for us to recognize, to own, and to see what portions of that we're going to bring forward. What we're ready for is the next era. The wonderful thing about the University of Houston Clear Lake is that it is 45 years young. It's absolutely an extraordinary place to study, an extraordinary place to develop uh, relationships, to become the next version, hopefully better, of oneself. My name is Mohammed Abdul Jalil. I am majoring in biology. I am the student body president here at the University of Houston Clear Lake. I've personally built um, some personal connections with professors, um, got to know them more on a personal level, and vice versa as well. Essentially, without them, I would not be where I am today. Dr. Dabrowski was one of the main reasons I shifted from one way of studying to a different way of studying. Not the memorization aspect, but the wanting to understand and the curiosity. Dr. Hart, the Vice President of Student Affairs here at the University of Houston Clear Lake, as well as President Blake, they always say that they are working for us, right? They care about what we want and they want to see our growth and help us in any way that we can. As a UHCL alumni, um, sooner th rather than later, um, I can't wait to see the more buildings that are going to be built on this campus, the increase in student population, the more student organizations that are going to be created, and the more opportunities that there will be offered to those students that are going to be coming here. Hopefully what makes UHCL unique and stays the same is, you know, the student to professor ratio, being able to still go to professor's office hours, not being a number, rather an actual individual, was, would be the amazing thing to continue to see throughout the growth of UHCL itself. There is a genuine love for this university, and I really do believe that it comes from the legacy of being focused on connecting students to the real world in meaningful ways. All those different parts create this greater outcome, which for us, I think, is a love for who we are and what we do and how we contribute out there in our region.
A researcher from the University of Houston is developing the next generation of pacemakers that come from the human body. Associate Professor Bradley McConnell is taking stem cells found in fat, converting them to heart cells, and reprogramming them to act as biologic pacemaker cells. Biologic pacemakers are able to grow with the body and become much more responsive to what the body is doing. A team from the UH College of Education is working to help students with dyslexia. Using a $1.6 million grant from the Department of Education, the researchers will work with schools to help educators better identify students with dyslexia by providing professional development on dyslexia screening while creating a blueprint to help reading proficiency rates increase. And a new statue and wall honors the legacy of Roy Hoffines at the arena he helped build. UH unveiled a nine-foot statue of Hoffines outside Fertitta Center in the new Hoffines Plaza, and the Judge Roy Hoffines wall inside of the arena chronicles his achievements as a visionary entrepreneur. We want to talk about some of the great things that have happened this year. We started the year out with some wonderful news when we were received a $1.5 million donation, which was the largest in our history from the M.G. and Lily A. Johnson Foundation, uh, who have been faithful in their support over the years, Buddy Brock and Robert Halapaska, uh, right over here. Uh, let's have a round of applause for the Lily Foundation. Their gift is going to enable us to outfit some labs in our new science and technology uh, building, as well as in the new uh, Town Plaza Mall renovation, which we're undergoing. And they continue to su support so much of what we do, particularly in the sciences and the healthcare, and we'd certainly appreciate it. In addition to breaking ground on both the Town Plaza and the STEM building, we also broke ground and had a topping out ceremony for the Don and Mona Smith hall which will add about 300 beds to our uh, on-campus residence uh, capacity we also opened the university commons which many of you were uh, at our ribbon cutting for that 80,000 square foot center uh, where the new library is located uh, which also serves not only uhv but victoria college students uh, and the community uh, we're also growing in katie uh, and in the fall of 2019, we moved into a new academic building with the University of Houston. This 80,000 square foot facility, three-story building is located near the intersection of Interstate 10 and the Grand Parkway uh, with both UHV and UH degree programs being offered there. In addition, we were at work partnering with San Antonio Independent School District to identify up to 10 graduating seniors each fall and provide these SAISD scholars with extensive advising and financial support to come to UHV. Back in February, Crossroads Bank gave US, UHV the wonderful news that it was donating 300000 to the university over 10 years to support the expansion of UHV athletics. This gift, the largest cash donation ever in support of UHV athletics, also designates Crossroads Bank as a UHV athletic sponsor for each of our sports throughout the academic year. And while I'm mentioning uh, UHV athletics, I would also note uh, that our men's soccer team just won the conference tournament and on their way to nationals. We also have the great news that the Rebuild Texas Fund by the Guitar Harvey Fund gave us a $100,000 donation to provide partnerships to our students still struggling with the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. 
Spring brought the good news that the Texas legislature had approved the assessment of a $125 a semester student fee to help finance the construction of a new UHV recreation center. 74% of our students living within 50 miles of the Victoria campus voted to assess themselves the fee after an initiative led by the UHV Student Government Association. I'd like to particularly thank our students who are here tonight because it's their being able to see forward that made the University Commons possible and now makes the UHV Recreation Center a definite uh, uh, feature of our future. So it's been a great year. <laughs> Much of our uh, legacy could not have happened without the hard work of former administrators, faculty, and staff and community. Uh, during the last 46 years, they had a vision when they started UHV in 1973 as an off-campus center of the University of Houston, and look where we've come now. UHV couldn't have grown this much or come this far without everybody in this room. Because of this, we've selected expanding our legacy as this year's annual report theme. Tonight, we've asked students, faculty, and alumni and community members to talk about their successes in 2018-2019. We've also put together a couple of short videos to focus on these amazing individuals. Once again, our annual report is available completely online. You have a program book in front of you which contains uh, in it the online address where you can go and review all of the videos that are here tonight uh, and all of the um, uh, uh, things that we talk about tonight will be on our website in just a few days. On the annual report website, you'll be able to view the videos you will see here uh, with the faculty, staff, and students and alumni highlights, UHV's enrollment and financial figures, photos from this past year, a list of our generous donors, and much more. We will also be adding videos filmed tonight and an event photo gallery that will feature all of you. An obvious example of the expanding our legacy theme is UHV's academic programs and all of their great accomplishments over the past year. Hey everyone, I'm Chef Alex Brueger, Senior Executive Chef for University of Houston. Today we're going to have some fun with some Thanksgiving leftovers. First one I'm going to show you is a Kentucky Hot Brown. It's an old favorite of mine. I actually uh, learned this one from the wife. So we've got two pieces of bread. We're going to go ahead and toast them up. I like to use brioche. We're going to split one in half, go end to end. Then you've got some of that delicious turkey hopefully mom made for you and it's nice and juicy. If not, it's quite all right. We're gonna have a nice sauce for you to lay on top. Pile it as high as you want, like four or five slices so you can see on everything. Next thing we're gonna do, let's go ahead and take four slices of bacon right on over here. That looks great. Now, obviously add as much or as little as you want. Let's do a sliced Roma tomato. Probably about four slices on this one. Then I've got a delicious bechamel sauce right on over here. And bechamel, it's real easy to find in Google. Just go ahead and pull it up. Any base recipe is going to work. It's just a vehicle to put our nice cheesy goodness on this one. About four to six ounces on that. A little bit of parm cheese to finish. And in the oven we go. And here we've got our delicious bubbling right out of the oven hot brown. Hit it with a little parsley and enjoy. Hope you like today's recipe. Let me know. Now let's make a tasty dessert. Caramel pumpkin empanadas. Super simple and easy to make. First, I've got a delicious empanada shell which you can pick up anywhere. Walmart, your local grocery store. We're gonna go ahead and use a crimper that we bought as well. Don't have to, you can use a simple fork if you wanted to. Let's just go ahead and throw a couple of tablespoons of our empanada mix right on in there. We're gonna hit it with a little bit of our egg mix right on one end. Come on in, we've got our empanada crimper. We're just gonna go ahead and fold that over in half. Get yourself a nice empanada there. And then we're just gonna drop them in the fryer for about two minutes at 350 degrees. I've got some down here for you. Wow, these look great. Now all we gotta do is dress up a good looking plate, serve them up to your guests, dress them up any way you want. We've got that. Do some strawberries on the outside. Let's get some mint on there into our delicious ice cream. And finally, some caramel. 
right on top. No rules, just right. Look at that. Simple, easy, delicious caramel pumpkin pie empanadas. Enjoy. Container security at ports is a big problem for the U.S. government. The Borders Trade and Immigration Institute at UH is partnering with Lantern Unmanned Autonomous Systems to create an innovative solution, testing drones that are able to scan shipping containers for radiation. Only about 5% of shipping containers are searched once they arrive at ports, and the autonomous drones could create an important additional tool for port security. President Couture joined city and county leaders to break ground on a $19 million construction project to transform Cullen Boulevard. The project will add larger sidewalks and bikeways while improving drainage to help reduce street flooding. The first phase is expected to be completed by March 2020. And visitors to Blaffer Art Museum can catch a rising photography star and hear a Latin American experimental musician at two new exhibitions. The first major museum showcase of photographer Paul and Poggy Sapuya is at Blaffer through March 14th, and visitors can take a seat and listen to Jacqueline Nova's Creación de la Tierra through January 4th. My nature of being an explorer, uh, when we lived out in New Mexico and Arizona, one of the things that we did as kids uh, on the weekend is that we would form a group of us and we would, we would go and, you know, explore the mountains. And so I was always looking what's on the other side, you know, I go to that hill and then there was another hill and I had to go down the valley and go to the, the top of the other hill and always was very curious. So looking up in the heavens, then, and seeing those stars also made me curious about exploring those. And who was exploring those? Astronauts. Uh, watching Neil and Buzz Aldrin go and you know, go and land on the moon. And I said, I want to follow in their footsteps. And the biggest challenge that uh, I faced was uh, being a person of color in America in the 60s. Uh, because as I looked at that little black and white television, of uh, them landing on the moon, I didn't see anybody uh, that looked like me. I had already done my research at NASA and I found out that there were medical doctors who worked in the space program. I, it was, a, again, a godsend for me because one of the other things that I discovered very, very early on is that I liked helping people. And so with those two seemingly separate goals, I was able to put them together and saying, you know what, I could become a medical doctor who then travels in space. In order for you to be able to take care of yourself, take care of your family, and take care of your community, you have to be a knowledgeable person. And that knowledgeable person requires uh, expertise, you know, education from somewhere. And the best way to get that is through college, through a formal education, like, you know, the University of Houston Clear Lake. And I chose that. If you think about, I went into medical school, then I went into astronaut school, and, and then later on I went to business school. Uh, all of that, I chose college, the formal education, in order to do that because it was so important. Being a UHV student athlete has been an experience in its own. It's taught me to be more competitive on the golf course than what I used to be in the past. And it's also led me to be a lot more competitive in the classroom. The school really wants you to succeed and they're really there to support you. JAG stands for jobs after graduation and it really sets us up to make sure we know what we're gonna do and we have the resources that we need to succeed after we graduate. 
My experience at the PGA Works Tournament in Fort St. Lucie, Florida was a great one. It was actually my second year there. I shot some of my best golf I have there, which was a pretty amazing experience. Anytime the women's team is together, we always just have a really good time. UHV has been nothing but great. Being part of the UHV Jaguar soccer team is the best part of my life. There's no better sense of family, of knowing that your team has have your back in all situations. And it's crazy because there's a lot of cultural differences, but one common goal brings us all together. It's definitely a better way to experience college. Being named one of the 2018 Dactronics NAIA Main Soccer Scholar Athlete was an honor. Just the fact that I was considered for such an award makes me really happy. Being captain of the UHV soccer team means a lot to me. Knowing that my teammates chose me for this position, I'm there for them as a friend, for anything they need. I try to push them to be better, put in the effort, keep them motivated through the hard times and the best times. You feel great to earn the NSEAA Team Academic Award for exemplary performance in the classroom as a team. It feels good because it shows how much effort the coaches put into us being a student before an athlete, and it also shows how much we focus on our school work as well as soccer during season. It was great being crowned homecoming king. It was something about all the students cheering me on and then me actually winning and their emotions with my emotions. It was like, ah. I've always had a big interest in the fashion industry, everything about it. Thankfully, the Department of Student Life allowed me to help them create what they envisioned Jax should look like for homecoming. We interpret it as a 90s jumpsuit. I really just want to be prepared to enter the workforce. Since I do have a knack for things in the fashion industry, I really hope to get a job along those lines. I was also involved with being the entertainment chair for the Jaguar Activities Board, which really gave me the opportunity to coordinate events for students throughout the year. I really like a lot about UHV, but it's one of those things that you really just have to experience for yourself. Something about that positive energy, the community, faculty, staff, students, it's truly one of a kind. I decided to join UHV Student Government Association because the president of last year's administration recruited me to join. He'd seen that I was actively involved with the university and wanted me on his team. I founded the Creative Writing Association. I wanted to create something where students felt comfortable with engaging with their peers and collaborating on a creative idea and just being able to talk creatively about anything, whether it's poetry, whether it's fiction, whether it's screenwriting. I definitely wanted to create that safe space where they felt comfortable enough to share their projects. It is so exciting to see the University Commons building finally open. For future generations of students that come to UHV, they're going to see that hard work actually does pay off here. How y'all doing? Hello everyone, my name is Christopher Leroy McDonald and I'm currently serving as Student Government Association President at UHV. I came to, to Victoria to attend UHV as a freshman in the fall of 2014 and graduated with my bachelor's degree in psychology in 2017. I am a proud alumni of Jack's Nation. I am currently a graduate student pursuing my master's degree in clinical mental health counseling with plans of joining the Air Force as a commissioned officer after I graduate. I consider it a privilege to be able to apply the skills and lessons that I have obtained at UHV to serve this country. SGA is continuously working on the enhancement of the overall student experience. One recent addition to the student experience we accomplished is a new UHV branded regalia that has been worn by graduates for the first time this fall, this fall at commencement. I have learned from my time at UHV that it is the minor things which are often overlooked that make a huge impact on the student's experience. I will never forget and appreciate the investment that this institution is making. Like most of you, I have witnessed and been a part of the institution's growth. UHV is a much better place now than it has been, than it was when I arrived in 2014. I find our growth inspirational and it has been, it was a driving force in my decision to run, run for SGA president. Like a lot of the students at UHV, I came from a much bigger city. It might surprise you that it took a while for me to adjust to UHV and Victoria. Looking back, I now see that everything that made me uncomfortable was my biggest opportunity for growth. Now, not many people know this, but I was a, I was a great goalie in high school. 
Actually, the opportunity to play for the soccer team was my biggest inspiration for coming here. So I tried out for the team, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it. Despite this, I've been able to obtain experiences here at UHV that I wouldn't have gotten at any other institution. These experience, many of which put me in uncomfortable situations, have allowed me to grow. It may come as a surprise, but many times these positions made me feel incompetent. Over time, I realized, one, feelings can be deceptive, and two, Rome was not built in a day. Ultimately, I decided to stay involved on campus, take feedback from others, and apply it when necessary. Those uncomfortable and unfamiliar situations allowed, allowed me to grow as a student leader on campus, but more impor importantly, as a person. Many students will look at me now and see the successes, but what they do not realize is I was once where many of them currently are. I have experienced my fair share of failures and successes. I have learned that as humans, we all experience failures. I have, to, I have had to remember to keep my head high through the storms and know that I will overcome any obstacles that make me feel less than what I am. Without a doubt, UHV has taught me to, keep, to try new things, get comfortable with failure, and when you're knocked down, get back up. I'll forever be grateful to UHV for teaching me these important life lessons. I am truly blessed to be afforded the opportunity to talk to you all tonight. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. I would love it if you could all attend the upcoming commencement ceremony to show support and see our students proudly wearing their amazing new regalia. And one more thing, I would like to give a shout out to our SGA advisor, Dr. Michael Wilkinson, for his dedication and support to SGA and the student body. Thank you. Go Jags. Being the Board of Regents meeting, the Regents met in executive session and heard a pre-litigation and litigation status report and conferred with the general counsel on legal matters. There was no actions taken in executive session. Before I join, adjourn this meeting, I'd like to make a quick announcement that the people attending our new regents reception will be attending it by themselves since we're all going home. <laughs> there is no water. And the health department in the city of Houston has asked us to cancel it. And we will do something else to honor our, why are we saying, I thought we had, there's only two new regents? Well, you're new to me, Durga. Okay, I was gonna recognize you. I, re I would recognize you. Technically, it is a new term, and you're a new regent, okay? I take both of you to dinner, if you like. That's why you started at the bottom again, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you spoke too much today for being a new regent. <laughs> uh, Dr. Kator, do you have any further comments? No, Mr. Chairman. Is there any further business from anybody? Uh, great meeting, everybody. Appreciate everything and a great executive session. Thank you very much. This meeting's hereby adjourned. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> All right. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Are you going to go for dinner? Let's get out. Oh, it's done. It is one. Oh, it's done. Oh, it's done. Oh, it's done. Oh, it's done.